Prelude to The Singing Bone or The Adventures of Dr. Thorndyke by R. Austin Freeman. The peculiar construction of the first four stories in the present collection will probably strike both reader and critic and seem to call for some explanation, which I accordingly proceed to supply. In the conventional detective story, the interest is made to focus on the question, who did it? The identity of the criminal is a secret that is jealously guarded up to the very end of the book, and its disclosure forms the final climax. This I have always regarded as somewhat of a mistake. In real life, the identity of the criminal is a question of supreme importance for practical reasons, but in fiction, where no such reasons exist, I conceive the interest of the reader to be engaged chiefly by the demonstration of unexpected consequences of simple actions, of unsuspected causal connections, and by the evolution of an ordered train of evidence from a mass of facts apparently incoherent and unrelated. The reader's curiosity is concerned not so much with the question, who did it, as with the question, how was the discovery achieved? That is to say, the ingenious reader is interested more in the intermediate action than in the ultimate result. The offer by a popular author of a prize to the reader who should identify the criminal in a certain detective story, exhibiting as it did the opposite view, suggested to me an interesting question. Would it be possible to write a detective story in which from the outset the reader was taken entirely into the author's confidence, was made to actually witness the crime, and furnished with every fact that could possibly be used in its detection? Would there be any story left when the reader had all the facts? I believe that there would, and as an experiment to test the justice of my belief, I wrote the case of Oscar Brodsky. Here the usual conditions are reversed. The reader knows everything, the detective knows nothing, and the interest focuses on the unexpected significance of trivial circumstances. By excellent judges on both sides of the Atlantic, including the editor of Pearson's magazine, this story was so far approved of that I was invited to produce others of the same type. Three more were written, and here included, together with one of the more orthodox character, so that the reader can judge of the respective merits of the two methods of narration. Nautical readers will observe that I have taken the liberty, for obvious reasons connected with the law of libel, of planting a screw-pile lighthouse on the girdless sand in place of the light vessel. I mention the matter to forestall criticism and save readers the trouble of writing to point out the error. R.A.F. goes in. End of preface. Section 1 of The Sing Bone, or The Adventures of Dr. Thorndyke, by R. Austin Freeman. The Case of Oscar Brodsky, Part 1. The Mechanism of Crime. A surprising amount of nonsense has been talked about conscience. On the one hand, remorse, or the again bite, as certain scholars of the ultra Teutonic leanings would prefer to call it. On the other hand, an easy conscience. These have been accepted as the determining factors of happiness, or the reverse. Of course, there is an element of truth in the very easy conscious view, but it begs the whole question. A particularly hardy conscience may be quite easy under the most unfavourable conditions, conditions in which the more feeble conscience might be severely afflicted with the again bite, and then it seems to be the fact that some fortunate persons have no conscience at all, a negative gift that raises them above the mental vicissitudes of the common herd of humanity. Now, Silas, Hitler was a case in point. No one, looking into his cheerful round face, beaming with benevolence and wreathed in perpetual smiles, would have imagined him to be a criminal. Least of all, his worthy high church housekeeper, who was a witness to his unvarying amiability, who constantly heard him carolling light-heartedly about the house, and noted his appreciative zest at mealtime. Yet it is a fact that Silas earned his modest, though comfortable, income by the gentle art of burglary a precarious trade and risky withal, yet not so very hazardous if pursued with judgment and moderation. And Silas was eminently a man of judgment. He worked invariably alone. He kept his own counsel. No confederate had he to turn King's evidence at a pinch. No one he knew would bounce off in a fit of temper to Scotland Yard. Nor was he greedy and thriftless, as most criminals are. His scoops were few and far between, carefully planned, secretly executed, and the proceeds judiciously invested in weekly property. In early life Silas had been connected with the diamond industry, and he still did a little rather irregular dealing. In the trade he was suspected of transactions with IDBs, and one or two indiscreet dealers had gone so far as to whisper the ominous word, 
fence. But Silas smiled a benevolent smile and went his way. He knew what he knew, and his clients in Amsterdam were not inquisitive. Such was Silas Hickler. As he strolled round his garden in the dusk of an October evening, he seemed the very type of modest middle-class prosperity. He was dressed in the travelling suit that he wore on his little continental trips. His bag was packed and stood in readiness on the sitting-room sofa. A parcel of diamonds, purchased honestly, though without impertinent questions, at Southampton, was in the inside pocket of his waistcoat, and another more valuable parcel was stowed in a cavity in the heel of his right boot. In an hour and a half it would be time for him to set out to catch the boat train at the junction. Meanwhile there was nothing to do but to stroll round the fading garden and consider how he should invest the proceeds of the impending deal. His housekeeper had gone over to Wellham for the week's shopping, and would probably not be back until eleven o'clock. He was alone in the premises, but just a trifle dull. He was about to turn into the house when his ear caught the sound of footsteps on the unmade road that passed the end of the garden. He paused and listened. There was no other dwelling near, and the road led nowhere, fading away into the wasteland beyond the house. Could this be a visitor? It seemed unlikely, for visitors were few at Silas Hickler's house. Meanwhile the footsteps continued to approach, ringing out with increasing loudness on the hard, stony path. Silas strolled down to the gate, and leaning on it, looked out with some curiosity. Presently a glow of light showed him the face of a man, apparently lighting his pipe, then a dim figure detached itself from the enveloping gloom, advanced towards him, and halted opposite the garden. The stranger removed a cigarette from his mouth, and blowing out a cloud of smoke, asked, "'Could you tell me if this road will take me to Badsham Junction?' "'No,' replied Hickler, "'but there is a footpath farther on that leads to the station.' "'Footpath?' growled the stranger. "'I have had enough of footpaths. I came down from town to Catley, intending to walk across to the junction. I started along the road, and then some fool directed me to a short-cut, with the result that I have been blundering about in the dark for the last half-hour. My sight isn't very good, you know,' he added. "'What train do you want to catch?' asked Hitler. Seven fifty-eight was the reply. "'I am going to catch that train myself,' said Silas. "'But I shan't be starting for another hour. The station is only three-quarters of a mile from here. If you like to come in and take a rest, we can walk down together, and then you'll be sure of not missing your way.' "'It's very good of you,' said the stranger, peering with spectacled eyes at the dark house. "'But I think—' "'Might as well wait here as at the station,' said Silas, in his genial way, holding the gate open, and the stranger, after momentary hesitation, entered and, flinging away his cigarette, followed him to the door of the cottage. The sitting-room was in darkness, save for the dull glow of the expiring fire. But, entering before his guest, Silas applied a match to the lamp that hung from the ceiling. As the flame leaped up, flooding the little interior with light, the two men regarded one another with mutual curiosity. Brodsky, by Jingo, was Hickler's silent commentary, as he looked at his guest. Doesn't know me, evidently. Wouldn't, of course, after all these years, and with his bad eyesight. Take a seat, sir, he added aloud. Will you join me in a little refreshment to while away the time? Brodsky murmured an indistinct acceptance, and as his host turned to open a cupboard, he deposited his hat, a hard grey felt, on a chair in a corner, placed his bag on the edge of the table, resting his umbrella against it, and sat down in a small armchair. "'Have a biscuit?' said Hickler, as he placed a whisky bottle on the table, together with a couple of his best star-pattern tumblers and a siphon. "'Thanks. I think I will,' said Bodsky. "'The railway journey and all this confounded tramping about, you know.' "'Yes,' agreed Silas. "'Doesn't do to start with an empty stomach. Hope you don't mind oat-cakes. I see they're the only biscuits I have.' Brodsky hastened to assure him that oat-cakes were his special and peculiar fancy, and in confirmation, having mixed himself a stiff jorum, he fell too upon the biscuits with evident gusto. Brodsky was a deliberate feeder, and at present appeared to be somewhat sharp-set. His measured munching being unfavourable to conversation, most of the talking fell to Silas, and for once that genial transgressor found the task embarrassing. The natural thing would have been to discuss his guest's destination, and perhaps the object of his journey. But this was precisely what Hitler avoided doing, for he knew both, and instinct told him to keep his knowledge to himself. Brodsky was a diamond merchant of considerable reputation, and in a large way of business. 
he bought stones principally in the rough and of these he was a most excellent judge his fancy was for stones of somewhat unusual size and value and it was well known to be his custom when he had accumulated a sufficient stock to carry them himself to amsterdam and supervise the cutting of the rough stones of this hickler was aware and he had no doubt that brodsky was now starting on one of his periodical excursions that somewhere in the recesses of his rather shabby clothing was concealed a paper packet possibly worth several thousand pounds brodsky sat by the table munching monotonously and talking little hickler sat opposite him talking nervously and rather wildly at times and watching his guest with a growing fascination precious stones and especially diamonds were hickler's specialty hard stuff silver plate he avoided entirely gold excepting at the form of specie he seldom touched but stones of which he could carry off a whole consignment in the heel of his boot and dispose of with absolute safety formed the staple of his industry and here was a man sitting opposite him with a parcel in his pocket containing the equivalent of a dozen of his most successful scoops stones worth perhaps he pulled up short and began to talk rapidly though without much coherence for even as he talked other words formed subconsciously seemed to insinuate themselves into the interstices of the sentences and to carry on a parallel train of thought gets chilly in the evenings now doesn't it said hickler it does indeed brodsky agreed and then resumed his slow munching breathing audibly through his nose five thousand at least the subconscious train of thought resumed probably six seven perhaps ten Sars fidgeted in his chair and endeavoured to concentrate his ideas on some topic of interest he was growing disagreeably conscious of a new and unfamiliar state of mind do you take any interest in gardening he asked next to diamonds and weekly property his besetting weakness was fuchsias brodsky chuckled sourly cat and garden is the nearest approach he broke off suddenly and then added i am a londoner you know the abrupt break in the sentence was not unnoticed by silas nor had he any difficulty in interpreting it a man who carries untold wealth upon his person must needs be wary in his speech yes he answered absently it's hardly a londoner's hobby and then half consciously he began a rapid calculation put it at five thousand pounds what would that represent in weekly property his last set of houses had cost two hundred and fifty pounds apiece and he had let them at ten shillings and sixpence a week at that rate five thousand pounds represented twenty houses at ten and sixpence a week say ten pounds a week one pound eight shillings a day five hundred and twenty pounds a year for life it was a competency added to what he already had it was wealth with that income he could fling the tools of his trade into the river and live out the remainder of his life in comfort and security he glanced furtively at his guest across the table and looked away quickly as he felt stirring within him an impulse the nature of which he could not mistake this must be put an end to crimes against the person he had always looked upon as sheer insanity there was it is true a little affair of the weybridge policeman but that was unforeseen and unavoidable and it was the constable's doing after all and there was the old housekeeper at epsom too but of course if the old idiot would shriek in that insane fashion well it was an accident very regrettable to be sure no one could be more sorry for the mishap than himself but deliberate homicide robbery from the person it was the act of a stark lunatic of course if he had happened to be that sort of person here was the opportunity of a lifetime the immense booty the empty house the solitary neighbourhood away from the main road and from other habitations the time the darkness but of course there was the body to be thought of that was always the difficulty what to do with the body here he caught the shriek of the up express rounding the curve in the line that ran past the wasteland at the back of the house the sound started a new train of thought and as he followed it out his eyes fixed themselves on the unconscious and taciturn brodsky as he sat thoughtfully sipping his whisky at length averting his gaze with an effort he rose suddenly from his chair and turned to look at the clock on the mantelpiece spreading out his hands before the dying fire a tumult of strange sensations warned him to leave the house he shivered slightly though he was rather hot than chilly and turned his head looking at the door seems to be a confounded draught he said with another slight shiver did i shut the door properly i wonder he strode across the room and opening the door wide looked out into the dark garden desire sudden and urgent had come over him to get out into the open air to be on the road and have done with this madness that was knocking at the door of his brain 
I wonder if it is worth while to start yet, he said, with a yearning glance at the murky, starless sky. Brodsky roused himself and looked round. Is your clock right? he asked. Silas reluctantly admitted that it was. How long will it take us to walk to the station? inquired Brodsky. Oh, about twenty-five minutes to half an hour, replied Silas, unconsciously exaggerating the distance. Well, said Brodsky, we've got more than an hour yet, and it's more comfortable here than hanging about the station. I don't see the use of starting before we need. No, of course not, Silas agreed. A wave of strange emotion, half regretful, half triumphant, surged through his brain. For some moments he remained standing on the threshold, looking out dreamily into the night. Then he softly closed the door, and seemingly without the exercise of his volition, the key turned noiselessly in the lock. He returned to his chair, and tried to open a conversation with the taciturn Brodsky, but the words came faltering and disjointed. He felt his face growing hot, his brain full and intense, and there was a faint high-pitched singing in his ears. He was conscious of watching his guest with a new and fearful interest, and by sheer force of will turned away his eyes, only to find them a moment later involuntarily returning to fix the unconscious man with yet more horrible intensity. And ever through his mind walked like a dreadful procession the thoughts of what that other man, the man of blood and violence, would do in these circumstances. Detail by detail the hideous synthesis fitted together the parts of the imagined crime, and arranged them in due sequence until they formed a succession of events, rational, connected, and coherent. He rose uneasily from his chair, with his eyes still riveted upon his guest. He could not sit any longer opposite the man with his hidden store of precious gems. The impulse that he recognized with fear and wonder was growing more ungovernable from moment to moment. If he stayed, it would presently overpower him, and then he shrank with horror from the dreadful thought, but his fingers itched to handle the diamonds. For Silas was, after all, a criminal by nature and habit. He was a beast of prey. His livelihood had never been earned. It had been taken by stealth, or, if necessary, by force. His instincts were predacious, and the proximity of unguarded valuables suggested to him, as a logical consequence, their abstraction or seizure. His unwillingness to let these diamonds go away beyond his reach was fast becoming overwhelming. But he would make one more effort to escape. He would keep out of Brodsky's actual presence until the moment for starting came. "'If you'll excuse me,' he said, "'I will go and put on a thicker pair of boots. After all this dry weather we may get a change, and damp feet are very uncomfortable when you are travelling. "'Yes, dangerous, too,' agreed Brodsky. Silas walked through into the adjoining kitchen, where, by the light of the little lamp that was burning there, he had seen his stout country boots placed, cleaned, and in readiness, and sat down upon a chair to make the change. He did not, of course, intend to wear the country boots, for the diamonds were concealed in those he had on, but he would make the change, and then alter his mind. It would all help to pass the time. He took a deep breath. It was a relief, at any rate, to be out of that room. Perhaps if he stayed away, the temptation would pass. Brodsky would go on his way. He wished that he was going alone, and the danger would be over, at least, and the opportunity would have gone. The diamonds. He looked up as he slowly unlaced his boot. From where he sat, he could see Brodsky sitting by the table, with his back towards the kitchen door. He had finished eating now, and was composedly rolling a cigarette. Silas breathed heavily, and slipping off his boot, sat for a while motionless, gazing steadily at the other man's back. Then he unlaced the other boot, still staring abstractedly at his unconscious guest, drew it off, and laid it very quietly on the floor. Brodsky calmly finished rolling his cigarette, licked the paper, put away his pouch, and having dusted the crumbs of tobacco from his knees, began to search his pockets for a match. Suddenly, yielding to an uncontrollable impulse, Silas stood up and began stealthily to creep along the passage to the sitting-room. Not a sound came from his stockinged feet. Silently as a cat, he stole forward, breathing softly with parted lips, until he stood at the threshold of the room. His face flushed duskily, his eyes wide and staring, glittered in the lamplight, and the racing blood hummed in his ears. Brodsky struck a match. Silas noted that it was a wooden vesta, lighted his cigarette, blew out the match, and flung it into the fender. Then he replaced the box in his pocket, 
who commenced to smoke. Slowly and without a sound, Silas crept forward into the room, step by step, with cat-like stealthiness, until he stood close behind Brodsky's chair, so close that he had to turn his head that his breath might not stir the hair upon the other man's head. So for half a minute he stood motionless, like a symbolical statue of murder, glaring down, with horrible glittering eyes, upon the unconscious diamond merchant, while his quick breath passed without a sound through his open mouth, and his fingers writhed slowly like the tentacles of a giant hydra. And then, as noiselessly as ever, he backed away to the door, turned quickly, and walked back into the kitchen. He drew a deep breath. It had been a near thing. Brodsky's life had hung upon a thread. For it had been so easy. Indeed, if he had happened, as he stood behind the man's chair, to have a weapon, a hammer, for instance, or even a stone. He glanced round the kitchen, and his eyes lighted on a bar that had been left by the workman who had put up the new greenhouse. It was an odd piece, cut off from a square, wrought iron stanchion, and was about a foot long, and perhaps three-quarters of an inch thick. Now, if he had had that in his hand a minute ago. He picked the bar up, balanced it in his hand, and swung it round his head. A formidable weapon, this. Silent, too. And it fitted the plan that had passed through his brain. Bah! better put the thing down. But he did not. He stepped over to the door, and looked again at Brodsky, sitting as before, meditatively smoking, with his back towards the kitchen. Suddenly a change came over Silas. His face flushed, the veins of his neck stood out, and a sullen scowl settled on his face. He drew out his watch, glanced at it earnestly, and replaced it. Then he strode swiftly but silently along the passage into the sitting room. A pace away from his victim's chair, he halted, and took deliberate aim. The bar swung aloft, but not without some faint rustle of movement, for Brodsky looked round quickly, even as the iron whistled through the air. The movement disturbed the murderer's aim, and the bar glanced off his victim's head, making only a trifling wound. Brodsky sprang up with a tremulous, bleating cry, and clutched his assailant's arms with the tenacity of mortal terror, then began a terrible struggle, as the two men, locked in a deadly embrace, swayed to and fro, and trampled backwards and forwards. The chair was overturned, an empty glass swept from the table, and with Brodsky's spectacles crushed beneath stamping feet, and thrice that dreadful, pitiful, bleating cry rang out into the night, filling Silas, despite his murderous frenzy, with terror, lest some chance wayfarer should hear it gathering his great strength for a final effort he forced his victim backwards onto the table and snatching up a corner of the tablecloth thrust it into his face and crammed it into his mouth as it opened to utter another shriek and thus he remained for a full two minutes almost motionless like some dreadful group of tragic allegory then when the last faint twitchings had died away silas relaxed his grip and let the limp body slip softly on to the floor it was over for good or for evil, the thing was done. Silas stood up, breathing heavily, and as he wiped the sweat from his face, he looked at the clock. The hands stood at one minute to seven. The whole thing had taken a little over three minutes. He had nearly an hour in which to finish his task. The goods train that entered into his scheme came by at twenty minutes past, and it was only three hundred yards to the line. Still, he must not waste time. He was now quite composed and only disturbed by the thought that Brodsky's cries might have been heard. If no one had heard them, it was all plain sailing. He stooped, and gently disengaging the tablecloth from the man's teeth, began a careful search of his pockets. He was not long finding what he sought, and as he pinched the paper packet, and felt the little hard bodies grating on one another, his faint regrets for what had happened were swallowed up in self-congratulations. He now set about his task with business-like briskness, and an attentive eye on the clock. A few large drops of blood had fallen on the tablecloth, and there was a small bloody smear on the carpet by the dead man's head. Silas fetched from the kitchen some water, a nail-brush, and a dry cloth, and having washed out the stain from the table-cover, not forgetting the deal table-top underneath, and cleaned away the smear from the carpet, and rubbed the damp places dry, he slipped a sheet of paper under the head of the corpse to prevent further contamination. Then he set the tablecloth straight, stood the chair upright, laid the broken spectacles on the table, and picked up the cigarette, which had been trodden flat in the struggle, and flung it under the grate. Then there was the broken glass, 
which he swept up into a dustpan. Part of it was the remains of the shattered tumbler, and the rest the fragments of the broken spectacles. He turned it out into a sheet of paper, looked it over carefully, picking out the larger recognizable pieces of the spectacle glasses and putting them aside on a separate slip of paper, together with a sprinkling of the minute fragments. The remainder he shot back into the dustpan, and having hurriedly put on his boots, carried it out to the rubbish heap at the back of the house. It was now time to start, hastily cutting off a length of string from his string box, for Silas was an orderly man, and despised the oddments of string with which many people make shift. He tied it to the dead man's bag and umbrella, and slung them from his shoulder. Then he folded up the paper of broken glass, and, slipping it and the spectacles into his pocket, picked up the body and threw it over his shoulder. Brodsky was a small spare man, weighing not more than nine stone, not a very formidable burden for a big, athletic man like Silas. The night was intensely dark, and when Silas looked out of the back gate over the wasteland that stretched from his house to the railway, he could hardly see twenty yards ahead. After listening cautiously and hearing no sound, he went out, shut the gate softly behind him, and set forth at a good pace, though carefully, over the broken ground. His progress was not as silent as he could have wished for, though the scanty turf that covered the gravelly land was thick enough to deaden his footfalls. The swinging bag and umbrella made an irritating noise. Indeed, his movements were more hampered by them than by the weightier burden. The distance to the line was about three hundred yards. Ordinarily he would have walked it in from three to four minutes, but now, going cautiously with his burden, and stopping now and again to listen, it took him just six minutes to reach the three-bar fence that separated the wasteland from the railway. Arrived here, he halted for a moment, and once more listened attentively, peering into the darkness on all sides. Not a living creature was to be seen or heard in this desolate spot, but far away the shriek of an engine's whistle warned him to hasten. Lifting the corpse easily over the fence, he carried it a few yards farther to a point where the line curved sharply. Here he laid it face downwards, with the neck over the near rail. Drawing out his pocket-knife, he cut through the knot that fastened the umbrella to the string, and also secured the bag, and when he had flung the bag and umbrella on the track beside the body, he carefully pocketed the string, except in the little loop that had fallen to the ground when the knot was cut. The quick snort and clanking rumble of an approaching goods train began now to be clearly audible. Rapidly, Silas drew from his pockets the battered spectacles and the packet of broken glass. The former he threw down by the dead man's head, and then, emptying the packet into his hand, sprinkled the fragments of glass around the spectacles. He was none too soon. Already the quick, laboured puffing of the engine sounded close at hand. His impulse was to stay and watch, to witness the final catastrophe that should convert the murder into an accident or suicide. But it was hardly safe. It would be better that he should not be near, lest he should not be able to get away without being seen. Hastily he climbed back over the fence, and strode away across the rough fields, while the train came snorting and clattering towards the curve. He had nearly reached his back gate, when a sound from the line brought him to a sudden halt. It was a prolonged whistle, accompanied by the groan of brakes and the loud clank of colliding trucks. The snorting of the engine had ceased, and was replaced by the penetrating hiss of escaping steam. The train had stopped. For one brief moment Silas stood with bated breath, and mouth agape like one petrified. Then he strode forward quickly to the gate, and letting himself in, silently slid the bolt. He was undeniably alarmed. What could have happened on the line? It was practically certain that the body had been seen, but what was happening now, and would they come to the house? He entered the kitchen, and having paused again to listen, for somebody might come and knock at the door at any moment, he walked through the sitting-room and looked round. All seemed in order there. There was the bar, though, lying where he had dropped it in the scuffle. He picked it up and held it under the lamp. There was no blood on it, only one or two hairs. Somewhat absently he wiped it with a table cover and then running out through the kitchen into the back garden, dropped it over the wall into a bed of nettles. Not that there was anything incriminating in the bar, but since he had used it as a weapon, it had somehow acquired a sinister aspect to his eye. He now felt that it would be well to start for the station at once. It was not time yet, for it was barely twenty-five minutes past seven, but he did not wish to be found in the house if any one should come. His soft hat was on the sofa with his bag, to which his umbrella was strapped. He put on the hat, 
caught up the bag and stepped over to the door. Then he came back to turn down the lamp. And it was at this moment, when he stood with his hand raised to the burner, that his eyes, travelling by chance into the dim corner of the room, lighted on Brodsky's grey felt hat, posing on the chair where the dead man had placed it when he entered the house. Silas stood for a few moments as if petrified, with the chilly sweat of mortal fear standing in beads upon his forehead. Another instant, and he would have turned the lamp down and gone on his way, and then he strode over to the chair, snatched up the hat, and looked inside it. Yes, there was the name, Oscar Brodsky, written plainly on the lining. If he had gone away, leaving it to be discovered, he would have been lost. Indeed, even now, if a search party should come to the house, it was enough to send him to the gallows. His limbs shook with horror at the thought, but in spite of his panic he did not lose his self-possession. Darting through into the kitchen, he grabbed up a handful of the dry brushwood that was kept for lighting fires, and carried it to the sitting-room grate, where he thrust it on the extinct but still hot embers, and crumpling up the paper that he had placed under Brodsky's head, on which paper he now noticed, for the first time, a minute bloody smear. He poked it in under the wood, and striking a wax match, set light to it. As the wood flared up, he hacked at the hat with his pocket-knife, and threw the ragged strips into the blaze. And all the while his heart was thumping, and his hands were trembled with the dread of discovery. The fragments of felt were far from inflammable, tending rather to fuse into cindery masses that smoked and smouldered than to burn away into actual ash. Moreover, to his dismay, they emitted a powerful, resinous stench mixed with the odour of burning hair, so that he had to open the kitchen window, since he dared not unlock the front door, to disperse the reek, and still as he fed the fire with small cut fragments, he strained his ears to catch, above the crackling of the wood, the sound of the dreaded footsteps, the knock on the door, that should be as the summons of fate. The time, too, was speeding on, twenty-one minutes to eight. In a few minutes more he must set out, or he would miss the train. He dropped the dismembered hat-brim on the blazing wood, and ran upstairs to open a window, since he must close that in the kitchen before he left. When he came back, the brim had already curled up into a black, clinkery mass, that bubbled and hissed, as the fat, pungent smoke rose from it sluggishly to the chimney. Nineteen minutes to eight. It was time to start. He took up the poker, and carefully beat the cinders into small particles, stirring them into the glowing embers of the wood and coal. There was nothing unusual in the appearance of the grate. It was his constant custom to burn letters and other discarded articles in the sitting-room fire. His housekeeper would notice nothing out of the common. Indeed, the cinders would probably be reduced to ashes before she returned. He had been careful to notice that there was no metallic fittings of any kind in the hat which might have escaped burning. Once more he picked up his bag, took a last look round, turned down the lamp, and, unlocking the door, held it open for a few moments. Then he went out, locked the door, pocketed the key, of which his housekeeper had a duplicate, and set off at a brisk pace for the station. He arrived in good time after all, and, having taken his ticket, strolled through onto the platform. The train was not yet signalled, but there seemed to be an unusual stir in the place. The passengers were collected in a group at one end of the platform and were all looking in one direction down the line, and, even as he walked towards them, with a certain tremulous, nauseating curiosity, two men emerged from the darkness and ascended the slope to the platform, carrying a stretcher covered with a tarpaulin. The passengers parted to let the bearers pass, turning fascinated eyes upon the shape that showed faintly through the rough pall, and when the stretcher had been borne into the lamp-room, they fixed their attention upon a porter, who followed, carrying a handbag and an umbrella. Suddenly one of the passengers started forward with an exclamation. "'Is that his umbrella?' he demanded. "'Yes, sir,' answered the porter, stopping and holding out for the speaker's inspection. "'My God!' ejaculated the passenger. Then, turning sharply to a tall man who stood close by, he said excitedly, "'That's Brodsky's umbrella. I could swear it. You remember Brodsky?' The tall man nodded, and the passenger, turning once more to the porter, said, "'I identify that umbrella. It belongs to a gentleman named Brodsky. If you look in his hat, you will see his name written in it.' He always writes his name in his hat. We haven't found his hat yet, said the porter, but here is the station master coming up the line. He awaited the arrival of his superior, and then announced, This gentleman, sir, has identified the umbrella. Oh, said the station master, you recognise the umbrella, do you? 
then perhaps you would step into the lamp room and see if we can identify the body. Is he, is he very much injured? the passenger asked tremulously. Well, yes, was the reply. You see, the engine and six of the trucks went over him before they could stop the train. Took his head clean off, in fact. Shocking! Shocking! gasped the passenger. I think, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd rather not. You don't think it necessary, Doctor, do you? Yes, I do, replied the tall man. Early identification may be of the first importance. Then I suppose I must, said the passenger. Very reluctantly, he allowed himself to be conducted by the station-master to the lamp-room, as the clang of the bell announced the approaching train. Silas Hickler followed, and took his stand with the expectant crowd outside the closed door. In a few moments the passenger burst out, pale and awe-stricken, and rushed up to his tall friend. "'It is!' he exclaimed breathlessly. "'It's Brodsky! Poor old Brodsky! Horrible! Horrible! He was to have met me here, and come with me to Amsterdam!' "'Had he any merchandise about him?' the tall man asked, and Silas strained his ears to catch the reply. "'He had some stones, no doubt, but I don't know what. His clerk will know, of course. By the way, doctor, could you watch the case for me? Just to be sure it was really an accident, or you know what. We were old friends, you know. Fellow townsmen, too. We were both born in Warsaw. I'd like you to give an eye to the case.' "'Very well,' said the other. "'I will satisfy myself.' There's nothing more than appears, and let you have a report. Will that do? Thank you. It's excessively good of you, Doctor. Ah, here comes the train. I hope it won't inconvenience you to stay and see to this matter. Not in the least, replied the Doctor. We were not due at Warmington until tomorrow afternoon, and I expect we can find out all that is necessary to know before that. Silas looked long and curiously at the tall, imposing man, who was, as it were, taking his seat at the chessboard play against him for his life. A formidable antagonist he looked, with his keen, thoughtful face, so resolute and calm. As Silas stepped into his carriage, he thought with deep discomfort of Brodsky's hat, and hoped that he had made no other oversight. End of section 1 Section 2 of The Singing Bone, or The Adventures of Dr. Thorndyke, by R. Austin Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mechanism of Detection Related by Christopher Jervis, M.D. The singular circumstances that attended the death of Mr. Oscar Brodsky, the well-known diamond merchant of Hatton Garden, illustrated very forcibly the importance of one or two points in medico-legal practice which Thorndyke was accustomed to insist were not sufficiently appreciated. What those points were, I shall leave my friend and teacher to state at the proper place, and meanwhile, as the case is in the highest degree instructive, I shall record the incidents in the order of their occurrence. The dusk of an October evening was closing in as Thorndyke and I, the sole occupants of a smoking compartment, found ourselves approaching the little station of Ludham, and as the train slowed down, we peered out at the knot of country people who were waiting on the platform. Suddenly Thorndyke exclaimed, in a tone of surprise, "'Why, that is surely Boscovich!' and almost at the same moment a brisk, excitable little man darted at the door of our compartment and literally tumbled in i hope i don't intrude on this learned conclave he said shaking hands genially and banging his gladstone with impulsive violence into the rack but i saw your faces at the window and naturally jumped at the chance of such pleasant companionship you're very flattering said thorndyke so flattering that you leave us nothing to say but what in the name of fortune are you doing at what's the name of this place Ludham. My brother has a little place a mile or so from here, and I've been spending a couple of days with him, Mr. Boscovich explained. I shall change at Badgham Junction and catch the boat train to Amsterdam. But whither are you two bound? I see you have your mysterious little green box up on the hat rack so I infer that you are on some romantic quest, eh, going to unravel some dark and intricate crime? No, replied Thorndyke. We're bound for Warmington on a quite prosaic errand. I'm instructed to watch the proceedings at an inquest there to-morrow, on behalf of the Griffin Line Insurance Office, and we are travelling down to-night, as it is rather a cross-country journey. "'Why the box of magic?' asked Boscovich, glancing up at the hat-rack. "'I never go away from home without it,' answered Thorndyke. "'One never knows what may turn up. The trouble of carrying it is small when set off against the comfort of having appliances at hand in an emergency.' Boscovich continued to stare up at the little square case covered with Wilsden canvas. 
Presently he remarked, I often used to wonder what you had in it when you were down at Chelmsford in connection with that bank murder. What an amazing case that was, by the way. Didn't your methods of research astonish the police? As he still looked up wistfully at the case, Thorndyke good-naturedly lifted it down and unlocked it. As a matter of fact, he was rather proud of his portable laboratory, and suddenly it was a triumph of condensation, for as small as it was, only a foot square by four inches deep, it contained a fairly complete outfit for a preliminary investigation. Wonderful! exclaimed Boscovich, when the case lay open before him, displaying its rows of little regent bottles, tiny test tubes, diminutive spirit lamp, dwarf microscope, and assorted instruments on the same Lilliputian scale. It's like a doll's house. Everything looks as if it was seen to the wrong end of a telescope. But are these tiny things really efficient? That microscope, now. Perfectly efficient at low and moderate magnifications, said Thorndyke. It looks like a toy, but it isn't one. The lenses are the best that can be had. Of course, a full-size instrument would be infinitely more convenient, but I shouldn't have it with me. I should have to make shift with a pocket lens, and so with the rest of the undersized appliances, they are the alternative to no appliances. Boscovich pored over the case and its contents, fingering the instrument delicately, and asking questions innumerable about their uses. Indeed, his curiosity was but half appeased when half an hour later the train began to slow down. "'By Jove!' he exclaimed, starting up and seizing his bag. "'Here we are at the junction already. You change here, don't you?' yes replied thorndyke we take the branch train on to warmington as we stepped out onto the platform we became aware that something unusual was happening or had happened all the passengers and most of the porters and the supernumeraries were gathered at one end of the station and all were looking intently into the darkness down the line anything wrong asked mr boscovich addressing the station inspector yes sir the official replied a man has been run over by the goods train about a mile down the line station master has gone down with a stretcher to help him bring him in and I expect that is his lantern that you see coming this way. As we stood watching the dancing light grow momentarily brighter, flashing fitful reflections from the burnished rails, a man came out of the booking office and joined the group of onlookers. He attracted my attention, as I afterwards remembered, for two reasons. In the first place, his round, jolly face was excessively pale and bore a strained and wild expression, and in the second, though he stared into the darkness with eager curiosity, he asked no questions. The swinging lantern continued to approach, and then suddenly two men came into sight bearing a stretcher, covered with a tarpaulin, through which the shape of a human figure was dimly discernible. They ascended the slope to the platform, and proceeded with their burden to the lamp-room, when the inquisitive gaze of the passengers was transferred to a porter, who followed, carrying a handbag, an umbrella, and to the station-master, who brought up the rear with his lantern. As the porter passed, Mr. Boscovich started forward with sudden excitement. "'Is that his umbrella?' he asked. "'Yes, sir,' answered the porter, stopping and holding out for the speaker's inspection. "'My God!' ejaculated Boscovich. Then, turning sharply to Thorndyke, he explained, "'That's Brodsky's umbrella. I could swear it. You remember Brodsky?' Thorndyke nodded, and Boscovich, turning once more to the porter, said, "'I identify that umbrella. It belongs to a gentleman named Brodsky. If you look at his hat, you will see his name written in it. He always writes his name in his hat.' "'We haven't found his hat yet,' said the porter. "'But here's the station-master.' He turned to his superior and announced, "'This gentleman, sir, as I identified the umbrella. Oh, said the station master, you recognise the umbrella, do you? Then perhaps you would step into the lamp room and see if you can identify the body. Mr. Boscovich recoiled with a look of alarm. Is it, is he very much injured? he asked nervously. Why, well, yes, was the reply. You see, the engine and six of the trucks went over him before they could stop the train. Took his head clean off, in fact. Shocking, shocking, gasped Boscovich. I think if you don't mind, I'd, I'd, I'd rather not. You don't think it necessary, Doctor, do you? Yes, I do, replied Thorndyke. Early identification may be of the first importance. And I suppose I must, said Boscovich, and with extreme reluctance he followed the station-master to the lamp-room, as the loud ringing of the bell announced the approach of the boat-train. His inspection must have been of the briefest, for in a few moments he burst out, pale and awe-stricken, and rushed up to Thorndyke. It is, he exclaimed breathlessly. It's Brodsky! Poor old Brodsky! Horrible! Horrible! I was to have met him and come with me to Amsterdam. Had he any merchandise about him? Thorndyke asked, and as he spoke, the stranger whom I had previously noticed edged up closer as if to catch the reply. He had some stones, no doubt, answered Boscovich. I don't know what they were. His clerk will know, of course. By the way, doctor, could you watch the case for me, just to be sure it really was an accident, or you know what? We're old friends, you know, fellow townsmen too. We were both born in Warsaw, 
and like you to give an eye to the case. Very well, said Thorndyke. I will satisfy myself that there is nothing more than appears, and let you have the report. Will that do? Thank you, said Boscovich. It's excessively good of you, Doctor. Oh, here comes the train. I hope it won't inconvenience you to stay and see to the matter. Not in the least, replied Thorndyke. We are not due at Warmington until tomorrow afternoon, and I expect we can find out all that is necessary to know, and still keep our appointment. As Thorndyke spoke, the stranger, who had kept close to us with the evident purpose of hearing what was said, bestowed on him a very curious and attentive look, and it was only when the train had actually come to rest by the platform that he hurried away to find a compartment. No sooner had the train left the station than Thorndyke sought out the station-master, and informed him of the instructions that he had received from Boscovich. "'Of course,' he added in conclusion, "'we must not move in the matter until the police arrive. I suppose they have been informed.' "'Yes,' replied the station-master. "'I'll send a message at once to Chief Constable, and I expect him or an inspector at any moment. In fact, I think I'll slip out of the approach and see if he's coming.' He evidently wished to have a word in private with the police officer before committing himself to any statement. As the official departed, Thorndyke and I began to pace the now empty platform, and my friend, as was his wont, when entering on a new inquiry, meditatively reviewed the features of the problem. "'In a case of this kind,' he remarked, "'we have to decide on one of three possible explanations, accident, suicide, or homicide, and our decision will be determined by inferences from three sets of facts. First, the general facts of the case. Second, the special data obtained by examination of the body, and third, the special data obtained by examining the spot on which the body was found. Now the only general facts at present in our possession are that the deceased was a diamond merchant making a journey for a specific purpose, and probably having on his person property of small bulk and great value. These facts are somewhat against the hypothesis of suicide, and somewhat favourable to that of homicide. Facts relevant to the question of accident would be the existence, or otherwise, of a level crossing, a road or path leading to the line, an enclosing fence, with or without a gate, and any other facts rendering probable or otherwise the accidental presence of the deceased at the spot where the body was found. As we do not possess these facts, it is desirable that we extend our knowledge. "'Why not put a few discreet questions to the porter who brought in the bag and umbrella?' I suggested. "'He is at this moment in earnest conversation with the ticket collector, and would no doubt be glad of a new listener.' "'An excellent suggestion, Jervis,' answered Thorndyke. "'Let us see what he has to tell us.' We approached the porter, and found him, as I had anticipated, bursting to unburden himself of the tragic story. "'The way the thing happened, sir, was this,' he said in answer to Thorndyke's question. "'There was a sharpish bend in the road, just at that place, and the goods train was just rounding the curve, when the driver suddenly caught sight of something lying across the rails. As the engine turned, the headlight shone on it, and then he saw it was a man. He shut off steam at once, blew his whistle, put the brakes down hard, but as you know, sir, a goods train takes some stopping before they could bring her up.' The engine and half a dozen trucks had gone over the poor beggar. Could the driver see how the man was lying? Thorndyke asked. Yes, he could see him quite plain, because the headlights were full on him. He was lying on his face, with his neck over the near rail on the down side. His head was in the forefoot, and his body by the side of the track. It looked as if he had laid himself out of purpose. Is there a level crossing thereabouts? asked Thorndyke. No, sir, no crossing, no road, no path, no nothing, said the porter, ruthlessly sacrificing grammar to emphasis. He must have come across the fields and climbed over the fence to get into the permanent way. Deliberate suicide is what it looks like. How did you learn all this? Thorndyke inquired. Why, the driver, you see, sir, when him and his mate had lifted the body off the track, went on the next signal box and sent his report by telegram. The station master told me all about it as we walked down the line. Thorndyke thanked the man for his information, and as we strolled back towards the lamp room, discussed the bearing of these new facts. "'Our friend is unquestionably right in one respect,' he said. "'This was not an accident. "'The man might, if he were near-sighted, deaf or stupid, "'have climbed over the fence and got knocked down by the train. "'But his position, lying across the rails, "'can only be explained by one of two hypotheses. "'Either it was, as the porter says, deliberate suicide, "'or else the man was already dead or insensible. "'We must leave it at that until we have seen the body, "'that is, if the police will allow us to see it, but here comes the station-master and an officer with him. Let us hear what they have to say. The two officials had evidently made up their minds to decline any outside assistance. The divisional surgeon would make the necessary examination, and information could be obtained through the usual channels. The production of Thorndyke's card, however, somewhat altered the situation. The police inspector hummed and hawed irresolutely, 
with his card in his hand, but finally agreed to allow us to view the body, and we entered the lamp room together, the station master leading the way to turn up the gas. The stretcher stood on the floor by one wall, its grim burden still hidden by the tarpaulin, and the handbag and umbrella lay on a large box, together with the battered frame of a pair of spectacles from which the glasses had fallen out. Were these spectacles found by the body? Thorndyke inquired. Yes, replied the station master. They were close to the head, and the glass was scattered about on the ballast. Thorndyke made a note in his pocket book, and then, as the inspector removed the tarpaulin, he glanced down on the corpse, lying limply on the stretcher, and looking grotesquely horrible, with its displaced head and distorted limbs. For fully a minute he remained silently stooping over the uncanny object on which the inspector was now throwing the light of a large lantern. Then he stood up and said quietly to me, I think we can eliminate two out of the three hypotheses. The inspector looked at him quickly and was about to ask a question, when his attention was diverted by the travelling case which Thorndyke had laid on a shelf, and now opened to abstract a couple of pairs of dissecting forceps. "'We've no authority to make a post-mortem, you know,' said the inspector. "'No, of course not,' said Thorndyke. "'I'm merely going to look into the mouth.' With one pair of forceps he turned back the lip, and having scrutinised its inner surface, closely examined the teeth. "'May I trouble you for your lens, Jervis?' he said, and as I handed him my doublet ready opened, the inspector brought the lantern close to the dead face and leaned forward eagerly. In his usual systematic fashion, Thorndyke slowly passed the lens along the whole range of sharp, uneven teeth, and then, bringing it back to the centre, examined with more minuteness the upper incisors. At length, very delicately, he picked out with his forceps some minute object from between two of the upper front teeth, and held it in the focus of the lens. Anticipating his next move, I took a labelled microscope slide from the case and handed it to him, together with a dissecting needle, and as he transferred the object to the slide and spread it out with a needle, I set up the little microscope on the shelf. A drop of furant and a cover glass, please, Jervis, said Thorndyke. I handed him the bottle, and when he had let a drop of the mountain fluid fall gently on the object and put on the cover slip, he placed the slide on the stage of the microscope and examined it attentively. Happening to glance at the inspector, I observed on his countenance a faint grin, which he politely strove to suppress when he caught my eye. "'I was uh, thinking, sir,' he said apologetically, "'it's a bit of a trap to be finding out what he had for dinner. He didn't die of unwholesome feeding.' Thorndyke looked up with a smile. "'It doesn't do, Inspector, to assume that anything is off the track in an inquiry of this kind. Every fact must have some significance, you know.' "'I don't see any significance in the dart of a man who has had his head calf. the inspector rejoined defiantly. "'Don't you?' said Thorndyke. "'Is there no interest attaching to the last meal of a man who has met a violent death? These crumbs, for instance, that are scattered over the dead man's waistcoat, can we learn nothing from them?' "'I don't see what you can learn,' was the dogged rejoinder. Thorndyke picked up the crumbs one by one with his forceps, and having deposited them on a slide, inspected them first with the lens and then through the microscope. "'I learn,' said he, "'that shortly before his death the deceased partook of some kind of wholemeal biscuits, apparently composed partly of oatmeal.' "'I call that nothing,' said the inspector. "'The question that we have to got to settle is not what refreshments had the deceased been taken, but what was the cause of his death? Did he commit suicide? Or was he killed by accident? Or was there any foul play?' "'I beg your pardon,' said Thorndyke. "'The questions that remain to be settled are who killed the deceased and with what motive. The others are already answered, as far as I am concerned.' The inspector stared in sheer amazement, not unmixed with incredulity. "'You haven't been long coming to a conclusion, sir,' he said. "'No, it was a pretty obvious case of murder,' said Thorndyke. "'As to the motive, the deceased was a diamond merchant, and is believed to have had a quantity of stones about his person. I should suggest that you search the body.' The inspector gave vent to an exclamation of disgust. "'Oh, I see,' he said. "'It was just a guess on your part. The dead man was a diamond merchant and had valuable property about him, therefore he was murdered.' He drew himself up, and regarding Thorndyke with a stern reproach, added, "'But you must understand, sir, that this is a judicial inquiry, not a prize competition in a penny paper. But as to searching the body, that is what I principally came for.' He ostentatiously turned his back on us, and proceeded systematically to turn out the dead man's pockets, laying the articles, as he removed them, on the box by the side of the handbag and umbrella. While he was thus occupied, Thorndyke looked over the body generally, paying special attention to the soles of the boots which, to the inspector's undissembled amusement, he very thoroughly examined with the lens. "'I should have thought, sir, that his feet were large enough to be seen with the naked eye,' was his comment. "'But, perhaps,' he added with a sly glance at the station-master, 
you are a little near-sighted thorndyke chuckled good-humouredly and while the officer continued his search he looked over the articles that had already been lain on the box the purse and pocket-book he naturally left for the inspector to open but the reading-glasses pocket-knife and card-case and other small pocket articles were subjected to a searching scrutiny the inspector watched him out of the corner of his eye with furtive amusement saw him hold up the glasses to the light to estimate their refractive power peer into the tobacco pouch open the cigarette book and examine the watermark of the paper and even inspect the contents of the silver matchbox what might you have expected to find in his tobacco pouch the officer asked laying down a bunch of keys from the dead man's pocket tobacco thorndyke replied stolidly but i did not expect to find fine-cut latakia i don't remember ever having seen pure latakia smoked in cigarettes you do take an interest in things sir said the inspector with a side glance at the stolid station-master i do thorndyke agreed and i note that there are no diamonds among his collection no and we don't know that he had any about him but there's a gold watch and chain a diamond scarf pin and a purse containing he opened it and tipped out its contents into his hand twelve pounds in gold that doesn't much like robbery does it what do you say to the murder theory now my opinion is unchanged said thorndyke and i should like to examine the spot where the body was found has the engine been inspected he added addressing the station-master i telegraphed to bradfield to have it examined the official answered the report has probably come in by now i'd better see before we start down the line we emerged from the lamp-room and at the door found the station inspector waiting with a telegram he handed it to the station-master who read it aloud the engine has been carefully examined by me i find small smear of blood on a near leading wheel and a smaller one on next wheel following no other marks he glanced questioningly at thorndyke who nodded and replied it will be interesting to see if the line tells the same tale the station-master looked puzzled and was apparently about to ask for an explanation but the inspector who had carefully pocketed the dead man's property was impatient to start and accordingly when thorndyke had repackaged his case and had at his own request been furnished with a lantern we set off down the permanent way thorndyke carrying the light and i the indispensable green case i am a little in the dark about this affair i said when we had allowed the two officials to draw ahead out of earshot you came to a conclusion remarkably quickly what was it that so immediately determined the opinion of murder as against suicide it was a small matter but very conclusive replied thorndyke you noticed a small scalp wound above the left temple it was a glancing wound and might easily have been made by the engine but the wound had bled and it had bled for an appreciable time there were two streams of blood from it and in both the blood was firmly clotted and partially dried but the man had been decapitated and this wound if inflicted by the engine must have been made after the decapitation since it was not on the side most distant from the engine as it approached now a decapitated head does not bleed therefore this wound was inflicted before the decapitation but not only had the wound bled the blood trickled down in two streams at right angles to one another first in the order of time as shown by the appearance of the stream it had trickled down the side of the face and dropped on the collar the second stream ran from the wound to the back of the head now you know jervis there are no exceptions to the law of gravity if the blood ran down the face towards the chin the face must have been upright at the time and if the blood trickled from the front to the back of the head the head must have been horizontal and face upwards but the man when he was seen by the engine driver was lying face downwards the only possible inference is that when the wound was inflicted the man was in the upright position standing or sitting and that subsequently and while he was still alive he lay on his back for a sufficiently long time for the blood to have trickled to the back of his head i see i was a duffer not to have reasoned this out for myself i remarked contritely quick observations and rapid inference come by practice replied thorndyke what did you notice about the face i thought there were some strong suggestions of asphyxia undoubtedly said thorndyke it was the face of a suffocated man you must have noticed too that the tongue was very distinctly swollen and that on the inside of the upper lip were deep indentations made by the teeth as well as one or two slight wounds obviously caused by heavy pressure on the mouth and now observe how completely these facts and inferences agree with those from the scalp wound if we knew that the deceased had received a blow on the head had struggled with his assailant and had been finally borne down and suffocated we should look for precisely those signs which we have found by the way what was it that you found wedged between the teeth i did not get a chance to look through the microscope ah said thorndyke there we not only get confirmation but we carry our inferences a stage further the object was a little tuft of some textile fabric 
and of the microscope i found it to consist of several different fibres differently dyed the bulk of it consisted of wool fibres dyed crimson but there were also cotton fibres dyed blue and a few which looked like jute dyed yellow it was obviously a partly coloured fabric and must have been part of a woman's dress though the presence of the jute is much more suggestive of a curtain or rug of inferior quality and its importance is that if it is not part of an article of clothing then it must have come from an article of furniture and furniture suggests a habitation that doesn't seem very conclusive i objected it is not but it is valuable corroboration of what of the suggestion offered by the soles of the dead man's boots i examined them most minutely and could find no trace of sand gravel or earth in spite of the fact that he must have crossed fields and rough land to reach the place where he was found what i did find was fine tobacco ash a charred mark as if a cigar or cigarette had been trodden on several crumbs of biscuit and on a projecting brad some coloured fibres apparently from a carpet the manifest suggestion is that the man was killed in a house with a carpeted floor and carried from thence to the railway i was silent for some moments well as i knew thorndyke i was completely taken by surprise a sensation indeed that i experienced anew every time that i accompanied him on one of his investigations his marvellous power of coordinating apparently insignificant facts of arranging them into an ordered sequence and making them tell a coherent story was a phenomenon that i never got used to every exhibition of it astonished me afresh if your inferences are correct i said the problem is practically solved there must be an abundant trace inside the house the only question is which house is it quite so replied thorndyke that is the question and a very difficult question it is a glance at that interior doubtless cleared up the whole mystery but how are we to get to that glance we cannot enter houses speculatively to see if they present traces of a murder at present our clue breaks off abruptly the other end of it is in some unknown house and if we cannot join up the two ends our problem remains unsolved for the question is you remember who killed oscar brodsky then what do you propose to do i asked the next stage of the inquiry is to connect some particular house with this crime to that end i can only gather up all available facts and consider each in all its possible bearings if i cannot establish any such connection then the inquiry will have failed and we shall have to make a fresh start say at amsterdam if it turns out that brodsky really had diamonds on his person as i have no doubt he had here our conversation was interrupted by arrival at the spot where the body had been found the station-master had halted and he and the inspector were now examining the near rail by the light of the lanterns remarkably little blood about said the former i've seen a good many accidents of this kind and there's never been a lot of blood both on the engine and on the road it's very curious thorndyke glanced at the rail with but slight attention that question had ceased to interest him for the light of his lantern flashed on to the ground at the side of the track a loose gravelly soil mixed with fragments of chalk and from thence to the soles of the inspector's boots which were displayed as he knelt by the rail you observe jervis he said in a low voice and i nodded the inspector's boot soles were covered with adherent particles of gravel and conspicuously marked by the chalk on which he had trodden you haven't found the hat i suppose thorndyke asked stooping to pick up a short piece of string that lay on the ground at the side of the track no replied the inspector but it can't be far off you seem to have found another clue sir he added with a grin glancing at the piece of string who knows said thorndyke a short end of white twine with a green strand in it it may tell us something later at any rate we'll keep it and taking from his pocket a small tin box containing among other things a number of seed envelopes he slipped the string into one of the latter and scribbled a note in pencil on the outside the inspector watched his proceedings with an indulgent smile and then returned to his examination of the track in which thorndyke now joined i suppose the poor chap was near-sighted the officer remarked indicating the remains of the shattered spectacles that might account for his having strayed on to the line possibly said thorndyke he had already noticed the fragments scattered over a sleeper and the adjacent ballast and now once more produced his collecting box from which he took another seed envelope would you have me a pair of four steps jervis he said and perhaps you wouldn't mind taking a pair yourself and helping me to gather up these fragments as i complied the inspector looked up curiously there isn't any doubt about these spectacles belong to the deceased is there he asked he certainly wore spectacles for i saw the mark on his nose still there is no harm in verifying the fact said thorndyke and he added to me in a lower tone pick up every particle you can find jervis it may be most important i don't 
quite see how, I said, groping amongst the shingle for the light of the lantern in search of the tiny splinters of glass. Don't you? returned Thorndyke. Well, look at these fragments. Some of them are a fair size, but many of them on the sleeper are mere grains. And consider their number. Obviously the condition of the glass does not agree with the circumstances in which we find it. These are thick, concave spectacle lenses, broken into a great number of minute fragments. Now, how are they broken? Not merely by falling, evidently. Such a lens, when it is dropped, breaks into a small number of large pieces. Nor were they broken by the wheel passing over them, for they would then have been reduced to fine powder, and that powder would have been visible on the rail, which it is not. Spectacle frames, you may remember, presented the same incongruity. They were battered and damaged more than they would have been by falling, but not nearly so much as they would have been if the wheel had passed over them. What do you suggest, then? I asked. The appearances suggest that the spectacles had been trodden on, but if the body was carried here, the probability is that the spectacles were carried here too, and that they were then already broken, for it is more likely that they were trodden on during the struggle than that the murder trod on them after bringing them here. Hence the importance of picking up every fragment. But why? I inquired rather foolishly, I must admit. Because if, when we have picked up every fragment that we can find, there are still remaining missing a large portion of the lenses, then we can reasonably expect that would tend to support our hypothesis, and we might find the missing remainder elsewhere. If, on the other hand, we find as much of the lenses as we could expect to find, we must conclude that they were broken on this spot. While we were conducting our search, the two officials were circling round with their lanterns in quest of the missing hat when we had at length picked up the last fragment, and a careful search, even aided by a lens, failed to reveal any other, we could see their lanterns moving, like will-o'-the-wisps, some distance down the line. "'We may as well see what we have got before our friends come back,' said Thorndyke, glancing at the twinkling light. "'Lay the case down on the grass by the fence. It will serve for a table.' I did so, and Thorndyke, taking a letter from his pocket, opened it, spread it out flat on the case, securing it with a couple of heavy stones, although the night was quite calm. Then he tipped the contents of the seed envelope out on the paper, and carefully spreading out the pieces of glass, looked at them for some moments in silence. And as he looked, there stole over his face a very curious expression. With sudden eagerness he began picking out the large fragments and laying them on two visiting cards which he had taken from his card-case. Rapidly, and with wonderful deftness, he fitted the pieces together, and as the reconstituted lenses began gradually to take shape on their cards, I looked on with growing excitement, for something in my colleague's manner told me that we were on the verge of a discovery. At length the two ovals of glass lay on their respective cards, complete save for one or two small gaps, and the little heap that remained consisted of fragments so minute as to render further reconstruction impossible. Then Thorndyke leaned back and laughed softly. This is certainly an unlooked-for result, said he. What is? I asked. Don't you see, my dear fellow, there's too much glass. We have almost completely built up the broken lenses, and the fragments that are left over are considerably more than are required to fill up the gaps. I looked at the little heap of small fragments, and saw at once that it was as he had said. There was a surplus of small pieces. It is very extraordinary, I said. What do you think can be the explanation? The fragments will probably tell us, he replied, if we asked them intelligently. He lifted the paper and the two cards carefully onto the ground, and, opening the case, took out the little microscope, in which he fitted the lowest power objective and eyepiece, having a combined magnification of only ten diameters. Then he transferred the minute fragments of glass to a slide, and, having arranged the lantern as a microscope lamp, commenced his examination. Ha! he exclaimed presently. The plot thickens. There is too much glass, and yet too little. That is to say, there are only one or two fragments here that belong to the spectacles, not nearly enough to complete the building up of the lenses. The remainder consists of a soft, uneven, moulded glass, easily distinguished from the clear, hard, optical glass. These foreign fragments are all curved, as if they had formed part of a cylinder, and are, I should say, portions of a wine-glass or tumbler. He moved the slide once or twice, and then continued. We are in luck, Jervis. Here is a fragment with two little diverging lines etched on it evidently the points of an eight-rayed star, and here is another with three points, the ends of three rays. This enables us to reconstruct the vessel perfectly. It was a clear, thin glass, probably a tumbler, decorated with scattered stars. I dare say you know the pattern. Sometimes there is an ornamented band in addition, but generally the stars form the only decoration. Have a look at the specimen. I had just applied my eye to the microscope when the station-master and the inspector came up. Our appearance, seated on the ground with the microscope between us, was too much for the police officer's gravity, and he laughed long and joyously. 
You must excuse me, gentlemen, he said apologetically. But really, you know, to an old hand like myself, it doesn't look a little well. You know, I said, I dare say a microscope is a very interesting and amusing thing, but it doesn't get you much forward in a case like this, does it? Perhaps not, replied Thorndyke. By the way, where did you find the hat, after all? We haven't found it, the inspector replied. Then we must help you to continue the search, said Thorndyke. If you will wait a few moments, we will come with you. He poured a few drops of xylol balsam on the cards to fix the reconstituted lenses to their supports, and then, packing them and the microscope in the case, announced that he was ready to start. Is there any village or hamlet near? he asked the station master. None nearer than Caulfield. It's about half a mile from here. And where is the nearest road? There's an half made road that runs past the house for about three hundred yards from here. It belonged to a building estate that was never built. There was a footpath from it to the station. Are there any other houses near? No, that was the only house for half a mile round, and there's no other road near here. Then the probability is that Brodsky approached the railway from that direction, as he was found on that side of the permanent way. The inspector agreed with his view, as we all set off slowly towards the house, piloted by the station master and searching the ground as we went. The wasteland over which we passed was covered with patches of docks and nettles, through each of which the inspector kicked his way, searching with feet and lantern for the missing hat. A walk of three hundred yards brought us to a low wall enclosing a garden, beyond which we could see a small house, and here we halted, while the inspector waded into a large bed of nettles beside the wall and kicked vigorously. Suddenly there came a clinking sound mingled with objurgations, and the inspector hopped out, holding one foot and soliloquizing profanely. I wonder what sort of fool put that thing like that in a bed of nettles, he exclaimed, stroking the injured foot. Thorndyke picked the object up and held it in the light of a lantern displaying a piece of three-quarter inch rolled iron bar about a foot long. It doesn't seem to have been here very long, he observed, examining it closely. There's hardly any rust on it. Been here long enough for me, growled the inspector, and I like to bang it on the head of the blight that put it there. Callously indifferent to the inspector's sufferings, Thorndyke continued calmly to examine the bar. At length, resting his lantern on the wall, he produced his pocket lens, with which he resumed his investigation proceeding that so exasperated the inspector that the afflicted official limped off in dudgeon followed by the station-master and we heard him presently rapping at the front door of the house be a slide jervis with a drop of farrant on it said thorndyke there are some fibres sticking to this bar i prepared the slide and having handed it to him together with a cover glass a pair of forceps and a needle set up the microscope on the wall i'm sorry for the inspector thorndyke remarked with his eye applied to the little instrument that was a lucky kick for us just take a look at the specimen. I did so, and having moved the slide about until I had seen the whole of the object, I gave my opinion. Red wool fibres, blue cotton fibres, and some yellow vegetable fibres that look like jute. Yes, said Thorndyke. The same combination of fibres as that which we found on the dead man's teeth, and probably from the same source. This bar has probably been wiped on that very curtain or rug with which poor Brodsky was stifled. We will place it on the wall for future reference, and meanwhile, by hook or by crook, we must get into that house. There is much too plain a hint to be disregarded. Hastily repacking the case, we hurried to the front of the house, where we found the two officials looking rather vaguely up the unmade road. There's a light on in the house, said the inspector. There's no one at home. I've knocked a dozen times, got no answer. Don't see what we're hanging about here for at all. The house is probably close to where the body was found, and we shall find it in the morning. Thorndyke made no reply but entering the garden, stepped up the path, and having knocked gently at the door, stooped and listened attentively at the keyhole. "'I'll tell you, there's no one in the house, sir,' said the inspector, irritably, and as Thorndyke continued to listen, he walked away, muttering angrily. As soon as he was gone, Thorndyke flashed his lantern over the door, the threshold, the path, and the small flower-beds, and from one of the latter I presently saw him stoop and pick something up. "'Here is a highly instructive object, Jervis,' he said, coming out to the gate and displaying a cigarette of which only half an inch had been smoked. How instructive, I asked. What do you learn from it? Many things, he replied. It has been lit and thrown away unsmoked. That indicates a sudden change of purpose. It was thrown away at the entrance to the house, almost certainly by someone entering it. That person was probably a stranger, or he would have taken it in with him. But he had not expected to enter the house, or he would not have lit it. These are the general suggestions. Now, as to the particular ones, the paper of the cigarette is the kind known as the zigzag brand. The very conspicuous watermark is quite easy to see. Now Brodsky's cigarette book was a zigzag book, so called from the way in which the papers pull out. But let us see what the tobacco is like. With a pin from his coat, he hooked out from the unburned end a wisp of dark, dirty brown tobacco, which he held out for my inspection. 
fine cut latakia i pronounced without hesitation very well said thorndyke here is a cigarette made of an unusual tobacco similar to that in brodsky's pouch and wrapped in an unusual paper similar to those in brodsky's cigarette book with due regard to the fourth rule of the syllogism i suggested this cigarette was made by oscar brodsky but nevertheless we will look for corroborative detail what is that i asked you may have noticed that brodsky's matchbox contained round wooden vestas which are also rather unusual as he must have lighted the cigarette within a few steps of the gate he ought to be able to find the match with which he lighted it let us try up the road in the direction from which he would probably have approached we walked very slowly up the road searching the ground with a lantern and we had hardly gone a dozen paces when i spied a match lying on the rough path and eagerly picked it up it was a round wooden vesta thorndyke examined it with interest and having deposited it with the cigarette in his collecting box turned to retrace his steps there is now jervis no reasonable doubt that brodsky was murdered in that house we have succeeded in connecting that house with the crime and now we've got to force an entrance and join up the other clues we walked quickly back to the rear of the premises where we found the inspector conversing disconsolately with the station-master i think sir said the former we had better go back now in fact i don't see what we came here for but here i say sir you mustn't do that for thorndyke without a word of warning had sprung up lightly and thrown one of his long legs over the wall i can't allow you to enter private premises sir continued the inspector but thorndyke quietly dropped down on the inside and turned to face the officer over the wall now listen to me inspector said he i have good reasons for believing that the dead man brodsky has been in this house in fact i am prepared to swear on information to that effect but time is precious we must follow the scent whilst it is hot and i am not proposing to break into the house off-hand i merely wish to examine the dustbin the dustbin gasped the inspector well you really are a most extraordinary gentleman what do you expect to find in the dustbin i am looking for a broken tumbler or wine-glass it is a thin glass vessel decorated with a pattern of small eight-pointed stars it may be in the dustbin or it may be inside the house the inspector hesitated but thorndyke's confident manner had evidently impressed him we well, can soon see what's in the dustbin he said though what in creation a broken tumbler has to do with the case is more than i can understand however here goes he sprang up onto the wall and as he dropped down into the garden the station master and i followed thorndyke lingered a few moments by the gate examining in the ground while the two officials hurried up the path finding nothing of interest however he walked towards the house looking keenly about him as he went but we were hardly halfway up the path when we heard the voice of the inspector calling excitedly here you are sir this way he sang out and as we hurried forward we suddenly came on the two officials standing over the small rubbish heap and looking the picture of astonishment the glare of their lanterns illuminated the heap and showed us the scattered fragments of a thin glass star pattern tumbler i can't imagine how you guessed it was here sir said the inspector with a new-born respect in his tone nor what you're going to do with it now you've found it merely another link in the chain of evidence said thorndyke taking a pair of forceps from the case and stooping over the heap perhaps we shall find something out he picked up several small fragments of glass looked at them closely and dropped them again suddenly his eye caught a small splinter at the base of the heap seizing it with the forceps he held it close to his eye in the strong lamplight and taking out his lens examined it with minute attention yes he said at length this is what i was looking for let me have those two cards jervis i produced the two visiting cards with the reconstructed lenses stuck to them and laying them on the lid of the case threw the light of the lantern on them thorndyke looked at them intently for some time and from them to the fragment that he held then turning to the inspector he said you saw me pick up this splinter of glass yes sir replied the officer and you saw where we found these spectacle glasses and know whose they were yes sir where well, dead man's spectacles and he found them where the body had been oh, very well said thorndyke now observe and as the two officials craned forward with parted lips he laid the little splinter in a gap in one of the lenses and then gave it a gentle push forward when it occupied the gap perfectly joining edge to edge with the adjacent fragments and rendering that portion of the lens complete my god exclaimed the inspector how on earth did you know i must explain that later said thorndyke meanwhile we had better have a look inside the house i expect to find there a cigarette possibly a cigar which has been trodden on some wholemeal biscuits possibly a wooden vesta and perhaps even a missing hat at the mention of the hat the inspector stepped eagerly to the back door but finding it bolted he tried the window this also was securely fastened and on thorndyke's advice we went round to the front door 
This door is locked too, said the inspector. I'm afraid you'll have to break in. It's a nuisance, though. Have a look at the window, suggested Thorndyke. The officer did so, struggling vainly to undo the patent catch with his pocket knife. Ah, good, he said, coming back to the door. Which left he broke off with an astonished stare, for the door stood open, and Thorndyke was putting something in his pocket. Your friend doesn't waste much time even in picking a lock, he remarked to me, as we followed Thorndyke into the house, but his reflections were soon merged in a new surprise. Thorndyke had preceded us into a small sitting-room, dimly lighted by a hanging lamp turned down low. As we entered, he turned up the light and glanced about the room. A whisky bottle was on the table, with a siphon, a tumbler, and a biscuit box. Pointing to the latter, Thorndyke said to the inspector, "'See what is in that box.' The inspector raised the lid and peeped in. The station-master peered over his shoulder, and then both stared at Thorndyke. "'How in the name of goodness did you know that there were old mill biscuits in the house, sir?' exclaimed the station-master. "'You would be disappointed if I told you.' replied Thorndyke. But look at this. He pointed to the hearth, where lay a flattened half-smoked cigarette and a round wooden vesta. The inspector gazed at these objects in silent wonder, while as to the stationmaster, he continued to stare at Thorndyke with what I can only describe as superstitious awe. "'You have the dead man's property with you, I believe,' said my colleague. "'Yes,' replied the inspector. "'I put the things in my pocket for safety.' "'Then,' said Thorndyke, picking up the flattened cigarette, let us have a look at his tobacco pouch. As the officer produced and opened the pouch, Thorndyke neatly cut open the cigarette with his sharp pocket knife. Now, said he, what kind of tobacco is in the pouch? The inspector took out a pinch, looked at it, and smelt it distastefully. One of those stinking tobaccos, he said. They put them in mixtures, let take here, I think. And what is this? asked Thorndyke, pointing to the open cigarette. Same stuff, undoubtedly, replied the inspector. "'And now let us see his cigarette papers,' said Thorndyke. The little book, or rather packet, for it consisted of separated papers, was produced from the officer's pocket, and a sample paper abstracted. Thorndyke laid the half-burnt paper beside it, and the inspector, having examined the two, held them up to the light. "'There isn't much chance of mistake in that zigzag watermark,' he said. "'This cigarette was made by the deceased. There can't be the shadow of a doubt.' "'One more point,' said Thorndyke, laying the burnt wooden vesta on the table. "'You have his matchbox. The inspector brought forth a little silver casket, opened it, and compared the wooden vestas that it contained with the burnt end. Then he shut the box with a snap. "'You've proved it up to the ilt,' said he. "'If we could only find the hat, we should have a complete case.' "'I'm not sure we haven't found the hat,' said Thorndyke. "'You notice that something besides coal has been burned in the grate?' The inspector ran eagerly to the fireplace, and began with feverish hands to pick out the remains of the extinct fire. "'The cinders are still warm,' he said. "'Now, certainly not all coal cinders.' There's been wood burned here on top of the coal, and these little black lumps are neither coal nor wood, and may quite possibly be the remains of a burnt hat. But, Lord, who can tell? You can put together the pieces of broken spectacle glasses, but you can't build up an hat out of a few cinders. He held out a handful of the little black, spongy cinders, and looked ruefully at Thorndyke, who took them from him and laid them out on the sheet of paper. We can't reconstitute the hat, certainly, my friend agreed, but we may be able to ascertain the origin of these remains. They may not be cinders of a hat, after all. He lit a wax match, and taking up one of the charred fragments, applied the flame to it. The cindery mass, fused at once with a crackling, seething sound, emitting a dense smoke, and instantly the air became charged with a pungent, resinous odour mingled with the smell of burning animal matter. "'Smells like varnish,' the station-master remarked. "'Yes, Shellac said Thorndyke. "'So the first test gives a positive result.' The next test will take more time. He opened the green case and took from it a little flask, fitted for Marsh's arsenic test, with a safety funnel and escape tube, a small folding tripod, a spirit lamp, and a disc of asbestos to serve as a sand bath. Dropping into the flask several of the cindery masses, selected after careful inspection, he filled it up with alcohol and placed it on the disc, which he rested on the tripod. Then he lighted the spirit lamp underneath and sat down to wait for the alcohol to boil. "'There is one little point that we may as well settle,' he said presently, as the bubbles began to rise in the flask. "'Give me a slide with a drop of farant on it, Jervis.' I prepared the slide, while Thorndyke, with a pair of forceps, picked out a tiny wisp from the tablecloth. "'I fancy we have seen this fabric before,' he remarked, as he laid the little pinch of fluff in the mounting fluid, and slipped the slide onto the stage of the microscope. "'Yes,' he continued, looking into the eyepiece. "'Here are our old acquaintances.' the red wool fibres, 
the blue cotton, and the yellow jute. We must label this at once, or we may confuse it with the other specimens. Have you any idea the deceased man is deaf? the inspector asked. Yes, replied Thorndyke. I take it that the murderer enticed him into this room and gave him some refreshments. The murderer sat in the chair in which he was sitting. Brodsky sat in that small armchair. Then I imagine the murderer attacked him with that iron bar that you found among the nettles, failed to kill him at the first stroke, struggled with him, and finally suffocated him with the tablecloth. By the way, there is just one more point. You recognize this piece of string? He took from his collecting box the little end of twine that had been picked up by the line. The inspector nodded. Look behind you. You will see where it came from. The officer turned sharply, and his eye lighted on a string box on the mantelpiece. He lifted it down, and Thorndyke drew out from it a length of white twine with one green strand, which he compared with the piece in his hand. Green stranded it makes the identification fairly certain, he said. Of course the string was used to secure the umbrella and handbag. He could not have carried them in his hand, encumbered as he was with the corpse, but I expect our other specimen is ready now. He lifted the flask off the tripod, and giving it a vigorous shake, examined the contents through his lens. The alcohol had now become dark brown in colour, and was noticeably thicker and more syrupy in consistence. "'I think we have enough here for a rough test,' said he, selecting a pipette and a slide from the case. He dipped the former into the flask, and having sucked up a few drops of the alcohol from the bottom, held the pipette over the slide in which he allowed the contained fluid to drop. Laying a cover glass on the little pool of alcohol, he put the slide on the microscope stage and examined it attentively, while we watched him in expectant silence. At length he looked up, and addressing the inspector said, Do you know what felt hats are made of? Oh, I can't say that I do, sir, replied the officer. Well, the better quality hats are made of rabbits and hares' wool. The soft underfur, you know, cemented together with shellac. Now there is very little doubt that these cinders contain shellac, and with the microscope I found a number of small hairs of a rabbit. I have, therefore, little hesitation in saying that these cinders are the remains of a hard felt hat, and, as the hairs do not appear to be dyed, I should say it was a grey hat. At this moment our conclave was interrupted by hurried footsteps on the garden path, and, as we turned with one account, an elderly woman burst into the room. She stood for a moment in mute astonishment, and then looked from one door to the other, demanding, "'Who are you, and what are you doing here?' The inspector rose. "'I'm a police officer, madam,' he said he. "'I can't give you any further information just now, but if you'll excuse me, Austin, who are you?' "'I'm Mr. Hickler's housekeeper,' she replied. Uh, "'Mr. Hickler, are you expecting him home shortly?' "'No, I'm not,' was the curt reply. "'Mr. Hickler is away from home just now. He left this evening by the boat train.' "'Port Amsterdam?' asked Thorndyke. "'I believe so, but I don't see what business it is of yours,' the housekeeper answered. "'I thought he might perhaps be a diamond broker or merchant,' said Thorndyke. "'A good many of them travel by that train.' "'So he is,' said the woman. "'At least he has something to do with diamonds.' "'Ah, oh, well, we must be going, Jervis,' said Thorndyke. "'We have finished here, and we have to find a hotel or inn. "'Can I have a word with you, Inspector?' The officer, now entirely humble and reverent, followed us into the garden to receive Thorndyke's parting advice. "'You had better take possession of the house at once, and get rid of the housekeeper. "'Nothing must be removed. "'Preserve those cinders, and see that the rubbish-heap is not disturbed. "'And above all, don't have the rooms swept. "'An officer will be sent to relieve you.' With a friendly good night, we went on our way, guided by the station master, and here our connection with the case came to an end. Hitler, whose Christian name turned out to be Silas, was, it is true, arrested as he stepped ashore from the steamer, and a packet of diamonds subsequently identified as the property of Oscar Brodsky found upon his person. But he was never brought to trial, for on the return voyage he contrived to elude his guards for an instant as the ship was approaching the English coast, and it was not until three days later when a handcuffed body was cast off on the lonely shore by Oxfordness that the authorities knew the fate of Silas Hickler. An appropriate and dramatic end to a singular and yet typical case, said Thorndyke as he put down the newspaper. I hope it has enlarged your knowledge, Jervis, and enabled you to form one or two useful corollaries. I prefer to hear you sing the medical legal doxology, I answered, turning upon him like the proverbial worm and grinning derisively which the worm does not. I know you do, he retorted with mock gravity, and I lament your lack of mental initiative. 
However, the points that this case illustrates are these. First, the danger of delay, the vital importance of instant action before that frail and fleeting thing that we call a clue has time to evaporate. A delay of a few hours would have left us with hardly a single datum. Second, the necessity of pursuing the most trivial clue to an absolute finish, as illustrated by the spectacle. Third, the urgent need of a trained scientist to aid the police. And last, he concluded with a smile, we learn never to go abroad without the invaluable green case. End of section two. Section three of The Singing Bone, or The Adventures of Dr. Thorndike, by R. Austin Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Case of Premeditation, Part One. The Elimination of Mr. Pratt. The wine merchant, who should supply a consignment of petit vin to a customer who had ordered and paid for a vintage wine, would render himself subject to unambiguous comment. Nay, more, he would be liable to certain legal penalty, and yet his conduct would be morally indistinguishable from that of the railway company, which, having accepted a first-class fare, inflicts upon the passenger that kind of company which he is paid to avoid. But the corporate conscience, as Herbert Spencer was wont to explain, is an altogether inferior product to that of the individual. Such were the reflections of Mr. Rufus Pembury, when, as the train was about to move out of Maidstone, West, Station, a coarse and burly man, clearly a denizen of the third class, was ushered into his compartment by the guard. He had paid the higher fare, not for cushioned seats, but for seclusion, or at least select company. The man's entry had deprived him of both, and he resented it. But if the presence of this stranger involved a breach of contract, his conduct was a positive affront, an indignity, for no sooner had the train started then he fixed upon Mr. Pembry a gaze of impertinent intensity, and continued thereafter to regard him with a stare as steady and unwinking as that of a Polynesian idol. It was offensive to a degree, and highly disconcerting withal. Mr. Pembry fidgeted in his seat with increasing discomfort and rising temper. He looked into his pocket-book, read one or two letters, and sorted a collection of visiting cards. He even thought of opening his umbrella. Finally his patience exhausted, and his wrath mounting to boiling point, he turned to the stranger with frosty remonstrance. I imagine, sir, that you will have no difficulty in recognizing me, should we ever meet again, which, God forbid, I should recognize you among ten thousand, was the reply, so unexpected as to leave Mr. Pembry speechless. You see, the stranger continued impressively, I've got the gift of faces. I never forget. That must be a great consolation, said Pembry. Very useful to me said the stranger. At least it used to be. When I was a warder at Portland, you remember me, I dare say. My name is Pratt. I was assistant warder in your time. God forsaken old Portland, and mighty glad I was when they used to send me up to town on recognising duty. Holloway was the house of detention then, you remember? That was before they moved to Brixton. Pratt paused in his reminiscences, and Pembury, pale and gasping with astonishment, pulled himself together. I think, said he, you must be mistaking me for someone else. I don't, replied Pratt. You're Francis Dobbs, that's who you are. Slipped away from Portland one evening about twelve years ago. Clothes washed up on the bill next day. No trace of fugitive. As neat and mizzle as ever I heard of. But there are a couple of photographs and a set of fingerprints of the habitual criminal's register. Perhaps you'd like to come and see them. Why should I go to the habitual criminal's register? Pembry demanded faintly. Ah, exactly. Why should you? When you're a man of means and a little judiciously invested capital would render it unnecessary. Pembry looked out of the window, and for a minute or more preserved a stony silence. At length he turned suddenly to Pratt. How much? he asked. I shouldn't think a couple hundred a year would hurt you, was the calm reply. Pembry reflected a while. What makes you think I am a man of means? he asked presently. Pratt smiled grimly. Bless you, Mr. Pembry, said he. I know all about you. Why, for the last six months, I've been living within an half mile of your house. The devil you have! Yes, when I retired from the service, 
General O'Gorman engaged me as a set, sort of steward or caretaker of his little place at Baysford. He's very seldom there himself, and the very day after I came down I met you and spied you. But naturally, I kept out of sight myself. Thought I'd find out whether you were good for anything before I spoke. So I've been keeping my uh, ears open and find you're good for a couple of hundred. There was an interval of silence, and then the ex-warder resumed. That's what comes of having a memory for faces. Now there's Jack Ellis on the other hand. He must have had you under his nose for a couple of years, and yet he's never twigged. He never will either, added Pratt, already regretting the confidence into which his vanity had led him. Who is Jack Ellis? Pembry demanded sharply. Why, he's a sort of supernumerary at the Baysford Police Station, does odd jobs, rural detective, helps in the office and that sort of thing. He was in a civil guard at Portland in your time, but he got his left forefinger chopped off, so they pensioned him, and he was a Baysford man. He got this billet, but he'll never recognise you, don't you fear? Unless you'll direct his attention to me, suggested Pembry. Oh, there's no fear of that, laughed Pratt. You can trust me to sit quiet on my own nest egg. Besides, we're not very friendly. He came nosing round our place after the parlour maid. Him a married man, mark you. But I soon boosted him out, I can tell you, and Jack Ellis don't like me now. Yeah, I see, said Pembry reflectively. Then after a pause he asked, Who is this General O'Gorman? I seem to know the name. I expect you do, said Pratt. He was Governor of Dartmoor when I was there. That was my last billet. And let me tell you, if you'd been a Portland in your time, you'd never have got away. Yeah, is that? Why, you see, the general was a great man on bloodhounds. He kept a pack at Dartmoor, and you bet those lags knew it. There were no attempted escapes in those days. They wouldn't have had a chance. He has the pack still, hasn't he? asked Pembry. Rather. Spends an any amount of time on training them, too. He's always hoping there'll be a burglary or a murder in the neighbourhood so he can try them. But he's never got a chance yet. Perhaps the crooks have heard about them. But to come back to our little arrangement, what do you say to a couple of hundred pay quarterly, if you like? i can't settle the matter off hand said pembry you must give me time to think it over very well said pratt i shall be back at baseford tomorrow evening that'll give you a clear day to think it over still i'll look in your place tomorrow night no replied pembry you'd better not be seen at my house nor i at yours if i meet you at some quiet spot where we shan't be seen we can settle our business without any one knowing that we have met it won't take long and we can't be too careful that's true agreed pratt well i'll tell you what there's an avenue leading up to our house you know it i expect there's no lodge and the gates are always ajar excepting at night now i shall be down by the six thirty at baseford our place is a quarter of an hour from the station say you meet me in the avenue at a quarter to seven it will suit me said pembry that is if you are sure the bloodhounds won't be straying about the grounds oh bless you now laughed pratt do you suppose the general lets his precious hounds stray about for any casual crook to feed him with poison sausage? No, they're locked up safe in the kennels, at the back of the house. Hello, this'll be swanly, I expect. I'll change into a smoker here and leave your time to turn the matter over in your mind. So long. Tomorrow evening in the avenue at a quarter to seven. And I say, Mr. Pembry, you might as well bring the first instalment with you. Fifty. In small notes or gold. Very well, said Mr. Pembry. He spoke coldly enough. But there was a flush on his cheeks and an angry light in his eyes which perhaps the ex-warder noticed for when he had stepped out and shut the door he thrust his head in at the window and said threateningly one more word mr pembry dobbs no anky panky you know i'm old hand and pretty fly i am so don't you try any chickery pokery on me that's all he withdrew his head and disappeared leaving pembry to his reflections the nature of those reflections if some telepathist transferring his attention for the moment from hidden courtyards or missing thimbles from more practical matters could have conveyed them into the mind of mr pratt would have caused that quondam official some surprise and perhaps a little disquiet for long experience of the criminal as he appears when endurance had produced some rather misleading ideas as to his behaviour when at large in fact the ex-warder had considerably underestimated the ex-convict rufus pembry to give his real name for dobbs was literally a nom de guerre was a man of strong character and intelligence so much so that having tried the criminal career and found it not worth pursuing he had definitely abandoned it when the cattle boat that picked him off at portland bill had landed him at an american port he brought his entire ability and energy to bear on legitimate commercial pursuits and with such success that at the end of ten years he was able to return to england 
with a moderate competence. Then he had taken a modest house near the little town of Baseford, where he had lived quietly on his savings for the last two years, holding aloof without much difficulty from the rather exclusive local society. And here he might have lived out the rest of his life in peace, but for the unlucky chance that brought the man Pratt into the neighbourhood. With the arrival of Pratt, his security was utterly destroyed. There is something eminently unsatisfactory about a blackmailer. No arrangement with him has any permanent validity. No undertaking that he gives is binding. The thing which he has sold remains in his possession to sell over again. He pockets the price of emancipation, but retains the key of the fetters. In short, the blackmailer is a totally impossible person. Such were the considerations that had passed through the mind of Rufus Pembury, even while Pratt was making his proposals, and those proposals he had never for an instant entertained. The ex-warder's advice to him to turn the matter over in his mind was unnecessary, for his mind was already made up. His decision was arrived at in the very moment when Pratt had disclosed his identity. The conclusion was self-evident. Before Pratt appeared, he was living in peace and security. While Pratt remained, his liberty was precarious from moment to moment. If Pratt should disappear, his peace and security would return. Therefore, Pratt must be eliminated. It was a logical consequence. The profound meditations, therefore, in which Pembry remained immersed for the remainder of the journey had nothing whatever to do with the courtly allowance. They were concerned exclusively with the elimination of ex-warder Pratt. Now Rufus Pembry was not a ferocious man, he was not even cruel, but he was gifted with a certain magnanimous cynicism, which ignored the trivialities of sentiment and regarded only the main issues. If a wasp hummed over his teacup, he would crush that wasp, but not with his bare hand. The wasp carried the means of aggression. That was the wasp's lookout. His concern was to avoid being stung. So it was with Pratt. The man had elected, for his own profit, to threaten Pembury's liberty. Very well. He had done it at his own risk. That risk was no concern of Pembury's. His concern was his own safety. When Pembury alighted at Charing Cross, he directed his steps, after having watched Pratt's departure from the station, to Buckingham Street, Strand, where he entered a quiet private hotel. He was apparently expected, for the manageress greeted him by his name, as she handed him his key. "'Are you staying in town, Mr. Pembury?' she asked. "'No,' was the reply. "'I go back tomorrow morning. They may be coming up again shortly. By the way, you used to have an encyclopedia in one of the rooms. Could I see it for a moment?' "'It is in the drawing-room,' said the manageress. "'Shall I show you? But you know the way, don't you?' Certainly Mr. Pembry knew the way. It was on the first floor, a pleasant old world room looking on the quiet old street, and on a shelf amidst a collection of novels stood the sedate volumes of Chambers' Encyclopedia. That a gentleman from the country should desire to look up the subject of hounds would not to a casual observer have seemed unnatural. But when from hounds the student proceeded to the article on blood, and thence to one devoted to perfumes, the observer might reasonably have felt some surprise and this surprise might have been augmented if he had followed Mr. Pembry's subsequent proceedings, and especially if he had considered them as the actions of a man whose immediate aim was the removal of a superfluous unit of the population. Having deposited his bag and umbrella in his room, Pembry set forth from the hotel as one with a definite purpose, and his footsteps led, in the first place, to an umbrella shop on the Strand, where he selected a thick rattan cane. There was nothing remarkable in this, perhaps, but the cane was of an uncomely thickness, and the salesman protested. "'I like a thick cane,' said Pembry. "'Yes, sir, but for a gentleman of your height,' Pembry was a small, slight-built man, "'I would venture to suggest.' "'I like a thick cane,' repeated Pembry. "'Cut it down to the proper length, and don't rivet the ferule on. I'll cement it on when I get home.' His next investment would have seemed more to the purpose, though suggestive of unexpected crudity of method. It was a large Norwegian knife, but not content with this, he went on forthwith to a second cutler's and purchased a second knife, the exact duplicate of the first. Now for what purpose could he want two identically similar knives, and why not have bought them both at the same shop? It was highly mysterious. Shopping appeared to be a positive mania with Rufus Pembry. In the course of the next half-hour he acquired a cheap handbag an artist's black japanned brush case, a three-cornered file, a stick of elastic glue, and a pair of iron crucible tongs. Still insatiable, 
he repaired to an old-fashioned chemist's shop in a by-street where he further enriched himself with a packet of absorbent cotton wool and an ounce of permanganate of potash and as the chemist wrapped up these articles with the occult and necromantic air peculiar to chemists pembry watched him impassively i suppose you don't keep musk he asked carelessly the chemist paused in the act of heating a stick of sealing wax and appeared as if about to mutter an incantation but he merely replied no sir not the solid musk it's so very costly but i have the essence it isn't as strong as the pure stuff i suppose no replied the chemist with a cryptic smile not so strong but strong enough these animal perfumes are so very penetrating you know and so lasting why well, i venture to say that if you were to sprinkle a tablespoonful of the essence in the middle of st paul's and the place would smell of it six months hence you don't say so said pembry well that ought to be enough for anybody i'll take a small quantity please and for goodness sake see that there isn't any on the outside of the bottle the stuff isn't for myself and i don't want to go about smelling like a civet cat naturally you don't sir agreed the chemist he then produced an ounce bottle a small glass funnel and a stoppered bottle labelled s moshi with which he proceeded to perform a few trifling feats of le jardin there sir said he when he had finished the performance there is not a drop on the outside of the bottle and if i fit it with a rubber cork you will be quite secure pembry's dislike of musk appeared to be excessive for when the chemist had retired into a secret cubicle as if to hold converse with some familiar spirit but actually to change half a crown he took the brush case from his bag pulled off its lid and then with the crucible tongs daintily lifted the bottle off the counter slid it softly into the brush case and replacing the lid returned the case and tongs to the bag the other two packets he took from the counter and dropped into his pocket and when the presiding wizard having miraculously transformed a single half-crown into four pennies handed him the product he left the shop and walked thoughtfully back towards the strand suddenly a new idea seemed to strike him he halted considered for a few moments and then strode away northward to make the oddest of all his purchases the transaction took place in a shop in the seven dials whose strange stock in trade ranged the whole zoological gamut from water snails to angora cats pembry looked at a cage of guinea pigs in the window and entered the shop do you happen to have a dead guinea pig he asked no mine are all alive replied the man adding with a sinister grin but they're not immortal you know pembry looked at the man distastefully there is an appreciable difference between a guinea pig and a blackmailer any small mammal will do he said there's a, a dead rat in that cage if he's any good said the man died this morning so he's quite fresh i'll take the rat said pembry he'll do quite well the little corpse was accordingly made into a parcel and deposited in the bag and pembry having tendered a complimentary fee made his way back to the hotel after a modest lunch he went forth and spent the remainder of the day transacting the business which had originally brought him to town he dined at a restaurant and did not return to his hotel until ten o'clock when he took his key and tucking under his arm a parcel that he had brought in with him retired for the night but before undressing and after locking his door he did a very strange and unaccountable thing having pulled off the loose ferule from his newly purchased cane he bored a hole in the bottom of it with the spike end of the file then using the latter as a broach he enlarged the hole until only a narrow rim of the bottom was left he next rolled up a small ball of cotton wool and pushed it into the ferule and having smeared the end of the cane with elastic glue he replaced the ferule warming it over the gas to make the glue stick when he had finished with the cane he turned his attention to one of the norwegian knives first he carefully removed with the file most of the bright yellow varnish from the wooden case or handle then he opened the knife and cutting the string of the parcel that he had brought in took from it the dead rat which he had bought at the zoologist's laying the animal on a sheet of paper he cut off its head and holding it up by the tail allowed the blood that oozed from the neck to drop on the knife spreading it over both sides of the blade and handle with his finger then he laid the knife on the paper and softly opened the window from the darkness below came the voice of a cat apparently perfecting itself in the execution of chromatic scales and in that direction pembry flung the body and head of the rat and closed the window finally having washed his hands and stuffed the paper from the parcel into the fireplace he went to bed but his proceedings in the morning were equally mysterious having breakfasted betimes he returned to his bedroom and locked himself in then he tied his new cane handled downwards to the leg of the dressing-table 
next with the crucible tongs he drew the little bottle of musk from the brush case and having assured himself by sniffing at it that the exterior was really free from odour he withdrew the rubber cork then slowly and with infinite care he poured a few drops perhaps half a teaspoonful of the essence from a cotton wool that bulged through the hole in the ferrule watching the absorbent material narrowly as it soaked up the liquid when it was saturated he proceeded to treat the knife in the same fashion letting fall a drop of the essence on the wooden handle which soaked it up readily this done he slid up the window and looked out immediately below was a tiny yard in which grew or rather survived a couple of faded laurel bushes the body of the rat was nowhere to be seen it had apparently been spirited away in the night holding out the bottle which he still held he dropped it into the bushes flinging the rubber cork after it his next proceeding was to take a tube of vaseline from his dressing bag and squeeze a small quantity under his fingers with this he thoroughly smeared the shoulder of the brush case and the inside of the lid so as to ensure an airtight joint having wiped his fingers he picked the knife up with the crucible tongs and dropping it into the brush case immediately pushed on the lid then he heated the tips of the tongs and the gas flame to destroy the scent packed the tongs and brush case in the bag untied the cane carefully avoiding contact with the ferrule and taking up the two bags went out holding the cane by its middle there was no difficulty in finding an empty compartment for first-class passengers were few at that time in the morning pembury waited on the platform until the guard's whistle sounded when he stepped into the compartment shut the door and laid the cane on the seat with its ferrule pointing out of the offside window in which position it remained until the train drew up in baysford station pembury left his dressing bag at the cloakroom and still grasping the cane by its middle he sallied forth the town of baysford lay some half a mile to the east of the station his own house was a mile along the road to the west and halfway between his house and the station was the residence of general o'gorman he knew the place well originally a farmhouse it stood on the edge of a great expanse of flat meadows and communicated with the road by an avenue nearly three hundred yards long of ancient trees the avenue was shut off from the road by a pair of iron gates but these were merely ornamental for the place was unenclosed and accessible from the surrounding meadows indeed an indistinct footpath crossed the meadows and intersected the avenue about half way up on this occasion pembury whose objective was the avenue elected to approach it by the latter route and at each stile or fence that he surmounted he paused to survey the country presently the avenue arose before him lying athwart the narrow track and as he entered it between two of the trees he halted and looked about him he stood listening for a while beyond the faint rustle of leaves no sound was to be heard evidently there was no one about and as pratt was at large it was probable that the general was absent but now pembury began to examine the adjacent trees with more than a casual interest the two between which he had entered were respectively an elm and a great pollard oak the latter being an immense tree whose huge warty bole divided about seven feet from the ground into three limbs each as large as a fair-sized tree of which the largest swept outward in a great curve halfway across the avenue on this patriarch pembry bestowed especial attention walking completely round it and finally laying down his bag and cane the latter resting on the bag with a ferrule off the ground that he might climb up by the aid of the warty outgrowths to examine the crown and he had just stepped up into the space between the two limbs when the creaking of the iron gates was followed by a quick step in the avenue hastily he let himself down from the tree and gathering up his possessions stood close behind the great bowl just as well not to be seen was his reflection as he hugged the tree closely and waited peering cautiously round the trunk soon a streak of moving shadow heralded the stranger's approach and he moved round to keep the trunk between himself and the intruder on the footsteps came until the stranger was abreast of the tree and when he had passed pembry peeped round the retreating figure it was only the postman but then the man knew him and he was glad he had kept out of sight apparently the oak did not meet his requirements for he stepped out and looked up and down the avenue then beyond the elm he caught sight of an ancient pollard hornbeam a strange fantastic tree whose trunk widened out trumpet-like above into a broad crown from the edge of which multitudinous branches uprose like the limbs of some weird hamadryad that tree he approved at a glance but he lingered behind the oak until the postman returning with brisk step and cheerful whistle passed down the avenue and left him once more in solitude then he moved on with a resolute air to the hornbeam the crown of the trunk was barely six feet from the ground he could reach it easily as he found on trying 
standing the cane against the tree ferrule downwards this time he took the brush case from the bag pulled off the lid and with the crucible tongs lifted out the knife and laid it on the crown of the tree just out of sight leaving the tongs also invisible still grasping the knife he was about to replace the brush case in the bag when he appeared to alter his mind sniffing at it and finding it reeking with a sickly perfume he pushed the lid on again and threw the case up into the tree where he heard it roll down into the central hollow of the crown then he closed the bag and taking the cane by its handle moved slowly away in the direction whence he had come passing out of the avenue between the elm and the oak his mode of progress was certainly peculiar he walked with excessive slowness trailing the cane along the ground and every few paces he would stop and press the ferule firmly against the earth so that to any one who should have observed him he would have appeared to be wrapped in an absorbing reverie thus he moved on across the fields not however returning to the high road but crossing another stretch of fields until he emerged into a narrow lane that led out into the high street immediately opposite to the lane was the police station distinguished from the adjacent cottages only by its lamp its open door and the notices pasted up outside straight across the road pembury walked still trailing the cane and halting at the station door to read the notices resting his cane on the doorstep as he did so through the open doorway he could see a man writing at a desk the man's back was towards him but presently a movement brought his left hand into view and pembury noted that the forefinger was missing this then was jack ellis late of the civil guard at portland even while he was looking the man turned his head and pembury recognized him at once he had frequently met him on the road between baysford and the adjoining village of thorpe and always at the same time apparently ellis paid a daily visit to thorpe perhaps to receive a report from the rural constable and he started between three and four and returned between seven and a quarter past pembury looked at his watch it was a quarter past three he moved away thoughtfully holding his cane now by the middle and began to walk slowly in the direction of thorpe westward for a while he was deeply meditative and his face wore a puzzled frown then suddenly his face cleared and he strode forward at a brisker pace presently he passed through a gap in the hedge and walking in a field parallel with the road took out his purse a small pigskin pouch having frugally emptied it of its contents excepting a few shillings he thrust the ferrule of his cane into the small compartment ordinarily reserved for gold or notes and thus he continued to walk on slowly carrying the cane by the middle and the purse jammed on the end at length he reached a sharp double curve in the road whence he could see back for a considerable distance and here opposite a small opening he sat down to wait the hedge screened him effectually from the gaze of passers-by though these were few enough without interfering with his view a quarter of an hour passed he began to be uneasy had he been mistaken were ellis's visits only occasional instead of daily as he had thought that would be tiresome though not actually disastrous but at this point in his reflections a figure came into view advancing around the road with a steady swing he recognized the figure it was ellis but there was another figure advancing from the opposite direction a laborer apparently he prepared to shift his ground but another glance showed him that the laborer would pass first he waited the laborer came on and at length passed the opening and as he did so ellis disappeared for a moment in a bend of the road instantly pembury passed his cane through the opening in the hedge shook off the purse and pushed it into the middle of the footway then he crept forward behind the hedge towards the approaching official and again sat down to wait on came the steady tramp of the unconscious ellis and as it passed pembury drew aside an obstructing branch and peered out at the retreating figure the question now was would ellis see the purse it was not a very conspicuous object the footsteps stopped abruptly looking out pembury saw the police official stoop pick up the purse examine its contents and finally stow it in his trousers pocket pembury heaved a sigh of relief and as the dwindling figure passed out of sight round a curve in the road he rose stretched himself and strode away briskly near the gap was a group of ricks and as he passed them a fresh idea suggested itself looking round quickly he passed to the farther side of one and thrust his cane deeply into it pushed it home with a piece of stick that he picked up near the rick until the handle was lost among the straw the bag was now all that was left and it was empty for his other purchases were in the dressing bag which by the way he must fetch from the station he opened it and smelt the interior but though he could detect no odour he resolved to be rid of it if possible 
as he emerged from the gap a wagon jogged slowly past it was piled high with sacks and the tailboard was down stepping into the road he quickly overtook the wagon and having glanced round laid the bag lightly on the tailboard then he set off for the station on arriving home he went straight up to his bedroom and ringing for his housekeeper ordered a substantial meal then he took off his clothes and deposited them even to his shirt socks and necktie and trunk wherein his summer clothing was stored with a plentiful sprinkling of naphthol to preserve it from the moth taking the packet of permanganate of potash from his dressing bag he passed into the adjoining bathroom and tipping the crystals into the bath turned on the water soon the bath was filled with a pink solution of the salt and into this he plunged immersing his entire body and thoroughly soaking his hair then he emptied the bath and rinsed himself in clear water and having dried himself returned to the bedroom and dressed himself in fresh clothing finally he took a hearty meal and there lay down on the sofa to rest until it should be time to study for the rendezvous half past six found him lurking in the shadow by the station approach within sight of the solitary lamp he heard the train come in saw the stream of passengers emerge and noted one figure detach itself from the throng and turn on to the thorpe road it was pratt as the lamplight showed him pratt striding forward to the meeting-place with an air of jaunty satisfaction and an uncommonly creaky pair of boots pembury followed him at a safe distance and rather by sound than sight until he was well past the stile at the entrance to the footpath evidently he was going on to the gates then pembury vaulted over the stile and strode away swiftly across the dark meadows when he plunged into the deep gloom of the avenue his first act was to grope his way to the hornbeam and slip his hand up onto the ground and satisfy himself that the tongs were as he had left them reassured by the touch of his fingers on the iron loops he turned and walked slowly down the avenue the duplicate knife ready opened was in his left inside breast pocket and he fingered its handle as he walked presently the iron gate squeaked mournfully and then the rhythmical creak of a pair of boots was audible coming up the avenue pembury walked forward slowly until a darker smear emerged from the surrounding gloom when he called out is that you pratt that's me was the cheerful if ungrammatical response and as he drew nearer the ex warder asked have you brought the rhino old man the insolent familiarity of the man's tone was agreeable to pembury it strengthened his nerve and hardened his heart of course he replied but we must have a definite understanding you know look here said pratt i've got no time for jaw the general will be here presently he's riding over from bingfield with a friend you hand over the dibs and we'll talk some other time it is all very well said pembury but you must understand he paused abruptly and stood still they were now close to the hornbeam and as he stood he stared up into the dark mass of foliage what's the matter demanded pratt what are you staring at he too had halted and stood gazing intently into the darkness then in an instant pembury whipped out the knife and drove it with all his strength into the broad back of the ex-warder below the left shoulder blade with a hideous yell pratt turned and grappled with his assailant a powerful man and a competent wrestler too he was far more than a match for pembury unarmed and in a moment he had him by the throat but pembury clung to him tightly and as they trampled to and fro and round and round he stabbed again and again with the viciousness of a scorpion while pratt's cries grew more gurgling and husky then they fell heavily to the ground pembury underneath but the struggle was over with a last bubbling groan pratt relaxed his hold and in a moment grew limp and inert pembury pushed himself off and rose trembling and breathing heavily but he wasted no time there had been more noise than he had bargained for quickly stepping up to the hornbeam he reached up for the tongs his fingers slid into the looped handles the tongs grasped the knife and he lifted it out from its hiding place and carried it to where the corpse lay depositing it on the ground a few feet from the body then he went back to the tree and carefully pushed the tongs over into the hollow of the crown at this moment a woman's voice sounded shrilly from the top of the avenue is that you mr pratt it called pembury started and then stepped back quickly on tiptoe to the body for there was the duplicate knife he must take it away at all costs the corpse was lying on its back the knife was underneath it driven in to the very haft he had to use both hands to lift the body and even then he had some difficulty in disengaging the weapon and meanwhile the voice repeating its question drew nearer at length he succeeded in drawing out the knife and thrust it into his breast pocket the corpse fell back and he stood up gasping 
Mr. Pratt, are you there? The nearness of the voice startled Pembry, and turning sharply, he saw a light twinkling between the trees. And then the gates creaked loudly, and he heard the crunch of a horse's hoofs on the gravel. He stood for an instant bewildered, utterly taken by surprise. He had not reckoned on a horse. His intended flight across the meadows towards Thorpe was now impracticable. If he were overtaken, he was lost, for he knew there was blood on his clothes, and his hands were wet and slippery, to say nothing of the knife in his pocket. But his confusion lasted only for an instant. He remembered the oak tree, and, turning out of the avenue, he ran to it, and touching it as little as he could with his bloody hands, climbed quickly up into the crown. The great horizontal limb was nearly three feet in diameter, and as he lay out on it, gathering his coat closely round him, he was quite invisible from below. He had hardly settled himself when the light which he had seen came into full view, revealing a woman advancing with a stable lantern in her hand, and almost at the same moment a streak of brighter light burst from the opposite direction. The horseman was accompanied by a man on a bicycle. The two men came on a pace, and the horseman, sighting the woman, called out, "'Anything the matter, Mrs. Parton!' But at that moment the light of the bicycle lamp fell full on the prostrate corpse. The two men uttered a simultaneous cry of horror. The woman shrieked aloud, and then the horseman sprang from the saddle and ran forward to the body. Why, he exclaimed, stooping over it, it's, it's Pratt. And as the cyclist came up, and the glare of his lamp shone on the great pool of blood, he added, There's been foul play here, Anford. Anford flashed his lamp around the body, lighting up the ground for several yards. What's that behind you, O'Gorman? he said suddenly. Isn't a knife? He was moving quickly towards it when O'Gorman held up his hand. Don't touch it, he exclaimed, or put the hands onto it. I'll soon trap the scoundrel, whoever he is. By God, Anford, this fellow has fairly delivered himself into our hands. He stood for a few moments, looking down at the knife, with something uncommonly like exultation, and then, turning quickly to his friend, said, Look here, Anford, you ride off to the police station as hard as you can pelt. It's only three quarters of a mile, you can do it in five minutes. Send or bring an officer, and I'll scour the meadows meanwhile. If I haven't got the scandal when you come back, we'll put the hands into this knife and run the beggar down. Right, replied Hanford, and without another word he wheeled his machine about, mounted and rode away into the darkness. Mrs. Parton, said O'Gorman, watch that knife. See that nobody touches it while I go and examine the meadows. Is Mr. Pratt dead, sir? whimpered Mrs. Parton. Gad, I hadn't thought of that, said the general. You'd better have a look at him, but mind, nobody isn't to touch that knife or they'll confuse the scent. He scrambled into the saddle and galloped away across the meadows in the direction of Thorpe, and as Pembry listened to the diminuendo of the horse's hoofs, he was glad that he had not attempted to escape, for that was the direction in which he had meant to go, and he would surely have been overtaken. As soon as the general was gone, Mrs. Parton, with many a terror-stricken glance over her shoulder, approached the corpse and held the lantern close to the dead face. Suddenly she stood up, trembling violently, the footsteps were audible coming down the avenue. A familiar voice reassured her. "'Is anything wrong, Mrs. Parton?' The question proceeded from one of the maids who had come in search of the elder woman, escorted by a young man, and the pair now came out into the circle of light. "'Good God!' ejaculated the man. "'Who's that? It's Mr. Pratt,' replied Mrs. Parton. "'He's been murdered!' The girl screamed, and then the two domestics approached on tiptoe, staring at the corpse with a fascination of horror. "'Don't touch that knife!' said Mrs. Parton, for the man was about to pick it up. "'The general's going to put the bloodhounds onto it.' "'Is the general here, then?' asked the man, and as he spoke, the drumming of hooves, growing momentarily louder, answered him from the meadow. O'Gorman reined in his horse as he perceived the group of servants gathered about the corpse. "'Is he dead, Mrs. Parton?' he asked. "'I'm afraid so, sir,' was the reply. "'Somebody ought to go for the doctor, but not you, Bailey. I want you to get the hounds ready and wait for them at the top of the avenue till I call you.' He was off again into the Baysford Meadows, and Bailey hurried away, leaving the two women staring at the body and talking in whispers. Pembry's position was cramped and uncomfortable. He dared not move, hardly dared to breathe, for the women below him were not a dozen yards away, and it was with mingled feelings of relief and apprehension that he presently saw from his elevated station a group of lights approaching rapidly along the road from Baysford. Presently they were hidden by the trees, and then after a brief interval the whir of wheels sounded on the drive, and streaks of light on the tree trunks announced the new arrivals. There were three bicycles, ridden respectively by Mr. Hanford, a police inspector, and a sergeant, and as they drew up the general came thundering back into the avenue. "'Is Ellis with you?' he asked as he pulled up. "'No, sir,' was the reply. "'He hadn't come in from thought when he left. He's rather late tonight. Have you sent for a doctor?' "'Yes, sir, I've sent for Dr. Reels,' said the inspector, resting his bicycle against the oak. Pembry could smell the reek of the lamp as he crouched. Is Pratt dead? 
seems to be, replied O'Gorman. But we'd better leave that to the doctor. There's the murderer's knife. Nobody has touched it. I'm going to fetch the bloodhounds now. Oh, that's his thing, said the inspector. The man can't be far away. He rubbed his hands with a satisfied air as O'Gorman cantered away up the avenue. In less than a minute there came out from the darkness the deep baying of a hound, followed by quick footsteps on the gravel. Then into the circle of light emerged three sinister shapes, loose limbed and gaunt, and two men advancing at a shambling trot. You, Inspector, shouted the general, you take one. I can't hold em both. The inspector ran forward and seized one of the leashes, and the general led his hound up to the knife as it lay on the ground. Pembry, peering cautiously round the bow, watched the great brute with almost impersonal curiosity, noted its high pole, its wrinkled forehead, and melancholy face, as it stooped to snuff suspiciously at the prostrate knife. For some moments the hound stood motionless, sniffing at the knife. Then it turned away and walked to and fro with its muzzle to the ground. Suddenly it lifted its head, bayed loudly, lowered its muzzle, and started forward between the oak and the elm, dragging the general after it at a run. The inspector next brought his hound to the knife, and was soon bounding away to the tug of the leash in the general's wake. I don't make no mistakes, they don't, said Bailey, addressing the gratified sergeant as he brought forward the third hound. You'll see. But his remark was cut short by a violent jerk of the leash, and the next moment he was flying after the others, followed by Mr. Hanford. The sergeant daintily picked the knife up by its ring, wrapped it in his handkerchief, and bestowed it in his pocket. Then he ran off after the hounds. Pembry smiled grimly. His scheme was working out admirably, in spite of the unforeseen difficulties. If those confounded women would only go away, he could come down and take himself off while the course was clear. He listened to the baying of the hounds, gradually growing fainter in the increasing distance, and cursed the dilatoriness of the doctor. Confound the fellow! Didn't he realise that this was a case of life or death? Suddenly his ear caught the tinkle of a bicycle bell. A fresh light appeared coming up the avenue, and then a bicycle swept up swiftly to the scene of the tragedy, and a small elderly man jumped down by the side of the body. Giving his machine to Mrs. Parton, he stooped over the dead man, felt the wrist, pushed back an eyelid, held a match to the eye, and then rose. "'This is a shocking affair, Mrs. Parton,' said he. "'The poor fellow is quite dead. You had better help me to carry him to the house. If you two take the feet, I will take the shoulders.' Pembry watched them raise the body and stagger away with it up the avenue. He heard their shuffling steps die away, and the door of the house shut. And still he listened. And far away in the meadows came at intervals the baying of the hounds. Other sounds there was none. Presently the doctor would come back for his bicycle, but for the moment the coast was clear. Pembry rose stiffly. His hands had stuck to the tree, where they had pressed against it, and they were still sticky and damp. Quickly he let himself down to the ground, listened again for a moment, and then, making a small circuit to avoid the lamplight, softly crossed the avenue and stole away across the Thorpe Meadows. The night was intensely dark, and not a soul was stirring in the meadows. He strode forward quickly, peering into the darkness and stopping now and again to listen, but no sound came to his ears, save the now faint baying of the distant hounds. Not far from his house, he remembered, was a deep ditch, spanned by a wooden bridge, and towards this he now made his way, for he knew that his appearance was such as to convict him at a glance. Arrived at the ditch, he stooped to wash his hands and wrists, and as he bent forward, the knife fell from his breast pocket into the shallow water at the margin. He groped for it, and having found it, drove it deep into the mud as far out as he could reach. Then he wiped his hands on some water weed, crossed the bridge, and started homewards. He approached his house from the rear, satisfied himself that his housekeeper was in the kitchen, and, letting himself in very quietly with his key, went quickly up to his bedroom. Here he washed thoroughly, in the bath, so that he could get rid of the discoloured water, changed his clothes, and packed those that he took off in a portmanteau. By the time he had done this, the gong sounded for supper, as he took his seat at the table, spruce and fresh in appearance, quietly cheerful in manner, he addressed his housekeeper. "'I wasn't able to finish my business in London,' he said. "'I shall have to go up again to-morrow.' "'Shall you come home the same day?' asked the housekeeper. "'Perhaps,' was the reply, "'and perhaps not. It will depend on circumstances.' He did not say what the circumstances might be, nor did the housekeeper ask. Mr. Pembry was not addicted to confidences. He was an eminently discreet man, and discreet men say little. 
End of section three. Section four of The Singing Bone, or The Adventures of Dr. Thorndyke, by R. Austin Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Case of Premeditation, Part Two. Rival Sleuth Hounds. Related by Christopher Jervis, M.D. The half hour that follows breakfast, when the fire has, so to speak, got into its stride and the morning pike throws up its clouds of incense is perhaps the most agreeable in the whole day especially so when a sombre sky brooding over the town hints at streets pervaded by the chilly morning air and hoots from protesting tugs upon the river tell of lingering mists the legacy of the lately vanished night the autumn morning was raw the fire burned jovially i thrust my slippered feet towards the blaze and meditated on nothing in particular with cat-like enjoyment presently a deproving grunt from thorndyke attracted my attention and i looked round lazily he was extracting with a pair of office shears the readable portions of the morning paper and had paused with a small cutting between his finger and thumb bloodhounds again said he we shall be hearing presently of the revival of the ordeal by fire and a juiced comfortable ordeal too on a morning like this i said stroking my legs ecstatically what is the case he was about to reply when a sharp rat-tat from the little brass-knocker announced a disturber of our peace. Thorndyke stepped over to the door and admitted a police inspector in uniform, and I stood up and, presenting my dorsal aspect to the fire, prepared to combine bodily comfort with attention to business. "'I believe I am speaking to Dr. Thorndyke,' said the officer, and as Thorndyke nodded, he went on. "'My name, sir, is Fox, Inspector Fox of the Baseford Police. Perhaps you've seen the morning paper.' Thorndyke held up the cutting, and, placing a chair by the fire, asked the inspector if he had breakfasted. "'Thank you, sir, I have,' replied Inspector Fox. "'I came up to town by the late train last night, so as to be here early, and stayed at an hotel. You see from the paper that we've had to arrest one of our own men. It's rather awkward, you know, sir.' "'Very,' agreed Thorndyke. "'Yes, it's bad for the force, and bad for the public, too. But we had to do it. There was no way out at what we could see. Still, we should like the accused for every chance both for our sake and his own, so the chief constable thought he'd like to have your opinion on the case, and he thought that perhaps you might be willing to act for the defence. Let us have the particulars, said Thorndyke, taking a writing pad from a drawer and dropping into his armchair. Begin at the beginning, he added, and tell us all you know. Well, said the inspector, after a preliminary cough, to begin with the murdered man, his name is Pratt. He was a retired prison warder, and was employed as steward by General O'Gorman, who was a retired prison governor. You may have heard of him in connection with his pack of bloodhounds. Well, Pratt came down from London yesterday evening by a train arriving at Baseford at six thirty. He was seen by the guard, the ticket collector, and the outside porter. The porter saw him leave the station at six thirty seven. General O'Gorman's house is about half a mile from the station. At five minutes to seven, the general and a gentleman named Anford, and the general's housekeeper, and Mrs. Parton, found Pratt lying dead in the avenue that leads up to his house. He had apparently been stabbed, for there was a lot of blood about and a knife, a Norwegian knife, was lying on the ground near the body. Mrs. Parton thought she heard someone in the avenue calling out for help, and as Pratt was just due, he came out with a lantern. She met the general and Mr. Anford, and all three seemed to have caught sight of the body at the same moment. Mr. Anford cycled down to us at once with the news. We sent for a doctor, and went back with Mr. Anford, and took a sergeant with me. We arrived at twelve minutes past seven, and then the general, who had galloped his horse over the meadows each side of the avenue without having seen anybody, fetched out his bloodhounds and led them up to the knife. All three hounds took up the scent at once. I held the leash of one of them, and I took us across the meadows without a pause or a falter, over stiles and fences, along a lane, out into the town, and then, one after the other, they crossed the road and a bee-line to the police station, bolted in at the door, which stood open, and made straight for the desk, where a supernumerary officer named Ellis was writing. They made a rare to-do, struggling to get at him, and it was as much as we could manage to hold them back. As for Ellis, he turned as pale as a ghost. "'Who was anyone else in the room?' asked Thorndyke. "'Ah, oh, yes. There were two constables and a messenger. We led the hands up to them, but the brutes wouldn't take any notice of him. They wanted Ellis.' "'And what did you do?' "'While we arrested Ellis, of course. Couldn't do anything else, especially with the general there.' "'What had the general to do with it?' asked Thorndyke. "'He's a J.P., and a late governor of Daltmoor, and it was his hounds that had run the man down. But we must have arrested Ellis, in any case. "'Is there anything against the accused man?' "'Yes, there is. He and Pratt were on distinctly unfriendly terms. They were old comrades, for Ellis was in the Civil Guard at Portland when Pratt was warder there. 
he was pensioned off from the service because he'd got his left forefinger chopped off but lately they had some unpleasantness about a woman a parlour maid of the general's it seems that ellis who is a married man paid the girl too much attention or pratt thought he did and pratt warned ellis off the premises since then they had not been on speaking terms and what sort of a man is ellis a remarkably decent fellow he always seemed quiet steady good-natured i should have said he wouldn't hurt a fly we all liked him better than we liked pratt in fact poor pratt was what we call an old soldier sly you know sir a bit of a sneak you searched and examined ellis of course yes there was nothing suspicious about him except that he had two purses but he said he picked up one of them a small pigskin patch on the footpath of the thorpe road yesterday afternoon and there was no reason to disbelieve him at any rate the purse was not pratt's thorndyke made a note on his pad and then asked there were no bloodstains or marks on the clothing no his clothing was not marked or disarranged in any way any cuts scratches or bruises on his person none whatever replied the inspector at what time did you arrest ellis half past seven exactly have you ascertained what the movements were had he been near the scene of the murder yes he'd been to thorpe and would pass the gates of the avenue on his way back and he was later than usual in returning though not later than he has often been before and now as to the murdered man has the body been examined yes i had dr ill's report before i left there were no less than seven deep knife wounds all on the left side of the back there was a great deal of blood on the ground and dr ill's thinks pratt must have bled to death in a minute or two do the wounds correspond with the knife that was found i asked the doctor that and he said yes though he wasn't going to swear to any particular knife however that point is not of much importance the knife was covered with blood and it was found close to the body what has been done with it by the way asked thorndyke the sergeant who was with me picked it up and rolled it in his handkerchief to carry in his pocket i took it from him just as it was and locked it in a dispatch box has the knife been recognized as ellis's property no sir it hasn't were there any recognizable footprints or marks of a struggle thorndyke asked the inspector grinned sheepishly oh, i haven't examined the spot of course sir he said but after the general's horse and the bloodhounds and the general on foot and me and a gardener and the sergeant and mr anford had been over it twice going and returning why you see sir exactly exactly said thorndyke well inspector i shall be pleased to act for the defence it seems to me that the case against ellis is in some respects rather inconclusive the inspector was frankly amazed it certainly hadn't struck me in that light sir he said no well that is my view and i think the best plan will be for me to come down with you and investigate matters on the spot the inspector assented cheerfully and when we had provided him with the newspaper we withdrew to the laboratory to consult timetables and prepare for the expedition you are coming i suppose jervis said thorndyke if i shall be of any use i replied of course you will said he two heads are better than one and by the look of things i shall say that ours will be the only ones with any sense in them we will take the research case of course and we may as well have a camera with us i see there is a train from charing cross in twenty minutes for the first half of the journey thorndyke sat in his corner alternately conning over his notes and gazing with thoughtful eyes out of the window i could see that the case pleased him and was careful not to break in upon his train of thought presently however he put away his notes and began to fill his pipe with a more companionable air and then the inspector who had been wriggling with impatience opened fire so you think sir that you see a way out for ellis i think there is a case for the defence replied thorndyke in fact i call the evidence against him rather flimsy the inspector gasped but the knife sir what about the knife well said thorndyke what about the knife whose knife was it you don't know it was covered in blood whose blood you don't know let us assume for the sake of argument that it was the murderer's knife then the blood in it was pratt's blood but if it was pratt's blood when the hounds had smelt it they should have led you to pratt's body for blood gives you a very strong scent but they did not they ignored the body the inference seems to be that the blood on the knife was not pratt's blood the inspector took off his cap and gently scratched the back of his head you're perfectly right sir he said i never thought of that none of us had then pursued thorndyke let us assume that the knife was pratt's if so it would seem to have been used in self-defence but this was a norwegian knife a clumsy tool not a weapon at all which takes an appreciable time to open and requires the use of two free hands now had pratt both hands free certainly not after the attack had commenced there were seven wounds all on the left side of the back which indicates that he had held the murderer locked in his arms and that the murderer's arms were around him also incidentally that the murderer is right-handed but still let us assume that the knife was pratt's then the blood on it was that of the murderer 
then the murderer must have been wounded but ellis was not wounded then ellis is not the murderer the knife doesn't help us at all the inspector puffed out his cheeks and blew softly this is getting out of my depth he said still sir you can't get over the bloodhounds they tell us distinctly that the knife is ellis's knife i don't see any answer to that there is no answer because there has been no statement the bloodhounds have told you nothing you have drawn certain inferences from their actions but those inferences may be totally wrong and they are certainly not evidence you don't seem to have much opinion of bloodhounds the inspector remarked as agents for the detection of crime replied thorndyke i regard them as useless you cannot put a bloodhound in the witness-box you can get no intelligible statement from it if it possesses any knowledge it has no means of communicating it the fact is he continued that the entire system of using bloodhounds for criminal detection is based on a fallacy in the american plantations these animals were used with great success for tracking runaway slaves but the slave was a known individual all that was required was to ascertain his whereabouts that is not the problem that is presented in the detection of a crime the detective is not concerned in establishing the whereabouts of a known individual but in discovering the identity of an unknown individual and for this purpose bloodhounds are useless they may discover such identity but they cannot communicate their knowledge if the criminal is unknown they cannot identify him if he is known the police have no need of the bloodhound to return to our present case thorndyke resumed after a pause we have employed certain agents the hounds with whom we are not on rapport as the spiritualists would say and we have no medium the hound possesses a special sense the olfactory which in man is quite rudimentary he thinks so to speak in terms of smell and his thoughts are untranslatable to beings in whom the sense of smell is undeveloped we have presented to the hound a knife and he discovers in it certain odorous properties he discovers a similar or related odorous properties in a tract of land and a human individual ellis we cannot verify his discoveries or ascertain their nature what remains all that we can say is that there appears to exist some odorous relation between the knife and the man ellis but until we can ascertain the nature of that relation we cannot estimate its evidential value or bearing all the other evidence is the product of your imagination and that of the general there is at present no case against ellis he must have been pretty close to the place in the murder round said the inspector so probably were many other people answered thorndyke but had he time to wash and change because he would have needed it I suppose he would the inspector agreed dubiously undoubtedly there were seven wounds which would have taken some time to inflict now we can't suppose that pratt stood passively while the other man stabbed him indeed as i have said the position of the wounds shows that he did not there was a struggle the two men were locked together one of the murderer's hands was against pratt's back probably both hands were one clasping and the other stabbing there must have been blood on one hand and probably on both but you say there was no blood on ellis and there doesn't seem to have been time or opportunity for him to wash well it's a mysterious affair said the inspector but i don't see how you're going to get over the bloodhounds thorndyke shrugged his shoulders impatiently the bloodhounds are an obsession he said the whole problem really centres around the knife the questions are whose knife was it and what was the connection between it and ellis there is a problem jervis he continued turning to me that i submit for your consideration some of the possible solutions are exceedingly curious as we set out from baysford station thorndyke looked at his watch and he noted the time you will take us the way that pratt went he said as to that said the inspector he may have gone by the road or by the footpath but there's very little difference in the distance turning away from baysford we walked along the road westward towards the village of thorpe and presently passed on our right a stile at the entrance to a footpath that path said the inspector crosses the avenue about halfway up but we'd better keep to the road a quarter of a mile further on we came to a pair of rusty iron gates one of which stood open and entering we found ourselves in a broad drive bordered by two rows of trees between the trunks of which a long stretch of pasture meadows could be seen on either hand it was a fine avenue and late in the year as it was the yellowing foliage clustered thickly overhead when we had walked about a hundred and fifty yards from the gates the inspector halted this is the place he said and thorndyke again noted the time nine minutes exactly said he then pratt arrived here about fourteen minutes to seven and his body was found at five minutes to seven nine minutes after his arrival 
The murderer couldn't have been far away then. Now, nah, it's a pretty fresh scent, replied the inspector. You'd like to see the body first? I think you said, sir. Yes, and the knife, if you please. I shall have to send down to the station for that. It's locked up in the office. He entered the house, and having dispatched a messenger to the police station, came out and conducted us to the outbuilding where the corpse had been deposited. Thorndyke made a rapid examination of the wounds and the holes in the clothing, neither of which presented anything particularly suggestive. The weapon used has evidently been a thick-backed, single-edged knife, similar to the one described, and the discoloration around the wounds indicated that the weapon had a definite shoulder, like that of a Norwegian knife, and that it had been driven in with savage violence. "'Did you find anything that throws any light on the case?' the inspector asked, when the examination was concluded. "'That is impossible to say until we have seen the knife,' replied Thorndyke. "'But while we are waiting for it, we may as well go and look at the scene of the tragedy. These are Pratt's boots, I think.' He lifted a pair of stout laced boots from the table, and turned them up to inspect the soles. "'Yes, those are his boots,' replied Fox. "'And pretty easy they'd been to the track if the case had been the other way about. Those Blakey's protectors are as good as a trademark.' "'We'll take them at any rate,' said Thorndyke, and the inspector, having taken the boots from him, we went out and retraced our steps down the avenue. The place where the murder had occurred was easily identified by a large dark stain on the gravel at one side of the drive, halfway between two trees, an ancient pollard hornbeam and an elm. Next to the elm was a pollard oak, with a squat, warty hole about seven feet high, and three enormous limbs, of which one slanted halfway across the avenue, and between these two trees the ground was covered with the tracks of men and hounds superimposed upon the hoofprints of a horse. "'Where was the knife found?' Thorndyke asked. The inspector indicated a spot near the middle of the drive, almost opposite the hornbeam, and Thorndyke, picking up a large stone, laid it on the spot. Then he surveyed the scene thoughtfully, looking up and down the drive, and at the trees that bordered it, and finally walked slowly to the space between the elm and the oak, scanning the ground as he went. "'There is no dearth of footprints,' he remarked grimly, as he looked down at the trampled earth. "'No, but the question is, whose are they?' said the inspector. "'Yes, that is the question,' agreed Thorndyke, "'and we will begin the solution by identifying those of Pratt.' "'I don't see how that will help us,' said the inspector. "'We know he was here.' Thorndyke looked at him in surprise, and I must confess that the foolish remark astonished me too, accustomed as I was to the quick-witted officers from Scotland Yard. The hue and cry procession, remarked Thorndyke, seems to have passed out between the elm and the oak. Elsewhere the ground seems pretty clear. He walked round the elm, still looking earnestly at the ground, and presently continued. Now here, in the soft earth bordering the turf, are the prints of a pair of smallish feet wearing pointed boots, and of a short man, evidently, by the size of foot and length of stride, and he doesn't seem to have belonged to the procession. But I don't see any of Pratt's. He doesn't seem to have come off the hard gravel. He continued to walk slowly towards the hornbeam, with his eyes fixed on the ground. Suddenly he halted, and stooped with an eager look at the earth, and as Fox and I approached it, he stood up and pointed. Pratt's footprints! Faint and fragmentary, but unmistakable! And now, Inspector, you see the importance. They furnish the time factor in respect of the other footprints. Look at this one, and then look at that. He pointed from one to another of the faint impressions of the dead man's feet. You mean that there are signs of a struggle? said Fox. I mean more than that, replied Thorndyke. Here is one of Pratt's footprints treading into the print of a small pointed foot, and there at the edge of the gravel is another of Pratt's, nearly obliterated by the tread of a pointed foot. Obviously the first pointed footprint was made before Pratt's, and the second one after his, and the necessary inference is that the owner of the pointed foot was here at the same time as Pratt. Then he must have been the murderer, exclaimed Fox. Presumably, answered Thorndyke. But let us see whither he went. You notice in the first place that the man stood close to this tree, he indicated the hornbeam, and that he went towards the elm. Let us follow him. He passes the elm, you see, and you will observe that these tracks from a regular series leading from the hornbeam are not mixed up with the marks of the struggle. They were, therefore, probably made after the murder had been perpetrated. You will also notice that they pass along the backs of the trees, outside the avenue, that is. What does that suggest to you? It suggests to me, I said, when the inspector had shaken his head hopelessly, that there was possibly someone in the avenue when the man was stealing off. Precisely, said Thorndyke. The body was found more than nine minutes after Pratt arrived here, but the murder must have taken some time. 
Then the housekeeper thought she heard someone calling and came up with a lantern, and at the same time the general and Mr. Hanford came up the drive. The suggestion is that the man sneaked along outside the trees to avoid being seen. However, let us follow the tracks. They pass the elm, and they pass on behind the next tree. But wait, there is something odd here. He passed behind the great pollard oak, and looked down at the soft earth by its roots. Here is a pair of impressions much deeper than the rest, and they are not a part of the track since their toes point towards the tree. What do you make of that? Without waiting for an answer, he began closely to scan the bowl of the tree, and especially a large warty protuberance about three feet from the ground. On the bark above this was a vertical mark, as if something had scraped down the tree, and from the wart itself a dead twig had been newly broken off and lay upon the ground. Pointing to these marks, Thorndyke set his foot on the protuberance, and, springing up, brought his eye above the level of the crown, whence the great boughs branched off. Ah! he exclaimed. Here's something much more definite. With the aid of another projection, he scrambled up onto the crown of the tree, and having glanced quickly round, beckoned to us. I stepped up on the projecting lump, and as my eyes rose above the crown, I perceived the brown, shiny impression of a hand on the edge. Climbing into the crown, I was quickly followed by the inspector, and we both stood up by Thorndyke between the three boughs. From where we stood, we looked on the upper side of the great limb that swept out across the avenue, and there, on its lichen-covered surface, we saw the imprints in reddish-brown of a pair of open hands. "'You notice,' said Thorndyke, leaning out upon the bough, "'that he is a short man. I cannot conveniently place my hands so low. You also note that he has both forefingers intact, and so is certainly not Ellis.' "'If you mean to say, sir, that these marks were made by the murderer,' said Fox, "'I say it's impossible.' Why, that would mean that he was here looking down at us when we were searching for him with the hounds. The presence of the hounds proves that this man could not have been the murderer. On the contrary, said Thorndyke, the presence of this man with bloody hands confirms the other evidence, which all indicates that the hounds were never on the murderer's trail at all. Come now, Inspector, I put it to you. Here is a murdered man. The murderer has almost certainly blood upon his hands and here is a man with bloody hands lurking in a tree within a few feet of the corpse and within a few minutes of its discovery as is shown by the footprints what are the reasonable probabilities but you are forgetting the bloodhound sir and the murderer's knife urged the inspector tut tut man exclaimed thorndyke those bloodhounds are a positive obsession but i see a sergeant coming up the drive with a knife i hope perhaps that will solve the riddle for us the sergeant, who carried a small dispatch-box, halted opposite the tree in some surprise while we descended, when he came forward with a military salute, and handed the box to the inspector, who forthwith unlocked it, and opening the lid, displayed an object wrapped in a pocket-handkerchief. "'This is a knife, sir,' said he, "'just as I received it. The handkerchief is a sergeant's.' Thorndyke unrolled the handkerchief, and took from it a large-sized Norwegian knife, which he looked at critically, and then handed to me. While I was inspecting the blade, he shook out the handkerchief, and, having looked it over on both sides, turned to the sergeant. "'At what time did you pick up this knife?' he asked. "'About seven-fifteen, sir, directly after the hounds had started. I was careful to pick it up by the ring, and I wrapped it in the handkerchief at once.' Seven-fifteen, said Thorndyke. "'Less than half an hour after the murder. That is very singular. You observe the state of this handkerchief. There is not a mark on it.' not a trace of any bloodstain which proves that when the knife was picked up the blood on it was already dry but things dry slowly if they are dry at all in the saturated air of an autumn evening the appearances seem to suggest that the blood on the knife was dry when it was thrown down by the way sergeant what do you scent your handkerchief with scent sir exclaimed the astonished officer in indignant accents me scent me handkerchief no sir certainly not "'Never used scent in my life, sir.' Thorndyke held out the handkerchief, and the sergeant sniffed at it incredulously. "'It certainly does seem to smell of scent,' he admitted. "'But it must be the knife.' The same idea having occurred to me, I applied the handle of the knife to my nose, and instantly detected a sickly sweet odour of musk. The "'Question is,' said the inspector, when the two articles had been tested by us all, "'was it the knife that scented the handkerchief, or the handkerchief that scented the knife?' "'You heard what the sergeant said.' replied Thorndyke. There was no scent on the handkerchief when the knife was wrapped in it. Do you know, Inspector, this scent seems to me to offer a very curious suggestion. Consider the facts of the case. The distinct 
trail leading straight to ellis who is nevertheless found to be without a scratch or a spot of blood the inconsistencies in the case that i pointed out in the train and now this knife apparently dropped with dried blood in it and scented with musk to me it suggests a carefully planned coolly premeditated crime the murderer knew about the general's bloodhounds and made use of them as a blind he planted this knife smeared with blood and tainted with musk to furnish a scent no doubt some object also scented with musk would be drawn over the ground to give the trail it is only a suggestion of course but it is worth considering but sir the inspector objected eagerly if the murderer had handled the knife it would have scented him too exactly so as we are assuming that the man is not a fool we may assume that he did not handle it he will have left it here in readiness hidden in some place whence he could knock it down say with a stick without touching it perhaps in this very tree sir suggested the sergeant pointing to the oak no said thorndyke he would hardly have hidden in the tree where the knife had been the hounds might have scented the place instead of following the trail at once the most likely hiding place for the knife is the one nearest the spot where it was found he walked over to the stone that marked the spot and looked round continued you see that hornbeam is much the nearest and its flat crown will be very convenient for the purpose easily reached even by a short man as he appears to be let us see if there are any traces of it perhaps you will give me a back-up sergeant as we haven't a ladder the sergeant assented with a faint grin and snooping beside the tree in an attitude suggesting the game of leapfrog placed his hands firmly on his knees grasping a stout branch thorndyke swung himself up on the sergeant's broad back whence he looked down into the crown of the tree then parting the branches he stepped on to the ledge and disappeared into the central hollow when he reappeared he held in his hands two very singular objects a pair of iron crucible tongs and an artist's brush case of black japanned tin the former article he handed down to me but the brush case he held carefully by its wire handle as he dropped to the ground the significance of these things is i think obvious he said the tongs were used to handle the knife with and the case to carry it in so that it should not scent his clothes or bag it was very carefully planned if that is so said the inspector the inside of the case ought to smell a musk no doubt said thorndyke but before we open it there is a rather important matter to be attended to will you give me the vitogen powder jervis i opened the canvas covered research case and took from it an object like a diminutive pepper caster an iodoform dredger in fact and handed it to him grasping the brush case by its wire handle he sprinkled the pale yellow powder from the dredger freely all round the pull-off lid tapping the top with his knuckles to make the fine particles spread then he blew off the superfluous powder and the two police officers gave a simultaneous gasp of joy for now on the black background there stood out plainly a number of fingerprints so clear and distinct that the ridge pattern could be made out with perfect ease these will probably be his right hand said thorndyke now for the left he treated the body of the case in the same way and when he had blown off the powder the entire surface was spotted with yellow oval impressions now jervis said he if you'll put on a glove and pull off the lid we can test the inside there was no difficulty in getting the lid off for the shoulder of the case had been smeared with vaseline apparently to produce an air-tight joint and as it separated with a hollow sound a faint musky odour exhaled from its interior the remainder of the inquiry said thorndyke when i pushed the lid on again will be best conducted at the police station where also we can photograph these fingerprints the shortest way will be across the meadows said fox the way the hounds went by this route we accordingly travelled thorndyke carrying the brush case tenderly by its handle i don't see where ellis comes in in his job said the inspector as we walked along if the fellow had a grudge against pratt they weren't chums i think i do said thorndyke you say that both men were prison officers at portland at the same time now doesn't it seem likely that this is the work of some old convict who had been identified and perhaps blackmailed by pratt and possibly by ellis too that is where the value of the fingerprints comes in if he is an old lag his prints will be at scotland yard otherwise they are not of much value as a clue that's true sir said the inspector i suppose you want to see ellis i want to see that purse that you spoke of first replied thorndyke that is probably the other end of the clue as soon as we arrived at the station the inspector unlocked a safe and brought out a parcel these are ellis's things said he as he unfastened it and that is the purse he handed thorndyke a small pigskin pouch which my colleague opened and having smelt the inside passed to me the odour of musk was plainly perceptible especially in the small compartment at the back it has probably tainted the other contents of the parcel said thorndyke sniffing at each article in turn 
but my sense of smell is not keen enough to detect any scent. They all seem odourless to me, whereas the purse smells quite distinctly. Shall we have Ellis in now? The sergeant took a key from a locked drawer, and departed for the cells, whence he presently reappeared, accompanied by the prisoner, a stout burly man, in the last stage of dejection. "'Come, cheer up, Ellis,' said the inspector. "'It is Dr. Thorndyke, come down to help us, and he wants to ask you one or two questions.' Ellis looked piteously at Thorndyke and exclaimed, "'I know nothing whatever about the affair, sir. I swear to God I don't.' "'I never supposed you did,' said Thorndyke. "'But there are one or two things that I want you to tell me. To begin with, that purse, where did you find it?' "'On the thought road, sir. It was lying in the middle of the footway.' "'Had anyone else passed the spot lately? Did you meet or pass anyone?' "'Yes, sir. I met a labourer about a minute before I saw the purse. I can't imagine why he didn't see it.' probably because it wasn't there said thorndyke is there a hedge there yes sir a hedge on the low bank ha ah, well now tell me is there any one about here whom you know when you and pratt were together at portland any old lack to put it bluntly whom you and pratt have been putting the screw on no sir i swear there isn't but I wouldn't answer for pratt he had a rare memory for faces thorndyke reflected were there any escapes from portland in your time he asked only one a man named dobbs he made off to the sea in a sudden fog, and he was supposed to be drowned. His clothes washed up in a bill, but not his body. Anyway, he was never heard of again. Thank you, Ellis. Do you mind my taking your fingerprints? Only not, sir, was the almost eager reply, and the office inking pad being requisitioned, a rough set of fingerprints was produced, and when Thorndyke had compared them with those in the brush case, had found no resemblance, Ellis returned to his cell in quite buoyant spirits. Having made several photographs of the strange fingerprints, we returned to town that evening, taking the negatives with us, and while we waited for our train, Thorndyke gave a few parting injunctions to the inspector. Remember, he said, that the man must have washed his hands before he could appear in public. Search the banks of every pond, ditch, and stream in the neighbourhood for footprints like those in the avenue, and if you find any, search the bottom of the water thoroughly, for he is quite likely to have dropped the knife into the mud photographs which we handed in at scotland yard that same night enabled the experts to identify the fingerprints as those of francis dobbs an escaped convict the two photographs profile and full face which were attached to his record were sent down to baseford with a description of the man and were in due course identified with a somewhat mysterious individual who passed by the name of rufus pembury and who had lived in the neighbourhood as a private gentleman for some two years but rufus pembury was not to be found either at his genteel house or elsewhere all that was known was that on the day after the murder he had converted his entire personality into bearer securities and then vanished from mortal ken nor has he ever been found or heard of to this day in between ourselves said thorndyke when we were discussing the case some time after he deserved to escape it was clearly a case of blackmail and to kill a blackmailer when you have no other defence against him is hardly murder as to ellis he could never have been convicted and dobbs or pembry must have known it for he would have been committed to the assizes and that would have given time for all traces to disappear no dobbs was a man of courage ingenuity and resource and above all he knocked the bottom out of the great bloodhound superstition end of section four section five of the singing bone or the adventures of dr thorndyke by r austin freeman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Echo of a Mutiny. Part 1. Death on the Girdler. Popular belief ascribes to infants and the lower animals certain occult powers of divining character denied to the reasoning faculties of the human adult, and is apt to accept their judgment as finally overriding the pronouncements of mere experience. Whether this belief rests upon any foundation other than the universal love of paradox, it is unnecessary to inquire. It is very generally entertained, especially by ladies of a certain social status, and by Mrs. Thomas Solly it was loyally maintained as an article of faith. Yes, she moralised, it's surprising how they know the little children and the dumb animals, but they do. There's no deceiving them. You can tell the gold from the dross in a moment, they can, and they reads the human heart like a book. Wonderful, I call it. I suppose it's instinct. Having delivered herself, of this priceless gem of philosophic thought she thrust her arms elbow deep into the foaming wash-top and glanced admiringly at her lodger as he sat 
in the doorway, supporting on one knee an obese infant of eighteen months, and on the other a fine tabby cat. James Brown was an elderly seafaring man, small and slight in build, and in manner suave, insinuating, and perhaps a trifle sly, but he had all the sailor's love of children and animals, and the sailor's knack of making himself acceptable to them, for, as he sat with an empty pipe wobbling in the grasp of his toothless gums, the baby beamed with humid smiles, and the cat rolled into a fluffy ball, and purring like a stocking loom, worked its fingers ecstatically, as if it were trying on a new pair of gloves. "'It must be more lonely out at the lighthouse,' Mrs. Solly resumed. "'Only three men, and never a neighbour to speak to, and, Lord, what a muddle they must be in with no women in to look after em and keep em tidy. But you won't be overworked, Mr. Brown, in these long days, daylight till past nine o'clock. I don't know what you'll do to pass the time.' "'Oh, I shall find plenty to do, I expect,' said Brown, "'what with cleaning the lamps and glasses and painting up the ironwork. And it reminds me, he added, looking round at the clock, that time's getting on, high water at half past ten, and here it's gone eight o'clock. Mrs. Solly, acting on the hint, began rapidly to fish out the washed garments and wring them out into the form of short ropes. Then, having dried her hands on her apron, she relieved Brown of the protesting baby. Your room will be ready for you, Mr. Brown, said she, when your turn comes for a spell ashore, and man glad me and Tom will be to see you back. "'Thank you, Mrs. Sally, ma'am,' answered Brown, tenderly, placing the cat on the floor. "'You won't be more glad than what I will.' He shook hands warmly with his landlady, kissed the baby, chucked the cat under the chin, and, picking up his little chest by his basket, swung it onto his shoulder and strode out of the cottage. His way lay across the marshes, and, like the ships in the offing, he shaped his course by the twin towers of Reculver that stood up grotesquely on the rim of the land, and as he trod the springy turf, Tom Solly's fleecy charges looked up at him, with vacant stares and valedictory bleatings. Once, at a dyke gate, he paused to look back at the fair Kentish landscape, at the grey tower of St. Nicholas at Wade, peeping above the trees, and the faraway mill at Saar, whirling slowly in the summer breeze, and above all, at the solitary cottage where, for a brief spell in his stormy life, he had known the homely joys of domesticity and peace. Well, that was over for the present, and the lighthouse loomed ahead. With a half-sigh he passed through the gate and walked on towards Reculver. Outside the whitewashed cottages with their official black chimneys, a petty officer of the Coast Guard was adjusting the halyards of the flagstaff. He looked round as Brown approached and hailed them cheerily. "'Here you are, Vint,' said he. "'All figged out on your new togs, too. But we're in a bit of difficulty, do you see? We've got to pull up to Whitstable this morning, so I can't send a man out of you, and I can't spare a boat.' "'Have I got to swim out, then?' asked Brown. The Coast Guard grinned. "'Not in them new clothes, mate.' he answered. No, but there's old Willet's boat. He isn't using her today. He's going over to Minster to see his daughter, and he'll let us have the loan of the boat. But there's no one to go with you, and I'm responsible to Willet. Well, what about it? asked Brown with the deep-sea sailor's usually misplaced confidence in his power to handle a sailing boat. You think I can't manage a tub of a boat? Me what's used to the sea since I was a kid of ten. Yes, said the Coast Guard, but who's to bring her back? Why, the man I'm going to relieve, answered Brown. He don't want to swim no more than what I do. The Coast Guard reflected, with his telescope pointed at a passing barge. Well, I suppose it'll be all right, he concluded. But it's a pity they couldn't send the tender round. However, if you undertake to send the boat back, we'll get her afloat. It's time you're off. He strolled away to the back of the cottages, whence he presently returned with two of his mates, and the four men proceeded along the shore to where Willet's boat lay just above high water mark. The Emily was a beamy craft of the type locally known as half share skiff, solidly built of oak with varnished planking, and fitted with main and mizzen lugs. She was a good handful for four men, and as she slid over the soft chalk rocks with a hollow rumble, the coast guards debated the advisability of lifting out the bags of shingle with which she was ballasted. However, she was at length dragged down, ballast and all, to the water's edge, and then while Brown stepped the mainmast, the petty officer gave him his directions. "'What you've got to do,' said he, "'is to make use of the flood tide. Keep her nose nor east, and with this trickler nor westerly breeze, you ought to make the lighthouse in one board. Anyway, don't let her get east of the lighthouse, or when the ebb sets in you'll be in a fix. To these admonitions Brown listened with jaunty indifference as he hoisted the sails and watched the incoming tide creep over the level shore. Then the boat lifted on the gentle swell. Putting out an oar, he gave a vigorous shove off that sent the boat onto its pintles. He seated himself and calmly belayed the main sheet. There he goes, growled the coast guard, making fast his sheet. They will do it. He invariably did it himself, and that's how accidents happen. I hope old Willet will see his boat back all right. 
He stood for some time watching the dwindling boat as it sidled across the smooth water. Then he turned and followed his mates towards the station. Out on the southwestern edge of the girdler sand, just inside the two-fathom line, the spindle-shanked lighthouse stood a straddle on its long screw piles like some uncouth red-bodied wading bird. It was now nearly half flood tide. The highest shoals were long since covered, and the lighthouse rose above the smooth sea, as solitary as a slaver becalmed in the middle passage. In the gallery outside the lantern were two men, the entire staff of the building, of whom one sat huddled in a chair with his left leg propped up with pillows on another, while his companion rested a telescope on the rail and peered at the faint grey line of the distant land and the two tiny points that marked the twin spires of Reculver. "'Don't see any signs of the boat, Harry,' said he. The other man groaned. "'I shall lose the tide,' he complained. "'But then there's another day gone.' "'They can pull you down to Birchington and put you in the train,' said the first man. "'Don't want no trains,' growled the invalid. "'The boat will be bad enough. I suppose there's nothing coming our way, Tom.' Tom turned his face eastward and shaded his eyes. "'There's a brig coming across the tide from the north,' he said. "'Looks like a collier.' He pointed his telescope at the approaching vessel and added, "'She's got two new cloths in her upper foretop sail, one on each leech.' The other man sat up eagerly. "'What's her trysail like, Tom?' he asked. "'Can't see it,' replied Tom. "'Yes, I can now. It's tanned. Why, that'll be the old utopia. Harry, she's the only brig I know who's got a tanned trysail.' "'Look here, Tom,' exclaimed the other. "'If that's the utopia, she's going to my home, and I'm going aboard of her. Captain Mockett will give me a passage, I know.' "'You oughtn't to go until you're relieved, you know, Barnet,' said Tom doubtfully. "'It's against regulations to leave your station.' "'Regulations be blowed!' exclaimed Barnet. "'My leg's more to me than the regulations. I don't want to be a cripple all my life. Besides, I'm no good here, and this new chap Brown will be coming out presently. You run up the signal, Tom, like a good comrade now the brig.' Oh, it's your lookout, said Tom. Well, I don't mind saying that if I was in your place, I should cut off home and see a doctor if I get the chance. He sauntered off to the flag locker, and selecting the two code flags, deliberately toggled them onto the halyards. Then, as the brig swept up within range, he hoisted the little balls of bunting to the flagstaff head and jerked the halyards when the two flags blew out, making the signal need assistance. Promptly, a coal soiled answering pennant soared to the brig's main truck. Less promptly, the collier went about and turning her nose downstream, slowly drifted stern forwards towards the lighthouse. Then a boat slid out through her gangway, and a couple of men plied the oars vigorously. "'Lighthouse, Roy!' roared one of them as the boat came within hail. "'What's amiss?' "'Harry Barnet has broken his leg,' shouted the lighthouse keeper, "'and he wants to know if Captain Mockett will give him passage to Whitstable.' The boat turned back to the brig, and after a brief and bellowed consultation once more pulled towards the lighthouse. "'Skipper says yes,' roared the sailor when he was within earshot. And he says, look alive, because he, he don't want to miss his tide. The injured man heaved a sigh of relief. That's good news, said he. Though out of the blazes, I'm going to get down the ladder in more than I can tell. What do you say, Jeffries? I well, say so you better let me lower you with tackle. You can sit in the bite of a rope and I'll give you a line to steady yourself with. Oh, I'll do, Tom, said Barnet. But for the Lord's sake, pay out the full rope gently. The arrangements were made so quickly that by the time the boat was fast alongside, everything was in readiness. And a minute later, the injured man dangling like a gigantic spider from the end of the tackle slowly descended cursing volubly to the accompaniment of the creaking of the blocks his chest and kit bag followed and as soon as these were unhooked from the tackle the boat pulled off to the brig which was now slowly creeping stern foremost past the lighthouse the sick man was hoisted up the side his chest handed up after him and then the brig was put on her course due south across the kentish flats geoffrey stood on the gallery watching the receding vessel and listening to the voices of her crew as they grew small and weak in the increasing distance. Now that his gruff companion was gone, a strange loneliness had fallen on the lighthouse. The last of the homeward-bound ships had long since passed up the Prince's Channel, and left the calm sea desolate and blank. The distant buoys, showing as tiny black dots on the glassy surface, and the spindly shapes of the beacons which stood up from invisible shoals, but emphasised the solitude of the empty sea, and the tolling of the bell buoy on the shivering sand, stealing faintly down the wind, sounded weird and mournful. The day's work was already done. The lenses were polished, the lamps had been trimmed, and the little motor that worked the foghorn had been cleaned and oiled. There were several odd jobs, it is true, waiting to be done, as there always are in a lighthouse, but just now Jeffreys was not in a working humour. A new comrade was coming into his life to-day, a stranger with whom he was to be shut up alone, night and day, for a month on end, and whose temper and tastes and habits might mean for him pleasant companionship, or jangling and discord without end. Who was this man Brown? What had he been? 
What was he like? These were the questions that passed, naturally enough, through the lighthouse keeper's mind and distracted him from his usual thoughts and occupations. Presently a speck on the landward horizon caught his eye. He snatched up the telescope eagerly to inspect it. Yes, it was a boat, but not the coast guard's cutter for which he was looking. Evidently a fisherman's boat and with only one man in it. He laid down the telescope with a sigh of disappointment and, filling his pipe, leaned on the rail with the dreary eye bent on the faint grey line of the land. Three long years had he spent in this dreary solitude, so repugnant to his active, restless nature. Three blank, interminable years, with nothing to look back on but the endless succession of summer calms, stormy nights, and the chilly fogs of winter, when the unease steamers hooted from the void, and the foghorn bellowed its hoarse warning. Why had he come to this godforsaken spot, and why did he stay when the wide world called to him? And then memory painted him a picture on which his mind's eye had often looked before, and which once again arose before him, shutting out the vision of the calm sea and the distant land. It was a brightly coloured picture. It showed a cloudless sky, brooding over the deep blue tropic sea, and in the middle of the picture, seesawing gently on the quiet swell, a white-painted bark. Her sails were clawed up untidily, her swinging yards jerked at the slack braces, and her untended wheel revolved to and fro to the oscillations of the rudder. She was not a derelict, for more than a dozen men were on her deck, but the men were all drunk, and mostly asleep, and there was never an officer among them. Then he saw the interior of one of her cabins, the chart-rack, the tell-tale compass, and the chronometers marked it as the captain's cabin. In it were four men, and two of them lay dead on the deck, while of the other two one was a small, cunning-faced man who was at the moment kneeling beside one of the corpses to wipe a knife upon its coat. The fourth man was himself. Again he saw the two murderers stealing off in a quarter-boat as the bark with her drunken crew drifted towards the spouting surf of a river bar. He saw the ship melt away in the surf like an icicle in the sunshine, and later two shipwrecked mariners picked up in an open boat and set ashore at an American port. That was why he was here, because he was a murderer. The other scoundrel, Amos Todd, had turned Queen's evidence and denounced him, and he had barely managed to escape. Since then he had hidden himself from the great world, and here he must continue to hide, not from the law, for his person was unknown now that his shipmates were dead, but from the partner of his crime. It was the fear of Todd that had changed him from Geoffrey Rourke to Tom Jeffreys, and had sent him to the girdler, a prisoner for life. Todd might die, might even now be dead, but he would never hear of it, would never hear the news of his release. He roused himself, and once more pointed his telescope at the distant boat. She was considerably nearer now, and seemed to be heading out towards the lighthouse. Perhaps the man in her was bringing a message. At any rate, there was no sign of the coast guard's cutter. He went in, and betaking himself to the kitchen, busied himself with a few simple preparations for dinner. But there was nothing to cook, for there remained the cold meat from yesterday's cooking, which he could make sufficient with some biscuit in place of potatoes. He felt restless and unstrung. The solitude irked him, and the everlasting wash of the water among the piles jarred on his nerves. When he went out again into the gallery, the ebb tide had set in strongly, and the boat was little more than a mile distant, and now through the glass he could see that the man in her wore the uniform cap of the Trinity House. Then the man must be his future comrade, Brown. But this was very extraordinary. What were they to do with the boat? There was no one to take her back. The breeze was dying away. As he watched the boat, he saw the man lower the sail, and take to his oars, and something of hurry in the way the man pulled over the gathering tide caused Jeffreys to look round the horizon. And then for the first time he noticed a bank of fog creeping up from the east, and already so near that the beacon on the east girdler had faded out of sight. He hastened in to start the little motor that compressed the air for the foghorn, and waited a while to see that the mechanism was running properly. Then as the deck vibrated to the roar of the horn, he went out once more into the gallery. The fog was now all round the lighthouse, and the boat was hidden from view. He listened intently. The enclosing wall of vapour seemed to have shut out sound as well as vision. At intervals the horn bellowed its note of warning, and then all was still, save the murmur of the water among the piles below, and infinitely faint and far away, the mournful tolling of the bell on the shivering sand. At length there came to his ear the muffled sound of oars working in the tholes then the very edge of the circle of grey water that was visible. The boat appeared through the fog, pale and spectral, with a shadowy figure pulling furiously. 
The horn emitted a hoarse growl. The man looked round, perceived the lighthouse, and altered his course towards it. Jeffreys descended the iron stairway, and walking along the lower gallery, stood at the head of the ladder, earnestly watching the approaching stranger. Already he was tired of being alone. The yearning for human companionship had been growing ever since Barnet left. But what sort of comrade was this stranger who was coming into his life, and coming to occupy so dominant a place in it? The boat swept down swiftly athwart the hurrying tide. Nearer it came, and yet nearer, and still Jeffreys could catch no glimpse of his new comrade's face. At length it came fairly alongside, and bumped against the fender-posts. The stranger whisked in an oar, and grabbed the rung of the ladder, and Jeffreys dropped a coil of rope into the boat. And still the man's face was hidden. Jeffreys leaned out over the ladder, and watched him anxiously, as he made fast the rope, unhooked the sail from the traveller, and unstepped the mast. When he had set all in order, the stranger picked up a small chest, and, swinging it over his shoulder, stepped onto the ladder. Slowly, by reason of his encumbrance, he mounted, rung by rung, with never an upward glance, and Jeffreys gazed down at the top of his head with growing curiosity. At last he reached the top of the ladder, and Jeffreys stooped to lend him a hand. Then for the first time he looked up, and Jeffreys started back with a blanched face. "'God Almighty!' he gasped. It's Amos Todd. As the newcomer stepped on the gallery, the foghorn emitted a roar like that of some hungry monster. Jeffreys turned abruptly without a word and walked to the stairs, followed by Todd. The two men ascended with never a sound but the hollow clank of their footsteps on the iron plates. Silently, Jeffreys stalked into the living room, and as his companion followed, he turned and motioned to the latter to set down his chest. "'You ain't much of a talker, mate,' said Todd, looking round the room in some surprise. "'Ain't you going to say good morning? We're going to be good comrades, I hope. I'm Jim Brown, the new hand I am. What might your name be?' Jeffreys turned on him suddenly and led him to the window. "'Look at me carefully, Amos Todd,' he said sternly, "'and then ask yourself what my name is.' At the sound of his voice, Todd looked up with a start and turned pale as death. "'It can't be,' he whispered. "'It can't be Jeff Rook.' The other man laughed harshly and leaned forward, said in a low voice, "'Hast thou found me, O mine enemy?' "'Don't say that,' exclaimed Todd. "'Don't call me your enemy, Jeff. Lord knows, but I'm glad to see you. I've never known you without your beard and with that grey hair. I've been to blame, Jeff, and I know it. But it ain't no use raking up old grudges. Let bygones be bygones, Jeff, and let us be pals as we used to be.' He wiped his face with his handkerchief, and watched his companion apprehensively. "'Sit down,' said Rourke, pointing to a shabby, rep-covered armchair. "'Sit down and tell me what you've done with all that money. "'You blewed it all. I suppose you wouldn't be here.' "'Robbed, Jeff,' answered Todd. "'Robbed of every penny. "'Oh, that was an unfortunate affair, that job on board the old sea flower. "'But it's over and done with, and we'd best forget it. "'They're all dead but us, Jeff, so we're safe enough, "'so long as we keep our mouths shut, all at the bottom of the sea, "'and the best place for em too.' "'Yes,' Rourke replied fiercely. That's the best place for your shipmates when they know too much. At the bottom of the sea, or swinging at the end of a rope. He paced up and down the little room with rapid strides, and each time that he approached Todd's chair, the latter shrank back with an expression of alarm. Don't sit there staring at me, said Rourke. Why don't you smoke or do something? Todd hastily produced a pipe from his pocket, and having filled it from a moleskin pouch, stuck it in his mouth while he searched for a match. Apparently he carried his matches loose in his pocket, for he presently brought one forth, a red-headed match, which, when he struck it on the wall, lighted with a pale blue flame. He applied it to his pipe, sucking in his cheeks, while he kept his eyes fixed on his companion. Walk, meanwhile, halted in his walk to cut some shavings from a cake of hard tobacco with a large clasp-knife, and as he stood he gazed with frowning abstraction at Todd. "'The pipe stopped,' said the latter sucking ineffectually at the mouthpiece. "'Have you got such a thing as a piece of wire, Jeff?' "'No, I haven't,' replied Rourke. "'Not up here. I'll get a bit from the store presently. Here, take this pipe till you can clean your own. I've got another in the rack there.' The sailor's natural hospitality, overcoming for a moment, his animosity. He thrust the pipe that he just filled towards Todd, who took it with a mumbled, "'Thank you,' and an anxious eye on the open knife. On the wall beside the chair was a roughly carved pipe rack containing several pipes, one of which Rock lifted out, and as he leaned over the chair to reach it, Todd's face went several shades paler. "'Well, Jeff,' he said after a pause, while Rourke cut a fresh fill of tobacco, 
Are we going to be pals, same as what we used to be? Rourke's animosity lighted up afresh. Am I going to be pals with the man that tried to swear away my life? He said sternly, and after a pause he added, That wants thinking about, that does, and meantime I must go and look at the engine. When Rourke had gone, the new hand sat, with the two pipes in his hands, reflecting deeply. Abstractly, he struck the fresh pipe into his mouth, and, dropping the stopped one into the rack, felt for a match. Still with an air of abstraction, he lit the pipe, and having smoked for a minute or two, rose from the chair, and began softly to creep across the room, looking about him and listening intently. At the door he paused to look out into the fog, and then, having again listened attentively, he stepped on tiptoe out onto the gallery, and along towards the stairway. Of a sudden the voice of Rourke brought him up with a start. "'Hello, Todd! Where are you off to?' "'I'm just going down to make the boat secure,' was the reply. "'Never you mind about the boat,' said Rourke. "'I'll see to her.' "'Right-o, Jeff,' said Todd, still edging towards the stairway. "'But I say, mate, where's the other man, the man that I'm to relieve?' "'There ain't any other man,' replied Rourke. "'He went off aboard a collier.' Todd's face suddenly became grey and haggard. "'And there's no one here but us two, he gasped. And then, with an effort to conceal his fear, he asked, "'But he's going to take the boat back?' "'We'll see about that presently,' replied Rourke. "'You get along in and unpack your chest.' He came out on the gallery as he spoke, with a lowering frown on his face. Todd cast a terrified glance at him, and then turned and ran for his life towards the stairway. "'Come back!' roared Rourke, springing forward along the gallery. But Todd's feet were already clattering down the iron steps. By the time Rourke reached the head of the stairs, the fugitive was near the bottom, but here in his haste he stumbled, barely saving himself from the handrail and when he recovered his balance, Rourke was upon him. Todd darted to the head of the ladder, but as he grasped the stanchion, his pursuer seized him by the collar. In a moment he had turned with his hand under his coat. There was a quick blow, a loud curse from Rourke, an answering yell from Todd, and a knife fell spinning through the air and dropped into the forepeak of the boat below. "'You murderous little devil!' said Rourke in an ominously quiet voice, with his bleeding hand gripping his captive by the throat. And you with your knife as ever, eh? So you were off to give information, were you? Uh, I wasn't, Jeff, replied Todd in a choking voice. I wasn't, sell me, God. Let go, Jeff. Don't mean a while, but I was only... With a sudden wrench, he freed one hand and struck out frantically at his captor's face. But Walk warded off the blow, and grasping the other wrist, gave a violent push and let go. Todd staggered backward a few paces along the staging, bringing up at the extreme edge, and here for a sensible time, he stood with wide-open mouth and starting eyeballs, swaying and clutching wildly at the air. Then with a shrill scream he toppled backwards and fell, striking a pile in his descent and rebounding into the water. In spite of the audible thump of his head on the pile, he was not stunned, for when he rose to the surface he struck out vigorously, uttering short, stifled cries for help. Rourke watched him with set teeth and quickened breath, but made no move. Smaller and still smaller grew the head with its little circle of ripples swept away on the swift ebb tide, and fainter the bubbling cries that came across the smooth water. At length, as the small black spot began to fade in the fog, the drowning man, with a final effort, raised his head clear of the surface and sent a last despairing shriek towards the lighthouse. The foghorn sent back an answering bellow. The head sank below the surface and was seen no more and in the dreadful stillness that settled down upon the sea there sounded faint and far away the muffled tolling of a bell. Rourke stood for some minutes immovable, wrapped in thought. Presently the distant hoot of a steamer's whistle aroused him. The ebb-tide shipping was beginning to come down, and the fog might lift at any moment, and there was the boat still alongside. He must be disposed of at once. No one had seen her arrive, and no one must see her made fast to the lighthouse. Once get rid of the boat, and all traces of Todd's visit would be destroyed. He ran down the ladder, and stepped into the boat. It was simple. She was heavily ballasted, and would go down if she filled. He shifted some of the bags of shingle, and lifting the bottom boards, pulled out the plug. Instantly a large jet of water spouted up into the bottom. Wark looked at it critically, and, deciding that he would fill her in a few minutes, replaced the bottom boards, and having secured the mast and sail with a few turns of the sheet round a thwart, to prevent them from floating away, he cast off the mooring rope and stepped on the ladder. As the released boat began to move away on the tide, he ran up and mounted to the upper gallery to watch her disappearance. Suddenly he remembered Todd's chest. 
it was still in the room below with a hurried glance around into the fog he ran down to the room and snatching up the chest carried it out on the lower gallery after another nervous glance around to assure himself that no craft was in sight he heaved the chest over the handrail and when it fell with a loud splash into the sea he waited to watch it float away after its owner and the sunken boat but it never rose and presently he returned to the upper gallery the fog was thinning perceptibly now and the boat remained plainly visible as she drifted away but she sank more slowly than he had expected and presently as she drifted farther away he fetched the telescope and peered at her with growing anxiety it would be unfortunate if any one saw her if she should be picked up here with her plug out it would be disastrous he was beginning to be really alarmed through the glass he could see that the boat was now rolling in a sluggish waterlogged fashion but she still showed some inches of freeboard and the fog was thinning every moment presently the blast of a steamer's whistle sounded close at hand he looked round hurriedly and seeing nothing again pointed the telescope eagerly at the dwindling boat suddenly he gave a gasp of relief the boat had rolled gunwale under had staggered back for a moment and then rolled again slowly finally with the water pouring in over the submerged gunwale in a few more seconds she had vanished Rourke lowered the telescope and took a heavy breath now he was safe the boat had sunk unseen but he was better than safe he was free his evil spirit the standing menace of his life was gone and the wide world the world of life of action of pleasure called to him in a few minutes the fog lifted the sun shone brightly on the red funnelled cattle boat whose whistle had startled him just now the summer blue came back to sky and sea and the land peeped once more over the edge of the horizon he went in whistling cheerfully and stopped the motor returned to coil away the rope that he had thrown to todd and when he had hoisted a signal for assistance he went in once more to eat his solitary meal in peace and gladness End of section five. Section six of The Singing Bone or the Adventures of Dr. Thorndyke by R. Austin Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two The Singing Bone related by Christopher Jervis, M. D. To every kind of scientific work a certain amount of manual labour naturally appertains, labour that cannot be performed by the scientist himself, since art is long but life is short. A chemical analysis involves a laborious clean up of apparatus and laboratory for which the chemist has no time the preparation of a skeleton maceration bleaching assembling the riveting together of bones must be carried out by someone whose time is not too precious and so with other scientific activities behind the man of science with his outfit of knowledge is the indispensable mechanic with his outfit of manual skill thorndyke's laboratory assistant porton was a fine example of the latter type deft resourceful ingenious and untiring he was somewhat of an inventive genius too and it was one of his inventions that connected us with this singular case that I am about to record. Though by trade a watchmaker, Poulton was by choice an optician. Optical apparatus was the passion of his life, and when one day he produced for our inspection an improved prism for increasing the efficiency of Gasperies, Thorndyke at once brought the invention to the notice of a friend at the Trinity House. As a consequence, we three, Thorndyke, Poulton, and I, found ourselves early on a fine July morning, making our way down Middle Temple Lane, bound for the Temple Pier. A small oil launch lay alongside the pontoon, and as we made our appearance, a red-faced, white-whiskered gentleman stood up in the cockpit. "'Here's a delightful morning, doctor,' he sang out in a fine, brassy, resonant, seafaring voice. "'Sort of day for a trip to the Lower River, eh? Hello, Poulton. Coming down to take the bread out of our mouths, are you? Ha ha the cheery laugh rang out over the river and mingled with the throb of the engine as the launch moved off from the pier captain grumpus was one of the elder brethren of the trinity house formerly a client of thorndyke's he had subsided as thorndyke's clients were apt to do into the position of a personal friend and his hearty regard included our invaluable assistant nice state of things continued the captain with a chuckle when a body of nautical experts have got to be taught their business by a parcel of lawyers or doctors what i suppose trade slack and satan findeth mischief still eh Porton? there isn't much doing on the civil side sir replied Porton with a quaint crinkly smile but the criminals are still going strong ha mystery department still flourishing what and by jove talking of mysteries doctor our people have got a queer problem to work out something quite in your line quite 
yes and by the lord moses since i've got you here why shouldn't i suck your brains exactly said thorndyke why shouldn't you well then i will said the captain so here goes all hands to the pump he lit a cigar and after a few preliminary puffs began the mystery shortly stated is this one of our lighthouse men has disappeared vanished off the face of the earth and left no trace he may have bolted he may have been drowned accidentally or he may have been murdered but i rather gave the particulars in order at the end of last week a barge brought into ramsgate a letter from the screw piles lighthouse on the girdler there were only two men there and it seems that one of them a man named barnet had broken his leg and he asked that the tender should be sent to bring him ashore well it happened that the local tender the warden was up in the slip in ramsgate arbour taking a scrape down and wouldn't be available for a day or two so as the case was urgent the officer at ramsgate sent a letter to the lighthouse by one of the pleasure steamers saying that the man should be relieved by boat on the following morning which was saturday he also wrote to a new hand who had just been taken on a man named james brown who was lodging near reeculver waiting his turn telling him to go out on saturday morning in the coast guard's boat and he sent a third letter to the coast guard at reeculver asking him to take brown out to the lighthouse and bring barnet ashore well between them they made a fine model of it the coast guard couldn't spare either a boat or a man so they borrowed a fisherman's boat and in this the man brown started off alone like an idiot on the chance that barnet would be able to sail the boat back in spite of his broken leg meanwhile barnet who was a whitstable man had signalled a collier bound for his native town and got taken off so that the other keeper thomas jeffreys was left alone until brown should turn up but brown never did turn up the coast guard helped him to put off and saw him well out to sea and the keeper jeffreys saw a sailing boat with one man in her making for the lighthouse then a bank of fog came up and hit the boat and when the fog cleared she was nowhere to be seen man and boat had vanished and left no sign he may have been run down thorndyke suggested he may agreed the captain but no accident has been reported the coast guards think he may have capsized in a squall they saw him make the seat fast but there weren't any squalls the weather was quite calm was he all right and well when he put off inquired thorndyke yes replied the captain the coast guard's report is highly circumstantial in fact it's full of silly details that have no bearing on anything this is what they say he pulled out an official letter and read when last seen a missing man was seated in the boat's stern to windward of the helm he had belayed the sheet he was holding a pipe and tobacco pouch in his hands and steering with his elbow he was filling the pipe from the tobacco pouch there he was holding a pipe in his hand mark you not with his toes and he was filling it from a tobacco pouch whereas you'd have expected him to fill it from a coal scuttle or a feeding bottle bah the captain rammed the letter back in his pocket and puffed scornfully at his cigar you are hardly fair to the coast guard said thorndyke laughing at the captain's vehemence the duty of a witness is to give all the facts not a judicious selection but my dear sir said captain grumpus what the deuce can it matter what poor devil filled his pipe from you can say answered thorndyke it may turn out to be a highly material fact one never knows beforehand the value of a particular fact depends on its relation to the rest of the evidence I suppose it does grunted the captain and he continued to smoke in reflective silence until he opened blackwell point when he suddenly stood up there's a steam trawler alongside our wharf he announced and what the deuce can we should be doing there he scanned the little steamer attentively and continued there seemed to be landing something too just pass me those glasses Polton. why hang me it's a dead body but why on earth are they landing it on our wharf they must have known you were coming doctor as the launch swept alongside the wharf the captain sprung up lightly and approached the group gathered round the body what's this he asked why have they brought this thing here the master of the trawler who had superintended the landing proceeded to explain it's one of your men sir said he we saw the body lying on the edge of south shingle sand close to the beacon as we passed at low water so he put off the boat and fetched it aboard as there was nothing to identify the man by i had a look in his pockets and found this letter he handed the captain an official envelope addressed to mr j brown c o mr solly shepherd reculver kent why this is the man we were speaking about doctor exclaimed captain grumpus what a very singular coincidence but what are we to do with the body you will have to write to the coroner replied thorndyke by the way did you turn out all the pockets he asked turning to the skipper of the trawler no nah, sir was the reply i found the letter on the first pocket i felt in so i didn't examine any of the others is there anything more that you want to know sir nothing but your name and address for the coroner replied thorndyke and the skipper having given this information and expressed the hope that the coroner would not keep him hanging about returned to his vessel and pursued his way to billingsgate 
I wonder if you would mind having a look at the body of this poor devil, while Poulton is showing us his contraptions, said Captain Grumpus. I can't do much without a coroner's order, replied Thorndyke, but if it will give you any satisfaction, Jervis and I will make preliminary inspection with pleasure. I should be glad if you would, said the captain. We should like to know that the poor beggar met his end fairly. The body was accordingly moved to a shed, and as Poulton was led away, carrying the black bag that contained his precious model, we entered the shed and commenced our investigation. The deceased was a small elderly man, decently dressed in a somewhat nautical fashion. He appeared to have been dead only two or three days, and the body, unlike the majority of sea-borne corpses, was uninjured by fish or crabs. There were no fractured bones or other gross injuries, and no wounds, excepting a rugged tear in the scalp at the back of the head. The general appearance of the body, said Thorndyke, when he had noted these particulars, suggests death by drowning, though of course we can't give a definite opinion until a post-mortem has been made. You don't attach any significance to that scalp wound, then, I asked. As a cause of death? No, it was obviously inflicted during life, but it seems to have been an oblique blow that spent its force on the scalp, leaving the skull uninjured. But it is very significant in another way. In what way? I asked. Thorndyke took out his pocket-case and extracted a pair of forceps. "'Consider the circumstances,' said he. "'This man put off from the shore to go to the lighthouse, but never arrived there. The question is, where did he arrive?' As he spoke, he stooped over the corpse and turned back the hair round the wound with the beak of the forceps. "'Look at those white objects among the hair, Jervis, and inside the wound. They tell us something, I think.' I examined, through my lens, the chalky fragments to which he pointed. These seem to be bits of shells in the tubes of some marine worm, I said. Yes, he answered. The broken shells are evidently those of the acorn barnacle, and the other fragments mostly pieces of the tubes of the common circular. The inference that these objects suggest is an important one. It is that this wound was produced by some body, encrusted by acorn barnacles and serpuli, that is to say by a body that is periodically submerged. Now, what can that body be, and how can the deceased have knocked his head against it? Oh, it might be the stem of a ship that ran him down, I suggested. I don't think you would find many serpulae on the stern of a ship, said Thorndyke. The combination rather suggests some stationary object between tide marks, such as a beacon. But one doesn't see how a man could knock his head against a beacon, while, on the other hand, there are no stationary objects out in the estuary to knock against except boys, and a boy presents a flat surface that could hardly have produced this wound. By the way, we may as well see what there is in his pockets, though it is not likely that robbery had anything to do with his death. No, I agreed, and I see his watch is in his pocket. Quite a good silver one, I added, taking it out. It has stopped at twelve-thirteen. That may be important, said Thorndyke, making a note of the fact. We had better examine the pockets one at a time, and put the things back when we have looked at them. The first pocket that we turned out was the left hip pocket of the monkey jacket. This was apparently the one that the skipper had rifled. We found it in two letters, both bearing the crest of the Trinity House. These, of course, we returned without reading, and then passed on to the right pocket. The contents of this were commonplace enough, consisting of a briar pipe, a moleskin pouch, and a number of loose matches. Rather a casual proceeding, this, I remarked, to carry matches loose in the pocket and a pipe with them, too. Yes, agreed Thorndyke, especially with these very inflammable matches. You notice that the sticks had been coated at the upper end with sulphur before the red phosphorus heads were put on. They would light with a touch, and would be very difficult to extinguish, which no doubt is the reason that this type of match is so popular among seamen, who have to light their pipes in all sorts of weather. As he spoke, he picked up the pipe, and looked at it reflectively turning it over in his hand and peering into the bowl. Suddenly he glanced from the pipe to the dead man's face, and then with the forceps turned back the lips to look into the mouth. "'Let us see what tobacco he smokes,' said he. I opened the sodden pouch and displayed a mass of dark, fine-cut tobacco. "'It looks like shag,' I said. "'Yes, it is shag,' he replied. "'And now we will see what is in the pipe. It has been only half smoked out.' He dug out the dottle with his pocket-knife onto a sheet of paper, and we both inspected it. Clearly it was not shag, for it consisted of coarsely cut shreds, and was nearly black. Shavings uh, from a cake of hard was my verdict, and Thorndyke agreed as he shot the fragments back into the pipe. The other pockets yielded nothing of interest, except a pocket-knife which Thorndyke opened and examined closely. There was not much money, though as much as one would expect, and enough to exclude the idea of robbery. 
is there a sheath knife on that strap thorndyke asked pointing to a narrow leather belt i turned back the jacket and looked there is a sheath i said but no knife it must have dropped out that is rather odd said thorndyke a sailor's sheath knife takes a deal of shaking out as a rule it is intended to be used in working on the rigging when the man is aloft so that he can get it with one hand while he is holding on with the other it has to be and usually is very secure for the sheath holds half the handle as well as the blade what makes one notice of the matter in this case is that the man as you see carried a pocket knife and as this would serve all the ordinary purposes of a knife it seems to suggest that the sheath knife was carried for defensive purposes as a weapon in fact however we can't get much further in the case without a post-mortem and here comes the captain captain grumpus entered the shirt and looked down commiseratingly at the dead seaman is there anything dark here that throws any light on the man's disappearance he asked there are one or two curious features in the case thorndyke replied but oddly enough the only really important point arises out of the statement of the coast guards concerning which you are so scornful you don't say so exclaimed the captain yes said thorndyke the coast guard states that when last seen deceased was filling his pipe from his tobacco pouch now his pouch contains shag but the pipe in his pocket contains hard cut is there no cake tobacco in any of the pockets what a fragment of course it is possible that he might have had a piece and used it up to fill the pipe but there is no trace of any on the blade of his pocket knife and as you know how this juicy black cake stains the knife blade his sheath knife is missing but he would hardly have used that to shred tobacco when he had a pocket knife no assented the captain but you sure he hadn't a second pipe there was only one pipe replied thorndyke and that was not his own not his own exclaimed the captain halting by a huge chequered buoy to stare at my colleague how do you know it was not his own by the appearance of the vulcanite mouthpiece said thorndyke it showed deep teeth marks in fact nearly bitten through now a man who bites through his pipe usually presents certain definite physical peculiarities among which is necessarily a fairly good set of teeth but the dead man had not a tooth in his head the captain cogitated a while and then remarked I don't quite see the bearing of this don't you said thorndyke it seems to me highly suggestive here was a man who when last seen was filling his pipe with a particular kind of tobacco he is picked up dead and his pipe contains a totally different kind of tobacco where did that tobacco come from the obvious suggestion is that he met someone yes it does look like it agreed the captain then continued thorndyke there is the fact that his sheath knife is missing that may mean nothing but we have to bear it in mind and there is another curious circumstance there is a wound on the back of the head caused by a heavy bump against some body that was covered with acorn barnacles and marine worms now there are no piers or stages out in the open estuary the question is what could he have struck oh there's nothing in that said the captain when a body has been washing about in a tideway for close on three days but it is not a question of a body thorndyke interrupted the wound was made during life the deuce it was exclaimed the captain well all i can suggest is that he must have fouled one of the beacons in the fog stove in his boat and bumped his head though i must admit that's rather a lame explanation he stood for a minute gazing at his toes with a cognitive frown and then looked up at thorndyke i have an idea he said from what you say this matter wants looking into pretty carefully now i'm going down on the tender to-day to make inquiries on the spot why do you say to coming with me as adviser as a matter of business of course you went up to jervis i shall start about eleven we shall be at the lighthouse by three o'clock and you can get back to the town to-night if you want to what do you see there's nothing to hinder us i put in eagerly for even at bugsby's hole the river looked very alluring on this summer morning very well said thorndyke we will come jervis is evidently hankering for a sea trip and so am i for that matter it's a business engagement you know the captain stipulated nothing of the kind said thorndyke it's unmitigated pleasure the pleasure of the voyage and your high well-born society i didn't mean that grumbled the captain but if you are coming as guests send your man for your night gear and let us bring you back to-morrow evening we won't disturb polton said my colleague we can take the train from blackwall and fetch our things ourselves eleven o'clock you said thereabouts said captain grumpus but don't put yourselves out the means of communication in london have reached an almost undesirable state of perfection with the aid of the snorting train and the tinkling two-wheeled gondola we crossed and recrossed the town with such celerity that it's barely eleven when we appeared on trinity wharf 
with a joint gladstone thorndyke little green case the tender had hauled out of bow creek and now lay alongside the wharf with a great striped can buoy dangling from her derrick and captain grumpus stood at the gangway his jolly red face beaming with pleasure the buoy is safely stowed forward the derrick hauled up to the mast the loose shrouds rehooked to the screw lanyards and the steamer with four jubilant hoots swung round and shoved her sharp nose against the incoming tide for near upon four hours the ever-widening stream of the london river unfolded its moving panorama the smoke and smell of willage reach gave place to lucid air made soft by the summer haze the grey huddle of factories fell away and green levels of kettle-spotted marsh stretched away to the highland bordering the river valley venerable training ships displayed their chequered hulls by the wooded shore and whispered of the days of oak and hemp when the tall three-decker comely and majestic with her soaring heights of canvas like towers of ivory had not yet given place to the mud-coloured saucepans that fly the white ensign nowadays and devour the substance of the british taxpayer when a sailor was a sailor and not a mere seafaring mechanic sturdily breasting the flood-tide the tender threaded her way through the endless procession of shipping barges billy-boys schooners brigs lumpish black seamen blue funnelled china tramps rickety baltic barks with twirling windmills gigantic liners staggering under a mountain of top hamper erith perfeet greenhithe greys greeted us and passed astern the chimneys of northfleet the clustering roofs of gravesend the populous anchorage and the lurking batteries were left behind and as we swung out of the lower hope the wide expanse of sea reach spread out before us like a great sheet of blue shot satin at about half past twelve the ebb overtook us and helped us on our way as we could see by the speed with which the distant land slid past and the freshening of the air as we passed through it but sky and sea were hushed in a summer calm balls of fleecy cloud hung aloft motionless in the soft blue the barges drifted on the tide with drooping sails and a big striped bell-buoy surmounted by a staff and cage and labelled shivering sand sat dreaming in the sun above its motionless reflection to rouse for a moment as it met our wash nod its cage drowsily utter a solemn ding-dong and fall asleep again it was shortly after passing the buoy that the gaunt shape of a screw-pile lighthouse began to loom up ahead its dull red paint turned to vermilion by the early afternoon sun as we drew nearer the name girdler painted in huge white letters became visible and two men could be seen in the gallery around the lantern inspecting us through a telescope shall you be looking at the lighthouse sir the master of the tender inquired of captain grumpus cause we're going down to the northeast pan stand to fix this new boy and take up the old one then you'd better put us off at the lighthouse and come back for us when you finish the job was the reply i don't know how long we shall be the tender was brought to a boat lowered and a couple of hands pulled us across the intervening space of water it will be a dirty climb for you in your shore-going clothes the captain remarked he was as spruce as a new pin himself but the stuff will all wipe off we looked up at the skeleton shape the falling tide had exposed some fifteen feet of the piles and piles and ladder alike were swathed in sea-grass and encrusted with barnacles and worm-tubes but we were not such town sparrows as the captain seemed to think for we both followed his lead without difficulty up the slippery ladder thorndyke clinging tenaciously to his little green case from which he refused to be separated even for an instant these gentlemen and i said the captain as we stepped on the stage at the head of the ladder have come to make inquiries about the missing man james brown which of you is jeffreys i am sir replied a tall powerful square-jawed beetle-browed man whose left hand was tied up in a rough bandage what have you been doing to your hand asked the captain i cut it while i was peeling some potatoes was the reply it isn't much of a cut sir well jeffreys said the captain brown's body has been picked up and i want particulars for the inquest you'll be summoned as a witness i suppose so come in and tell us all you know we entered the living-room and seated ourselves at the table the captain opened a massive pocket-book while thorndyke in his attentive inquisitive fashion looked about the odd cabin-like room as if making a mental inventory of its contents Geoffrey's statement added nothing to what we already knew he had seen a boat with one man in it making for the lighthouse then the fog had drifted up and he had lost sight of the boat he started the foghorn and kept a bright lookout but the boat never arrived and that was all he knew he supposed that the man must have missed the lighthouse 
had been carried away on the ebb tide, which was running strongly at the time. "'What time was it when you last saw the boat?' Thorndyke asked. "'About half-past eleven, replied Jeffreys. "'What was the man like?' asked the captain. "'I know, sir. He was rowing, and his back was towards me.' "'Had any kit bear got chest with him?' asked Thorndyke. "'He got his chest with him,' said Jeffreys. "'What sort of chest was it?' inquired Thorndyke. "'A small chest, painted green with rock beckets. "'Was it corded? It had a single cord round to hold the lid down. "'Where was it stored? In the stern sheet, sir. "'How far off was the boat when you last saw it? "'About half a mile.' "'Half a mile?' exclaimed the captain. "'Why, how the deuce could you see that chest half a mile away?' The man reddened and cast a look of angry suspicion at Thorndyke. "'I was watching the boat through the glass, sir,' he replied sulkily. "'I see,' said Captain Grumpus. "'Well, that will do, Jeffreys. We shall have to arrange for you to attend the inquest. Tell Smith I want to see him.' The examination concluded, Thorndyke and I moved our chairs to the window, which looked out over the sea to the east. But it was not the sea or the passing ships that engaged my colleague's attention. On the wall beside the window hung a rudely carved pipe-rack, containing five pipes. Thorndyke had noted it when we entered the room, and now as we talked I observed him regarding it from time to time with speculative interest. "'You men seem to be inveterate smokers,' he remarked to the keeper, Smith, when the captain had concluded the arrangements for the shift. "'Well, we do like a bit of baccy, sir, and that's a fact,' answered Smith. "'You see, sir,' he continued, "'it's a lonely life, and tobacco's cheap out here.' "'How is that?' asked Thorndyke. Why, we get it given to us, small craft from foreign lands, especially Dutchmen. They only leave us a cake or two when they pass close. We're not sure, you see, so there's no duty to pay. So you don't trouble the tobacconists much? Don't go in for cut tobacco? No, sir, we'd have to buy it, and then the cut stuff wouldn't keep. Now it's hard tack to eat out here, and hard tobacco to smoke. I see you've got a pipe rack, too. Quite a stylish affair. Yes, said Smith. Made it my off-time, keeps the place tidy, and looks more ship-shaped than letting the pipes lay about anyway. Someone seems to have neglected his pipe, said Thorndyke, pointing to one at the end of the rack, which was coated with green mildew. Yeah, that's Parsons, my mate. He must have left it when he went off near a month ago. Pipes do go mouldy in the damp air out here. How soon does a pipe go mouldy if it is left untouched? Thorndyke asked. It's according to the weather, said Smith. When it's warm and damp, I begin to go in about a week. Now is Barnet's pipe that he's left behind. The man that broke his leg, you know, sir. It's just beginning to spot a little. He couldn't have used it for a day or two before he went. And all these other pipes yours? No, sir, this one here is mine. The end one is Jeffrey's. I suppose the middle one is his too, but I don't know it. You're a demon for pipes, doctor, said the captain, strolling up at this moment. You seem to make quite a special study of them. Proper study of mankind is man replied Thorndyke, as the keeper retired. And man includes those objects on which his personality is impressed. Now a pipe is a very personal thing. Look at that row in the rack. Each has its own physiognomy, which in a measure reflects the peculiarities of the owner. There is Jeffrey's pipe at the end, for instance. The mouthpiece is nearly bitten through, the bowl scraped to a shell, and scored inside, and the brim battered and chipped. The whole thing speaks of rude strength and rough handling. He chews the stem as he smokes, he scrapes the bowl violently, and he bangs the ashes out with unnecessary force. And the man fits the pipe exactly, powerful, square-jawed, and, I should say, violent on occasion. Yes, he looks a tough customer, does Jeffreys, agreed the captain. Then, continued Thorndyke, there is Smith's pipe next to it, coked up until the cavity is nearly filled, and burnt all round the edge, a talker's pipe, constantly going out and being relit. But the one that interests me most is the middle one. Didn't Smith say that was Jeffrey's too? I said. Yes, replied Thorndyke. But he must be mistaken. It is the very opposite of Jeffrey's pipe in every respect. To begin with, although it is an old pipe, there is not a sign of any tooth mark on the mouthpiece. It is the only one in the rack that is quite unmarked. Then the brim is quite uninjured. It has been handled gently. And the silver band is jet black whereas the band on Jeffrey's pipe is quite bright. Oh, I had no idea it had a band, said the captain. What has made it so black? Thorndyke lifted the pipe out of the rack and looked at it closely. Silver sulphide, said he. The sulphur no doubt derived from something carried in the pocket. I say, said Captain Grumpus, smothering a yawn, gazing out of the window at the distant tender. Incidentally, it's full of tobacco. What moral do you draw from that? Thorndyke turned the pipe over and looked closely at the mouthpiece. 
The model is, he replied, that you should see that your pipe is clear before you fill it. He pointed to the mouthpiece, the bore of which was completely stopped up with fine fluff. An excellent model, too, said the captain, rising with another yawn. If you'll excuse me a minute, I'll just go and see what the tender is up to. She seems to be crossing to the east girdler. He reached the telescope down from its bracket and went out into the gallery. As the captain retreated, Thorndyke opened his pocket knife and, sticking the blade into the bowl of the pipe, turned the backer out into his hand. Shag by Jove! I exclaimed. Yes, he answered, poking it back into the bowl. Didn't you expect it to be shag? I don't know that I expected anything, I admitted. The silver band was occupying my attention. Yes, that is an interesting point, said Thorndyke, but let us see what the obstruction consists of. He opened the green case, and, taking out a dissecting needle, neatly extracted a little ball of fluff from the bore of the pipe. Laying this on a glass slide, he teased it out in a drop of glycerine, and put on a cover glass while I set up the microscope. I'd have put the pipe back on the rack, he said, as he laid the slide on the stage of the instrument. I did so, and then turned, with no little excitement, to watch him as he examined the specimen. After a brief inspection, he rose and waved his hand towards the microscope. "'Take a look at it, Jervis,' he said. I applied my eye to the instrument, and, moving the slide about, identified the constituents of the little mass of fluff. The ubiquitous cotton fibre was, of course, in evidence, and a few fibres of wool. But the most remarkable object were two or three hairs, very minute hairs of a definite zigzag shape and having a flat expansion near the free end, like the blade of a paddle. These are the hairs of some small animal, I said. Not a mouse or rat or any rodent, I should say. Some small insectivorous animal, I fancy. Yes, of course. They are the hairs of a mole. I stood up, and as the importance of the discovery flashed on me, I looked at my colleague in silence. Yes, he said. They are unmistakable, and they furnish the keystone of the argument. You think that this is really the dead man's pipe, then, I said. According to the law of multiple evidence, he replied, it is practically a certainty. Consider the facts in sequence. Since there is no sign of mildew on it, this pipe can have been here only a short time, and must belong either to Barnett, Smith, Jeffreys, or Brown. It is an old pipe, but it has no tooth marks on it. Therefore, it has been used by a man who has no teeth. But Barnett, Smith, and Jeffreys all have teeth and mark their pipes, whereas Brown has no teeth. The tobacco in it is shag, but these three men do not smoke shag, whereas Brown had shag in his pouch. The silver band is encrusted with sulphide, and Brown carried sulphur-tipped matches loose in his pocket with his pipe. We find hairs of a mole on the board of the pipe, and Brown carried a mole-skin pouch in the pocket in which he appears to have carried his pipe. Finally, Brown's pocket contained a pipe which was obviously not his, and which closely resembled that of Geoffrey's. It contained tobacco, similar to that which Jeffrey smokes, and different from that in Brown's pouch. It appears to me quite conclusive, especially when we add to this evidence the other items that are in our possession. What items are they? I asked. First, there is the fact that the dead man had knocked his head heavily against some periodically submerged body covered with acorn barnacles and serpuli. Now the piles of this lighthouse answer to the description exactly, and there are no other bodies in the neighbourhood that do for even the beacons are too large to have produced that kind of wound. Then the dead man's sheath knife is missing, and Jeffreys has a knife wound on his hand. You must admit that the circumstantial evidence is overwhelming. At this moment the captain bustled into the room with the telescope in his hand. The tender is coming up towing a strange boat, he said. I expect it's the missing one, and if it is, we may learn something. You better pack up your tracks and get ready to go on board. We packed the green case and went out onto the gallery where the two keepers were watching the approaching tender. Smith, frankly curious and interested, Jeffreys restless, fidgety, and noticeably pale. As the steamer came opposite the lighthouse, three men dropped into the boat and pulled across, and one of them, the mate of the tender, came climbing up the ladder. "'Is that the missing boat?' the captain sang out. "'Yes, sir,' answered the officer, stepping onto the staging and wiping his hands on the reverse aspect of his trousers. "'We saw a uh, line on the dry patch of the east girdler. There's been some anky panky in this job, sir. Foul play, you think, eh? Not a doubt of it, sir. The plug was out and lying loose in the bottom, and we found a sheath knife sticking into the kelson forward along the coils of the painter. It was stuck in hard, as if it had dropped from a night. That's hard, said the captain. As to the plug, it might have got out by accident. But it hadn't, sir, said the mate. The ballast bags had been shifted along to get the bottom boards up. Besides, sir, a seaman wouldn't let the boat fill. 
he'd have put the plug back and bailed out. That's true, replied Captain Grumpus, and certainly the presence of the knife looks fishy, but where the juice could it have dropped from out in the open sea? Knives don't drop from the clouds, fortunately. What do you say, Doctor? I should say that it is Brown's own knife, and that it probably fell from this staging. Jeffreys turned swiftly, crimson with wrath. What do you mean? he demanded. Haven't I said that the boat never came here? You have, replied Thorndyke. But if that is so, how do you explain the fact that your pipe was found in the dead man's pocket, and that the dead man's pipe is at this moment in your pipe rack? The crimson flush on Jeffrey's face faded as quickly as it had come. I don't know what you're talking about, he faltered. I'll tell you, said Thorndyke. I will relate what happened, and you shall check my statements. Brown brought his boat alongside and came up into the living room, bringing his chest with him. He filled his pipe and tried to light it, but it was stopped and wouldn't draw. Then you lent him a pipe of yours and filled it for him. Soon afterwards you came out on this staging and quarrelled. Brown defended himself with his knife, which dropped from his hand into the boat. You pushed him off the staging, and he fell, knocking his head on one of the piles. Then you took the plug out of the boat and sent her adrift to sink, and you flung the chest into the sea. This happened about ten minutes past twelve. Am I right? Geoffrey stood staring at Thorndyke, the picture of amazement and consternation, but he uttered no word in reply. Am I right? Thorndyke repeated. Strike me blind, muttered Jeffreys. Was you here, then? You talk as if you had been. Anyhow, he continued, recovering somewhat, you seem to know all about it. But you're wrong about one thing. There was no quarrel. This chap Brown didn't take to me. He didn't mean to stay out here. He was going to put off and go ashore again, and I wouldn't let him. Then he hit out at me with his knife, and I knocked it out of his hand, and he staggered backwards and went overboard. Uh, did you try to pick him up? asked the captain. How could I? demanded Jeffreys, with the tide racing down and me alone on the station. I'd never have got back. But what about the boat, Jeffreys? Why did you scuttle her? The fact is, replied Jeffreys, I got into a funk, and I thought the simplest plan was to send her to the cellar and know nothing about it. But I never shoved him over. It was an accident, sir, I swear it. Well, that sounds a reasonable explanation, said the captain. What do you say, doctor? Perfectly reasonable, replied Thorndyke. And as to its truth, that is no affair of ours. No, but I shall have to take you, Jeffreys, and hand you over to the police. You understand that? If so, I understand, answered Jeffreys. That was a queer case, that affair in a girdler, remarked Captain Grumpus when he was spending an evening with us some six months later. Pretty easy let off for Jeffreys, too. Eighteen months, wasn't it? Yes, it was a very queer case indeed, said Thorndyke. There was something behind that accident, I should say. Those men had probably met before. So I thought, agreed the captain. But the queerest part of it to me was the way you nosed it all out. I've had a deep respect for briar pipe since then. It was a remarkable case, he continued. The way in which you made that pipe tell the story of the murder seems to me like sheer enchantment. Yes, said I. It spoke like the magic pipe, only that wasn't a tobacco pipe in the German folk story of the singing bone. Do you remember it? A peasant found the bone of a murdered man and fashioned it into a pipe and when he tried to play on it, it burst into a song of its own. My brother slew me and buried my bones beneath the sand and under the stone. A pretty story, said Thorndyke, and one with an excellent moral. The inanimate things around us have each of them a song to sing to us, if we are but ready with attentive ears. End of section 6 Section 7 of The Singing Bone of the Adventures of Dr. Thorndyke by R. Austin Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Wastrel's Romance, Part One, The Spinster's Guest. The lingering summer twilight was fast merging into night, as a solitary cyclist, whose evening dress suit was thinly disguised by an overcoat, rode slowly along a pleasant country road. From time to time he had been overtaken and passed by a carriage, a car, or a closed cab from the adjacent town, and from the festive garb of the occupants he had made shrewd guesses at their destination. His own objective was a large house, standing in somewhat extensive grounds just off the road, and the peculiar circumstances that surrounded his visit to it caused him to ride more and more slowly as he approached his goal. Willowdale, such was the name of the house, was to-night witnessing a temporary revival of its past glories. For many months it had been empty, and a notice-board by the gatekeeper's lodge had silently announced its forlorn state. But to-night its rooms, their bare walls clothed in flags and drapery, 
their floors waxed or carpeted, would once more echo the sound of music and cheerful voices, and vibrate to the tread of many feet. For on this night the spinsters of Rainsford were giving a dance, and chief amongst the spinsters were Miss Halliwell, the owner of Wellowdale. It was a great occasion. The house was large and imposing. The spinsters were many, and their purses were long. The guests were numerous and distinguished, and included no less a person than Mrs. Jehu B. Chater. This was the crowning triumph of the function, for the beautiful American widow was the lion, or should we say lioness, of the season. Her wealth was, if not beyond the dreams of avarice, at least beyond the powers of common British arithmetic, and her diamonds were, at once, the glory and the terror of our hostesses. All these attractions notwithstanding, the cyclist approached the vicinity of Willowdale, with a slowness, almost hinting at reluctance, and when at length a curve of the road brought the gates into view, he dismounted and halted irresolutely. He was about to do a rather risky thing, and though by no means a man of weak nerve, he hesitated to make the plunge. The fact is, he had not been invited. Why then was he going, and how was he to gain admittance? to which questions the answer involves a painful explanation. Augustus Bailey lived by his wits. That is the common phrase, and a stupid phrase it is. For do we not all live by our wits, if we have any? And does it need any specially brilliant wits to be a common rogue? However such as his wits were, Augustus Bailey lived by them, and he had not hitherto made a fortune. The present venture arose out of a conversation overheard at a restaurant table and an invitation card carelessly laid down and adroitly covered with the menu. Augustus had accepted the invitation that he had not received, on a sheet of Hotel Cecil notepaper that he had among his collection of stationery, in the name of Geoffrey Harrington Bailey, and the question that exercised his mind at the moment was, would he, or would he not, be spotted? He had trusted to the number of guests, and the probable inexperience of the hostesses. He knew that the cards need not be shown there there was the awkward ceremony of announcement. But perhaps it wouldn't get as far as that, probably not, if his acceptance had been detected as emanating from an uninvited stranger. He walked slowly towards the gates with growing discomfort, added to his nervousness as to the present were certain twinges of reminiscence. He had once held a commission in a line regiment, not for long indeed, his wits had been too much for his brother officers, but there had been a time when he would have come to such a gathering as an invited guest now a common thief he was sneaking in under a false name with a fair prospect of being ignominiously thrown out by the servants as he stood hesitating the sound of hoofs on the road was followed by the aggressive bellow of a motor horn the modest twinkle of carriage lamps appeared around the curve and then the glare of acetylene headlights a man came out of the lodge and drew open the gates and mr bailey taking his courage in both hands boldly trundled his machine up the drive half way up it was quite a steep incline. The car whizzed by, a large napier filled with a bevy of young men who economised space by sitting on the backs of the seats and on one another's knees. Bailey looked at them and decided that this was the chance, and, pushing forward, he saw his bicycle safely bestowed in the empty coach-house and then hurried on to the cloakroom. The young men had arrived there before him, and as he entered were gaily peeling off their overcoats and flinging them down on a table. Bailey followed their example, and in his eagerness to enter the reception room with the crowd, let his attention wander from the business of the moment, and, as he pocketed the ticket and hurried away, he failed to notice that the bewildered attendant had put his hat with another man's coat, and affixed his duplicate to them both. Major Podbury, Captain Barker Jones, Captain Sparker, Mr. Watson, Mr. Goldsmith, Mr. Smart, Mr. Haddington, Bailey as Augustus swaggered up the room, hugging the party of officers and quaking inwardly, he was conscious that his hostesses glanced from one man to another with more than common interest. But at that moment the footman's voice rang out, sonorous and clear. Mrs. Chater, Colonel Crumpler, and as all eyes were turned towards the new arrivals, Augustus made his bow and passed into the throng. His little game of bluff had come off after all. He withdrew modestly into the more crowded portion of the room, and there took up a position where he would be shielded from the gaze of his hostesses. Presently, he reflected, they would forget him, if they had really thought about him at all, and then he would see what could be done in the way of business. 
he was still rather shaky and wondered how soon it would be decent to steady his nerves with a refresher meanwhile he kept a sharp lookout over the shoulders of neighbouring guests until a movement in the crowd of guests disclosed mrs chater shaking hands with the presiding spinster then augustus got a most uncommon surprise he knew her at first glance he had a good memory for faces and mrs chater's face was one to remember well did he recall the frank and lovely american girl with whom he had danced at the regimental ball years ago that was in the old days when he was a subaltern and before that little affair of the pricked court cards that brought his military career to an end they had taken a mutual liking he remembered that sweet-faced yankee maid and he had danced many dances and had sat out others to talk mystical nonsense which in their innocence they had believed to be philosophy he had never seen her since she had come into his life and gone out of it again and he had forgotten her name if he had ever known it but here she was middle-aged now it was true but still beautiful and a great personage withal and ye gods what diamonds and here was he too a common rogue lurking in the crowd that he might perchance snatch a pendant or pinch a loose brooch perhaps she might recognize him why not he had recognized her but that would never do and thus reflecting mr bailey slipped out to stroll on the lawn and smoke a cigarette another man somewhat older than himself was pacing to and fro thoughtfully glancing from time to time through the open windows into the brilliantly lighted rooms when they had passed once or twice the stranger halted and addressed him this is the best place on a night like this he remarked it's getting hot inside already but perhaps you're keen on dancing not so keen as i used to be replied bailey and then observing the hungry look that the other man was bestowing on his cigarette he produced his case and offered it thanks awfully exclaimed the stranger pouncing with avidity on the open case good samaritan by jove left my case in my overcoat hadn't the cheek to ask though i was starving for a smoke he inhaled luxuriously and blowing out a cloud of smoke resumed these chits seem to be running the show pretty well mm. wouldn't take it for an empty house to look at would you i have hardly seen it said bailey only just come you know we'll have a look round if you like said the genial stranger when we've finished our smoke that is have a drink too may cool us a bit know many people here not a soul replied bailey my hostess doesn't seem to have turned up well that's easily remedied said the stranger my daughter's one of the spinsters granby my name when we've had a drink i'll make her find you a partner that is if you care for the light fantastic i should like a dance or two said bailey though i'm getting a bit past it now i suppose still it doesn't do to chuck up the sponge prematurely certainly not granby agreed jovially a man's as young as he feels well come and have a drink and then we'll hunt up my little girl the two men flung away the stumps of their cigarettes and headed for the refreshments the spinster's champagne was light but it was well enough if taken in sufficient quantity a point to which augustus and granby too paid judicious attention and when he had supplemented the wine with a few sandwiches mr bailey felt in notably better spirits for to tell the truth his diet of late had been somewhat meagre miss granby when found proved to be a blonde and guileless flapper of some seventeen summers childishly eager to play her part of hostess with due dignity and presently bailey found himself gyrating through the eddying crowd in company with a comely matron of thirty or thereabouts the sensations that this novel experience aroused rather took him by surprise for years past he had been living a precarious life of mean and sordid shifts that oscillated between mere shabby trickery and downright crime now conducting a paltry swindle just inside the pale of the law and now when hard pressed descending to actual theft consorting with shady characters swindlers and knaves and scurvy rogues like himself gambling borrowing cadging and if need be stealing and always slinking abroad with an apprehensive eye upon the man in blue and now amidst the half-forgotten surroundings once so familiar the gaily decorated rooms the rhythmic music the twinkle of jewels the murmur of gliding feet and the rustle of costly gowns the moving vision of honest gentlemen and fair ladies the shameful years seemed to drop away and leave him to take up the thread of his life where it had snapped so disastrously after all these were his own people 
the seedy knaves in whose steps he had walked of late were but aliens met by the way he surrendered his partner in due course with regret which was mutual to an inarticulate subaltern and was meditating another pilgrimage to the refreshment room when he felt a light touch upon his arm he turned swiftly a touch on the arm meant more to him than to some men but it was no wooden-faced plain-clothes man that he confronted it was only a lady in short it was mrs chater smiling nervously and a little abashed by her own boldness i expect you've forgotten me she began apologetically but augustus interrupted her with an eager disclaimer of course i haven't he said though i have forgotten your name but i remember that portsmouth dance as well as if it were yesterday at least one incident in it the only one that was worth remembering i have often hoped that i might meet you again and now at last it has happened it's nice of you to remember she rejoined i have often and often thought of that evening and all the wonderful things that we talked about you were a nice boy then i wonder what you are like now what a long time ago it is yes augustus agreed gravely it is a long time i know it myself but when i look at you it seems as if it could only have been last season oh fie she exclaimed you are not simple as you used to be you didn't flatter then but perhaps there wasn't the need she spoke with gentle reproach but her pretty face flushed with pleasure nevertheless and there was a certain wistfulness in the tone of her concluding sentence i wasn't flattering augustus replied quite sincerely i knew you directly you entered the room and marvelled that time had been so gentle with you he hasn't been as kind to me no you have gotten a few grey hairs i see but after all what are grey hairs to a man just the badges of rank like the crown on your collar or the lace on your cuffs to mark the steps of your promotion for i guess you'll be colonel by now no augustus answered quickly with a faint flush i left the army some years ago my what a pity exclaimed mrs chater you must tell me all about it but not now my partner will be looking for me we will sit out a dance and have a real gossip but i've forgotten your name never could recall it in fact though that didn't prevent me from remembering you but as our dear w s remarked what's in a name ah indeed said mr harrington bailey and apropos of that sentiment he added mine is roland captain roland you may remember it now mrs chater did not however and said so will number six do she asked opening her programme and when augustus had assented she entered his provisional name remarking complacently well sit out and have a right down good talk and you shall tell me all about yourself and if you still think the same about free will and personal responsibility you had very lofty ideals i remember in those days and i hope you have still but one's ideals get rubbed down rather faint in the friction of life don't you think so yes i am afraid you're right augustus assented gloomily the wear and tear of life soon fetches the guilt off the gingerbread middle age is apt to find us a bit patchy not to say naked oh don't be pessimistic said mrs chester that is the attitude of the disappointed idealist and i am sure you have no reason really to be disappointed in yourself but i must run away now think over all the things you have to tell me and don't forget that it is number six with a bright smile and a friendly nod she sailed away a vision of glittering splendour compared with which solomon in all his glory was a mere matter of commonplace billion the interview evidently friendly and familiar between the unknown guest and the famous american widow had by no means passed unnoticed and in other circumstances bailey might have endeavoured to profit by the reflected glory that enveloped him but he was not in search of notoriety and the same evasive instinct that had led him to sink mr harrington bailey in captain roland now advised him to withdraw his dual personality from the vulgar gaze he had come here on very definite business for the hundredth time he was stony broke and it was the hope of picking up some unconsidered trifles that had brought him but somehow the atmosphere of the place had proved unfavourable either opportunities were lacking or he failed to seize them in any case the game pocket that formed an unconventional feature of his dress coat was still empty and it looked as if a pleasant evening and a good supper were all that he was likely to get nevertheless be his conduct never so blameless the fact remained that he was an uninvited guest 
liable at any moment to be ejected as an impostor and his recognition by the widow had not rendered this possibility any the more remote he strayed out onto the lawn whence the grounds fell away on all sides but there were other guests there cooling themselves after the last dance and the light from the rooms streamed through the windows illuminating their figures and among them that of the too companionable granby augustus quickly drew away from the lighted area and chancing upon a narrow path strolled away along it in the direction of a copse or shrubbery that he saw ahead presently he came to an ivy-covered arch lighted by one or two fairy lamps and passing through this he entered a winding path bordered by trees and shrubs and but fairly lighted by an occasional coloured lamp suspended from a branch already he was quite clear of the crowd indeed the deserted condition of the pleasant retreat rather surprised him until he reflected that to couples desiring seclusion there were whole ranges of untenanted rooms and galleries available in the empty house the path sloped gently downwards for some distance then came a long flight of rustic steps and at the bottom a seat between two trees in front of the seat the path extended in a straight line forming a narrow terrace on the right the ground sloped up steeply towards the lawn on the left it fell away still more steeply towards the encompassing wall of the grounds and on both sides it was covered with trees and shrubs bailey sat down on the seat to think over the account of himself that he should present to mrs chater it was a comfortable seat built into the trunk of an elm which formed one end and part of the back he leaned against the tree and taking out his silver case selected a cigarette but it remained unlighted between his fingers as he sat and meditated upon his unsatisfactory past and the melancholy tale of what might have been fresh from the atmosphere of refined opulence that pervaded the dancing-rooms the throng of well-groomed men and dainty women his mind travelled back to his sordid little flat in bermondsey encompassed by poverty and squalor jostled by lofty factories grimy with the smoke of the river and the reek from the great chimneys it was a hideous contrast verily the way of the transgressor was not strewn with flowers at that point in his meditations he caught the sound of voices and footsteps on the path above and rose to walk on along the path he did not wish to be seen wandering alone in the shrubbery but now a woman's laugh sounded from somewhere down the path there were people approaching that way too he put the cigarette back in the case and stepped round behind the seat intending to retreat in that direction but here the path ended and beyond was nothing but a rugged slope down to the wall thickly covered with bushes and while he was hesitating the sound of feet descending the steps and the rustle of a woman's dress left him to choose between staying where he was or coming out to confront the newcomers he chose the former drawing up close behind the tree to wait until they should have passed on but they were not going to pass on one of them a woman sat down on the seat and then a familiar voice smote in his ear i guess i'll rest here quietly for a while this tooth of mine is aching terribly and see here i want you to go and fetch me something take this ticket to the cloakroom and tell the woman to give me my little velvet bag you'll find it in a bottle of chloroform and a packet of cotton wool but i can't leave you here all alone mrs chater her partner expostulated i'm not hankering for society just now said mrs chater i want that chloroform just you hustle off and fetch it like a good boy there's the ticket the young officer's footsteps retreated rapidly and the voices of the couple advancing along the path grew louder bailey cursing the chance that had placed him in his ridiculous and uncomfortable position heard them approach and pass on up the steps and then all was silent save for an occasional moan from mrs chater and the measured creaking of the seat as she rocked uneasily to and fro but the young man was uncommonly prompt in the discharge of his mission and in a very few minutes bailey heard him approaching at a run along the path above and then bounding down the steps now i call that real good of you said the widow gratefully you must have run like the wind cut the string of the packet but then leave me to wrestle with his tooth but i can't leave you here or yes you can interrupted mrs chater there won't be any one about the next dance is a waltz besides you must go and find your partner well if you'd really rather be alone the subaltern began but mrs chater interrupted him of course i would when i'm fixing up my teeth 
I'll go along, and a thousand thanks for your kindness. With mumbled protestations, the young officer slowly retired, and Bailey heard his reluctant feet ascending the steps. Then a deep silence fell on the place in which the rustle of paper and the squeak of a withdrawn cork seemed loud and palpable. Bailey had turned with his face towards the tree, against which he leaned, with his lips parted, scarcely daring to breathe. He cursed himself again and again for having thus entrapped himself, for no tangible reason, and longed to get away. But there was no escape now without betraying himself. He must wait for the woman to go. Suddenly, beyond the edge of the tree, a hand appeared, holding an open packet of cotton wool. It laid the wool down on the seat, and pinching off a fragment, rolled it into a tiny ball. The fingers of the hand were encircled by rings, its wrist enclosed by a broad bracelet, and from rings and bracelet the light of the solitary fairy lamp that hung from a branch of the tree was reflected in prismatic sparks. The hand was withdrawn, and Bailey stared dreamily at the square pad of cotton wool. Then the hand came again into view. This time it held a small file, which it laid softly on the seat, setting the cork beside it, and again the light flashed in many coloured scintillations from the encrusting gems. Bailey's knees began to tremble, and a chilly moisture broke out upon his forehead. The hand drew back, but as it vanished, Bailey moved his head silently, until his face emerged from behind the tree. The woman was leaning back, her head resting against the trunk, only a few inches away from his face. The great stones of the tiara flashed in his very eyes. Over her shoulder he could even see the gorgeous pendant rising and falling on her bosom with ever-changing fires, and both her raised hands were a mass of glitter and sparkle, only the deeper and richer for the subdued light. His heart throbbed with palpable blows that drummed aloud in his ears. The sweat trickled clamorly down his face, and he clenched his teeth to keep them from chattering. An agony of horror, of deadly fear, was creeping over him, a terror of the dreadful impulse that was stealing away his reason and his will. His heart throbbed with palpable blows that drummed aloud in his ears. The sweat trickled clamorly down his face, and he clenched his teeth to keep them from chattering. An agony of horror, of deadly fear, was creeping over him, a terror of the dreadful impulse that was stealing away his reason and his will. The silence was profound. The woman's soft breathing, the creak of her bodice, were plainly, grossly audible, and he checked his own breath until he seemed on the verge of suffocation. Of a sudden, through the night air, was borne faintly the dreamy music of a waltz. The dance had begun. The distant sound but deepened the sense of solitude in this deserted spot. Bailey listened intently. He yearned to escape from the invisible force that seemed to be clutching at his wrists and dragging him forward inexorably to his doom. He gazed down at the woman with a horrid fascination. He struggled to draw back out of sight, and struggled in vain. Then at last, with a horrible, stealthy deliberation, a clammy, shaking hand crept forward towards the seat. Without a sound, it grasped the wool, and noiselessly, slowly, drew back. Again it stole forth, the fingers twined snakely around the file, lifted it from the seat, and carried it back into the shadow. After a few seconds it reappeared, and softly replaced the bottle, now half empty. There was a brief pause. The measured cadences of the waltz stole softly through the quiet night, and seemed to keep time with the woman's breathing. Other sound there was none. The place was wrapped in the silence of the grave. Suddenly from the hiding place Bailey leaned forward over the back of the seat. The pad of cotton wool was in his hand. The woman was now leaning back as if dozing, and her hands rested in her lap. There was a swift movement. The pad was pressed against her face, and her head dragged back against the chest of the invisible assailant. A smothered gasp burst from her hidden lips as her hands flew up to clutch at the murderous arm, and then came a frightful struggle made even more frightful by the gay and costly trappings of the writhing victim, and still there was hardly a sound, only muffled gasps, the rustle of silk, the creaking of the seat, the clink of the falling bottle, and afar off with dreadful irony the dreamy murmur of the waltz. The struggle was but brief. 
Quite suddenly the jewelled hands dropped, the head lay resistless on the crumpled shirt front, and the body, now limp and inert, began to slip forward off the seat. Bailey, still grasping the passive head, climbed over the back of the seat, and, as the woman slid gently to the ground, he drew away the pad and stooped over her. The struggle was over now. The mad fury of the moment was passing swiftly into the chill of mortal fear. He stared with incredulous horror into the swollen face, but now so comely, the sightless eyes that, but a little while since, had smiled into his with such kindly recognition. He had done this. He, the sneaking wastrel, discarded of all the world, to whom this sweet woman had held out the hand of friendship. She had cherished his memory, when to all others he was sunk deep under the waters of oblivion, and he had killed her, for to his ear no breath of life seemed to issue from those purple lips. A sudden hideous compunction for this irrevocable thing that he had done surged through him, and he stood up, clutching at his damp hair with a hoarse cry that was like the cry of the damned. The jewels passed straight away out of his consciousness. Everything was forgotten now but the horror of this unspeakable thing that he had done. Remorse, incurable, and haunting fear were all that were left to him. The sound of voices far away along the path aroused him, and the vague horror that possessed him materialized into abject bodily fear. He lifted the limp body to the edge of the path, and let it slip down the steep declivity among the bushes. A soft shuddering sigh came from the parted lips as the body turned over, and he paused a moment to listen, but there was no other sound of life. Doubtless that sigh was only the result of the passive movement. Again he stood for an instant, as one in a dream, gazing at the huddled shape half hidden by the bushes before he climbed back to the path, and even then he looked back once more, but now she was hidden from sight, and as the voices drew nearer he turned and ran up the rustic steps. As he came out on the edge of the lawn the music ceased, and almost immediately a stream of people issued from the house. Shaken as he was, Bailey yet had wits enough left to know that his clothes and hair were disordered, and that his appearance must be wild. Accordingly he avoided the dancers, and, keeping to the margin of the lawn, made his way to the cloakroom by the least frequented route. If he had dared, he would have called in at the refreshment room, for he was deadly faint, and his limbs shook as he walked. But a haunting fear pursued him, and indeed grew from moment to moment. He found himself already listening for the rumour of the inevitable discovery. He staggered into the cloakroom, and, flinging his ticket down on the table, dragged out his watch. The attendant looked at him curiously, and, pausing with the ticket in his hand, asked sympathetically, "'Ought feeling very well, sir?' "'No,' said Bailey. "'So beastly hot in there. "'You ought to have a glass of champagne, sir, before you start,' said the man. "'No time,' replied Bailey, holding out a shaky hand for his coat. "'Shall lose my train if I'm not sharp.' At this hint the attendant reached down to the coat and hat, holding up the former for its owner to slip his arms into the sleeves. But Bailey snatched it from him and, flinging it over his arm, put on his hat, and hurried away to the coach-house. Here again the attendant stared at him in astonishment, which was not lessened when Bailey, declining his offer to help him on with his coat, bundled the latter under his arm, clicked the lever of the variable on to the ninety gear, sprang on to the machine, and whirled away from the steep drive, a grotesque vision of flying coat-tail. "'You haven't lit your lamp, sir,' roared the attendant but Bailey's ears were deaf to all save the clamour of the expected pursuit. Fortunately the drive entered the road obliquely, or Bailey must have been flung into the opposite hedge. As it was, the machine, rushing down the slope, flew out into the road with terrific velocity, nor did its speed diminish then, for its rider, impelled by mortal terror, trod the pedals with the fury of a madman. And still, as the machine whizzed along the dark and silent road, his ears were strained to catch the clatter of hoofs, or the throb of a motor from behind. He knew the country well, in fact as a precaution he had cycled over the district only the day before, and he was ready, at any suspicious sound, to slip down any of the lanes or byways, secure of finding his way. But still he sped on, and still no sound from the rear came to tell him of the dread discovery. When he had ridden about three miles he came to the foot of a steep hill. Here he had to dismount and push his machine up the incline, which he did at such speed that he arrived at the top quite breathless. Before mounting again, he determined to put on his coat, for his appearance was calculated to attract attention, if nothing more. 
it was only half past eleven and presently he would pass through the streets of a small town also he would light his lamp it would be fatal to be stopped by a patrol or rural constable having lit his lamp and hastily put on his coat he once more listened intently looking back over the country that was darkly visible from the summit of the hill no moving lights were to be seen no ringing hoofs or throbbing engines to be heard and turning to mount he instinctively felt in his overcoat pocket for his gloves a pair of gloves came out in his hand but he was instantly conscious that they were not his a silk muffler was there also a white one but his muffler black with a sudden shock of terror he thrust his hand into the ticket pocket where he had put his latch-key there was no key there only an amber cigar holder which he had never seen before he stood for a few moments in utter consternation he had taken the wrong coat then he had left his own coat behind a cold sweat of fear broke out afresh on his face as he realized this his yale latch-key was in its pocket not that that mattered very much he had a duplicate at home and as to getting in well he knew his own outside door and his tool-bag contained one or two trifles not usually found in cyclists tool-bags the question was whether that coat contained anything that could disclose his identity and then suddenly he remembered with a gasp of relief that he had carefully turned the pockets out before starting no once let him attain the sanctuary of his grimy little flat wedged in as it was between the great factories by the riverside and he would be safe safe from everything but the horror of himself and the haunting vision of a jewelled figure huddled up in a silken heap beneath the bushes with a last look round he mounted his machine and driving it over the brow of the hill swept away into the darkness end of section seven section eight of the singing bone or the adventures of dr thorndyke by r austin freeman this librivox recording is in the public domain part two munera pulveris related by christopher jervis m d it is one of the drawbacks of medicine as a profession that one is never rid of one's responsibilities the merchant the lawyer the civil servant each at the appointed time locks up his desk puts on his hat and goes forth a free man with an interval of uninterrupted leisure before him not so the doctor whether at work or at play awake or asleep he is the servant of humanity at the instant disposal of friend or stranger alike whose need may make the necessary claim when i agreed to accompany my wife to the spinster's dance at rainsford i imagined that for that evening at least i was definitely off duty and in that belief i continued until the conclusion of the eighth dance to be quite truthful i was not sorry when the delusion was shattered my last partner was a young lady of a slanginess of speech that verged on the inarticulate now it is not easy to exchange ideas in pidgin english and the conversation of a person to whom all things are either ripping or rotten is apt to lack subtlety in fact i was frankly bored and reflecting on the utility of the humble sandwich as an aid to conversation i was about to entice my partner to the refreshment room where i felt someone pluck at my sleeve i turned quickly and looked into the anxious and rather frightened face of my wife miss halliwell is looking for you she said a lady has been taken ill will you come and see what is the matter she took my arm and when i had made my apologies to my partner she hurried me on to the lawn it is a mysterious affair my wife continued the sick lady is a mrs chater a very wealthy american widow edith halliwell and major podbury found her lying in the shrubbery all alone and unable to give any account of herself poor edith is dreadfully upset she does not know what to think what do you mean i began but at this moment miss halliwell who was waiting by an ivy-covered rustic arch espied us and ran forward oh do please hurry dr jervis she exclaimed such a shocking thing has happened as juliet told you without waiting for an answer she darted through the arch and preceded us along a narrow path at the curious flat-footed shambling trot common to most adult women presently we descended a flight of rustic steps which brought us to a seat from whence she extended a straight path cut like a miniature terrace on a steep slope with a high bank rising to the right and declivity falling away to the left down in the hollow his head and shoulders appearing above the bushes was a man holding in his hand a fairy lamp that he had apparently taken down from a tree i climbed down to him and as i came round the bushes i perceived a richly dressed woman lying huddled on the ground she was not completely insensible 
for she moved slightly at my approach muttering a few words in thick indistinct accents i took the lamp from the man whom i assumed to be major podbury and as he delivered it to me with a significant glance and a faint lift of the eyebrows i understood miss halliwell's agitation indeed for one horrible moment i thought she was right that the prostrate woman was intoxicated but when i approached nearer the flickering light of the lamp made visible a square reddened patch on her face like the impression of a mustard plaster covering the nose and mouth and then i scented mischief of a more serious kind we had better carry her up to the seat i said handing the lamp to miss halliwell then we can consider moving her to the house the major and i lifted the helpless woman and having climbed cautiously up to the path laid her on the seat what is it dr jervis miss halliwell whispered i can't say at the moment i replied but it's not what you feared thank god for that was her fervent rejoinder it would have been a shocking scandal i took the dim light and once more bent over the half-conscious woman her appearance puzzled me not a little she looked like a person recovering from an anaesthetic but the square red patch on her face recalling as it did the burke murders rather suggested suffocation as i was thus reflecting the light of the lamp fell on a white object lying on the ground behind the seat and holding the lamp forward i saw that it was a square pad of cotton wool the coincidence of its shape and size with that of the red patch on the woman's face instantly struck me and i stooped down to pick it up and then i saw lying under the seat a small bottle this also i picked up and held in the lamplight it was a one-ounce phial quite empty and was labelled methylated chloroform here seemed to be a complete explanation of the thick utterance and drunken aspect but it was an explanation that required in its turn to be explained obviously no robbery had been committed for the woman literally glittered with diamonds equally obviously she had not administered the chloroform to herself there was nothing for it but to carry her indoors and await her further recovery so with the major's help we conveyed her through the shrubbery and kitchen garden to a side door and deposited her on a sofa in a half-furnished room here under the influence of water dabbed on her face and the plentiful use of smelling salts she quickly revived and was soon able to give an intelligible account of herself the chloroform and cotton wool were her own she had used them for an aching tooth and she was sitting alone on the seat with the bottle and the wool beside her when the incomprehensible thing had happened without a moment's warning a hand had come from behind her and pressed the pad of wool over her nose and mouth the wool was saturated with chloroform and she had lost consciousness almost immediately you didn't see the person then i asked no but i know he was in evening dress because i felt my head against his shirt front then said i he is either here still or has been to the cloakroom he couldn't have left the place without an overcoat no oh, by jove exclaimed the major it's true i'll go and make inquiries he strode away all agog and i having satisfied myself that mrs chater could be left safely followed him almost immediately i made my way straight to the cloakroom and here i found the major and one or two of his brother officers putting on their coats in a flutter of gleeful excitement he's gone said podbury struggling frantically into his overcoat went off nearly an hour ago on a bicycle seemed in a deuce of a stew the attendant says and no wonder we're going after him in our car care to join the hunt no thanks i must stay with the patient but how do you know you're after the right man isn't any other only one johnny's left besides here confound it you've given me the wrong coat he tore off the garment and handed it back to the attendant who regarded it with an expression of dismay are you sure sir he asked perfectly said the major kim hurry up my man i'm afraid sir said the attendant that the gentleman who has gone has taken your coat they were on the same peg i know i'm very sorry sir the major was speechless with wrath what the devil was the good of being sorry and how the deuce was he to get his coat back but i interposed if the stranger has got your coat then this coat must be his i knew said podbury but i don't want his beastly coat no i replied but it may be useful for identification this appeared to afford the bereaved officer little consolation but as the car was now ready he bustled away and i having directed the man to put the coat away in a safe place went back to my patient mrs chater was by now fairly recovered and had developed a highly vindictive interest in her late assailant she even went so far as to regret that he had not taken at least some of her diamonds so that robbery might have been added to the charge of attempted murder and expressed the earnest hope that the officers would not be foolishly gentle in their treatment of him when they caught him by the way dr jervis said miss halliwell i think i ought to mention a rather curious thing that happened in connection with this dance we received an acceptance from mr haddington bailey who wrote from the hotel cecil 
now i am sure that no such name was proposed by any of the spinsters but didn't you ask them i inquired well the fact is she replied that one of them miss waters had to go abroad suddenly and we had not got her address and as it was possible that she might have invited him i did not like to move in the matter i'm very sorry i didn't now we may have let in a regular criminal though why he should have wanted to murder mrs chater i cannot imagine it was certainly a mysterious affair and the mystery was in no wise dispelled by the return of the search party an hour later it seemed that the bicycle had been tracked for a couple of miles towards london but then at the crossroads the tracks had become hopelessly mixed with the impressions of other machines and the officers after cruising about vaguely for a while had given up the hunt and returned you see mrs chater major podbury explained apologetically the fellow must have had a good hour's start and yet would have brought him pretty close to london do you mean to tell me explained mrs chater regarding the major with a hardly concealed contempt that that villain has got off scot-free it looks rather like it replied podbury but if i were you i should get the men's description from the attendants who saw him and go up to scotland yard to-morrow they may know the johnny there and they may even recognize the coat if you take it with you that doesn't seem very likely said mrs chater and it certainly did not but since no better plan could be suggested the lady decided to adopt it and i suppose that i had heard the last of the matter in this however i was mistaken on the following day just before noon as i was drowsily considering the points in a brief dealing with a question of survivorship while thorndyke drafted his weekly lecture a smart rat-tat at the door of our chambers announced a visitor i rose wearily i had had only four hours sleep and opened the door whereupon there sailed into the room no less a person than mrs chater followed by superintendent miller with a grin on his face and a brown paper parcel under his arm the lady was not in the best of tempers though wonderfully lively and alert considering the severe shock that she had suffered so recently and her disapproval of miller was frankly obvious dr jervis has probably told you about the attempt to murder me last night she said when i had introduced her to my colleague well now will you believe it i have been to the police i have given them a description of the murderous villain and i have even shown them the very coat that he wore and they tell me that nothing can be done that in short this scoundrel must be allowed to go his way free and unmolested you will observe doctor said miller that this lady has given us a description that would apply to fifty per cent of the middle-class men of the united kingdom and has shown us a coat without a single identifying mark of any kind on it and expects us to lay our hands on the owner without a solitary clue to guide us now we are not sorcerers at the yard we are only policemen so i have taken the liberty of referring mrs chater to you he grinned maliciously and laid the parcel on the table and what do you want me to do thorndyke asked quietly why sir said miller there is a coat in the pockets were a pair of gloves a muffler a box of matches a tram ticket and a yale key mrs chater would like to know whose coat it is he untied the parcel with his eye cocked at our rather disconcerted client and thorndyke watched him with a faint smile this is very kind of you miller said he but i think a clairvoyant would be more to your purpose the superintendent instantly dropped his facetious manner seriously sir he said i should be glad if you would take a look at the coat we have absolutely nothing to go on and yet we don't want to give up the case i have gone through it most thoroughly and can't find any clue to guide us now i know that nothing escaped you and perhaps you might notice something that i have overlooked something that would give us a hint where to start in our inquiry couldn't you turn the microscope on it for instance he added with a deprecating smile thorndyke reflected with an inquisitive eye on the coat i saw that the problem was not without its attractions to him and when the lady seconded miller's request with persuasive eagerness the inevitable consequence followed very well he said leave the coat with me for an hour or so and i will look it over i am afraid there is not the remotest chance of our learning anything from it but even so the examination will have done no harm come back at two o'clock i shall be ready to report my failure by then he bowed our visitors out and returning to the table looked down with a quizzical smile on the coat and the large official envelope containing articles from the pockets and what does my learned brother suggest he asked looking up at me i should look at the tram ticket first i replied and then well miller's suggestion was such a bad one to explore the surface with the microscope i think we will take the latter measure first said he the tram ticket might create a misleading bias a man may take a tram anywhere whereas the indoor dust on a man's coat appertains mostly to a definite locality yes i replied but the information that it yields is excessively vague that is true he agreed taking up the coat and envelope to carry them to the laboratory 
and yet you know, Jervis, as I have often pointed out, the evidential value of dust is apt to be underestimated. The naked eye appearances, which are the normal appearances, are misleading. Gather the dust, say, from a tabletop, and what have you, a fine powder of characterless grey, just like any other dust from any other tabletop. But under the microscope this grey powder is resolved into recognisable fragments of definite substances, which fragments may often be traced with certainty to the masses from which they have been detached. But you know all this as well as I do. I quite appreciate the value of dust as evidence in certain circumstances, I replied. But surely the information that could be gathered from dust on the coat of an unknown man must be too general to be of any use in tracing the owner. I am afraid you are right, said Thorndyke, laying the coat on the laboratory bench. But we shall soon see if Polton will let us have his patent dust extractor. The little apparatus to which my colleague referred was the invention of our ingenious laboratory assistants, and resembled in principle the vacuum cleaners used for restoring carpets. It had, however, one special feature. The receiver was made to admit a microscope slide, and in this the dust-laden air was delivered from a jet. The extractor, having been clamped to the bench by its proud inventor, and wetted slide introduced into the receiver, Thorndyke applied the nozzle of the instrument on the collar of the coat, while Polton worked the pump. The slide was then removed, and another having been substituted, the nozzle was applied to the right sleeve near the shoulder, and the exhauster again worked by Polton. By repeating this process, half a dozen slides were obtained, charged with dust from different parts of this garment, and then, setting up our respective microscopes, we proceeded to examine the samples. A very brief inspection showed me that this dust contained matter not usually met with, at any rate in appreciable quantities. There were, of course, the usual fragments of wool, cotton, and other fibres derived from clothing and furniture, particles of straw, husk, hair, various mineral particles, and, in fact, the ordinary constituents of dust from clothing. But in addition to these, and in much greater quantity, were a number of other bodies, mostly of vegetable origin, and presenting well-defined characters in considerable variety, and especially abundant, were various starch granules. I glanced at Thorndyke, and observed he was already busy with a pencil and a slip of paper, apparently making a list of the objects visible in the field of the microscope. I hastened to follow his example, and for a time we worked on in silence. At length, my colleague leaned back in his chair and read over his list. "'This is a highly interesting collection, Jervis,' he remarked. "'What do you find on your slides out of the ordinary?' "'I have quite a little museum here,' I replied, referring to my list. "'There is, of course, chalk from the road at Rainsford. Yet in addition to this, I find various starches, principally wheat and rice, especially rice, fragments of the cortices of several seeds, several different stone cells, some yellow masses that look like turmeric, black pepper resin cells, one port wine pimento cell, and one of two particles of graphite. Graphite! exclaimed Thorndyke. I have found no graphite, but I have found traces of cocoa, spidal vessels and starch grain, and of hops, one fragment of leaf, and several lupulin glands. May I see the graphite? I passed him the slide, and he examined it with keen interest. Yes, he said, this is undoubtedly graphite, and no less than six particles of it. We had better go over the coat systematically. You see the importance of this? I see that it is evidently factory dust, and it may fix a locality, but I don't see that it will carry us any further. Don't forget that we have a touchstone, said he, and as I raised my eyebrows inquiringly, he added, The Yale latchkey. If we can narrow the locality down sufficiently, Miller can make a tour of the front doors. But can we? I asked incredulously. I doubt it. We can try, answered Thorndyke. Evidently some of the substances are distributed over the entire coat, inside and out while others, such as the graphite, are present only on certain parts. We must locate those parts exactly, and then consider what this special distribution means. He rapidly sketched out on a sheet of paper a rough diagram of the coat, marking each part with a distinctive letter, and then, taking a number of labelled slides, he wrote a single letter on each. The samples of dust taken on the slides could thus be easily referred to the exact spots whence they had been obtained. Once more we set to work with the microscope, making, now and again, an addition to our list of discoveries, and at the end of nearly an hour's strenuous search, every slide had been examined and the lists compared. The net result of the examination, said Thorndyke, is this. The entire coat, inside and out, is evenly powdered with the following substances. Rice starch in abundance, wheat starch in less abundance, and smaller quantities of the starches of ginger, pimento, and cinnamon. Bast fibre of cinnamon, various seed cortices, 
stone cells of pimento cinnamon cassio and black pepper and other fragments of similar origin such as resin cells and ginger pigment not turmeric in addition there are on the right shoulder and sleeve traces of cocoa and hops and on the back below the shoulders a few fragments of graphite those are the data and now what are the inferences remember this is not mere surface dust but the accumulation of months beaten into the cloth by rapid brushing dust that nothing but a vacuum apparatus could extract evidently i said the particles that are all over the coat represent dust that is floating in the air of the place where the coat habitually hangs the graphite has obviously been picked up from a seat and the cocoa and hops from some factories that the man passes frequently although i don't see why they are on the right side only that is a question of time said thorndyke and incidentally throws some light on our friend's habits going from home he passes the factories on his right returning home he passes them on his left but they have then stopped work however the first group of substances is the more important as they indicate the locality of his dwelling for he is clearly not a workman or factory employee now rice starch wheat starch and a group of substances collectively designated spices suggest a rice mill a flour mill and a spice factory pardon may i trouble you for the post office directory he turned over the leaves of the trades section and resumed i see there are four rice mills in london of which the largest is carbots at dockhead let us look at the spice factories he again turned over the leaves and read down the list of names there are six spice grinders in london said he one of them thomas williams and company is at dockhead none of the others is near any rice mill the next question is as to the flour mill let us see here are the names of several flour millers but none of them is near either a rice mill or a spice grinder with one exception seth taylor's st saviour's flour mills dockhead this is really becoming interesting said i it has become interesting thorndyke retorted you observe that at dockhead we find the peculiar combination of factories necessary to produce the composite dust to which this coat has hung and the directory shows us that this particular combination exists nowhere else in london then the graphite the cocoa and the hops tend to confirm the other suggestions they all appertain to industries of the locality the trams which pass dockhead also to my knowledge pass at no great distance from the black lead works of pierce duff and company in rural road and will certainly collect a few particles of black lead on the seats in certain states of the wind i see too that there is a cocoa factory panes in goat street horsley down which lies to the right of the tram line going west and i have noticed several hops warehouses on the right side of southwark street going west but these are mere suggestions the really important data are the rice and flour mills and the spice grinders which seem to point unmistakably to dockhead are there any private houses at dockhead i asked we must look up the street list he replied the yale latchkey rather suggests a flat and a flat with a single occupant and the probable habits of our absent friend offer a similar suggestion he ran his eye down the list and presently turned to me with his finger on the page if the facts that we have elicited the singular series of agreements with the required conditions are only a string of coincidences here is another on the south side of dockhead actually next door to the spice grinders and opposite to carbot's rice mills is a block of workmen's flats hanover buildings they fulfil the conditions exactly a coat hung in a room with those flats with the windows open as they would probably be at this time of year will be exposed to the air containing a composite dust of precisely the character of that which we have found of course the same conditions obtain to other dwellings in this part of dockhead but the probability is in favour of the building and that is all that we can say it is no certainty there may be some radical fallacy in our reasoning but on the face of it the chances are a thousand to one that the door that the key will open is in some part of dockhead and most probably in hanover buildings we must leave the verification to miller wouldn't it be as well to look at the tram ticket i asked dear me he exclaimed i've forgotten the ticket yes by all means he opened the envelope and turning its contents out on the bench picked up the dingy slip of paper after a glance at it he handed it to me it was punched for the journey from tooley street to dockhead another coincidence he remarked and by yet another i think i hear miller knocking at our door it was the superintendent and as we let him into the room the hum of a motor-car entering from tudor street announced the arrival of mrs chater we waited for her at the open door and as she entered she held out her hands impulsively so now dr thorndyke she exclaimed have you gotten something to toss i have a suggestion to make replied thorndyke i think that if the superintendent will take this key to hanover buildings dockhead bermondsey he may possibly find a door that it will fit 
the juice exclaimed miller oh, i beg your pardon madam but i thought i'd gone through that coat pretty completely what was it that i'd overlooked sir was there a letter hidden in it after all you overlooked the dust on it miller that is all said thorndyke dust exclaimed the detective staring round-eyed at my colleague then he chuckled softly well said he as i said before i'm not a sorcerer i'm only a policeman he picked up the key and asked are you coming to see the end of it sir of course he's coming said mrs chater and dr jervis too to identify the man now that we have gotten the villain we must leave him no loophole for escape thorndyke smiled dryly we will come if you wish it mrs chater he said but you mustn't look upon our quest as a certainty we may have made an entire miscalculation and i am in fact rather curious to see if the result works out correctly but even if we run the man to earth i don't see that you have much evidence against him the most that you can prove is that he was at the house and that he left hurriedly mrs chater regarded my colleague for a moment in scornful silence and then gathering up her skirts stalked out of the room if there's one thing that the average woman detests more than another it's an entirely reasonable man the big car whirled us rapidly over blackfriars bridge into the region of the borough whence we presently turned down tooley street towards bermondsey as soon as dockhead came into view the detective thorndyke and i alighted and proceeded on foot leaving our client who was now closely veiled to follow at a little distance in the car opposite the head of st saviour's dock thorndyke halted and looked over the wall drew my attention to the snowy powder that had lodged on every projection on the backs of the tall buildings and on the decks of the barges that were loading with the flour and ground rice then crossing the road he pointed to the wooden lantern above the roof of the spice works the louvre of which were covered with greyish buff dust thus he moralized does commerce subserve the ends of justice at least we hope it does he added quickly as miller disappeared into the semi-basement of the buildings we met the detective returning from his quest as we entered the building i go there was his report we'll try the next floor this was the ground floor or it might be considered the first floor at any rate it yielded nothing of interest and after a glance at the doors that opened on the landing he strode briskly up the stone stairs the next floor was equally unrewarding for our eager inspection disclosed nothing but the gaping keyhole associated with the common type of night match what name was you wantin inquired a dusty knight of industry who emerged from one of the flats muggs replied miller with admirable promptness don't know him said the workman i expect his father up farther up we accordingly went but still from each door the artless grin of the invariable keyhole saluted us with depressing monotony i began to grow uneasy and when the fourth floor had been explored with no better result my anxiety became acute a mare's nest may be an interesting curiosity but it brings no kudos to its discoverer i suppose you haven't made any mistake sir said miller stopping to wipe his brow it's quite likely that i have replied thorndyke with unmoved composure i only proposed this search as a tentative proceeding you know the superintendent grunted he was accustomed as i was too for that matter to regard thorndyke's tentative suggestions as equal to another man's certainties it'll be an awful suck in for mrs chater if we don't find him after all he growled as he climbed up the last flight she's counted her chickens to a feather he paused at the head of the stairs and stood for a few moments looking round the landing suddenly he turned eagerly and laying his hand on thorndyke's arm pointed to a door in the farthest corner yale lock he whispered impressively we followed him silently as he stole on tiptoe across the landing and we watched him as he stood for an instant with the key in his hand looking gloatingly at the brass disc we saw him softly apply the nose of the fluted key blade to the crooked slit in the cylinder and as we watched it slid noiselessly up to the shoulder the detective looked round with a grin of triumph and silently withdrawing the key stepped back to us you run him to earth sir he whispered but i don't think mr fox is at home he can't have got back yet why not asked thorndyke miller waved his hand towards the door nothing's been disturbed he replied there's not a mark on the paint now he hadn't got the key and he can't pick a yellow lock he'd have had to break in and he hasn't broken in thorndyke stepped up to the door and softly pushed in the flap of the letter slit through which he looked into the flat there's no letter box said he my dear miller i would undertake to open the door in five minutes with a foot of wire and a bit of resin string miller shook his head and grinned once more oh, i'm glad you're not on the lay sir you'd be one too many for us shall we signal to the lady i went out on to the gallery and looked down at the waiting car mrs chater was staring intently up at the building and the little crowd that the car had collected stared alternately at the lady 
and at the object of her regard. I wiped my face with my handkerchief, the signal agreed upon, and she instantly sprang out of the car, and in an incredibly short time she appeared on the landing, purple and gasping, but with the fire of battle flashing from her eyes. "'We found his flat, madam,' said Miller. "'What are we going to enter? You're not intending to offer any violence, I hope,' he added, noting with some uneasiness the lady's ferocious expression. "'Of course I'm not,' replied Mrs. Chater. "'In the States ladies don't have to avenge insults themselves. If you were American men, you'd hang the ruffian from his own bedpost.' Oh, "'We're not American men, madam,' said the superintendent stiffly. "'We are law-abiding Englishmen, and moreover we are all officers of the law. These gentlemen are barristers, and I am a police officer.' With this preliminary caution he once more inserted the key, and as he turned it and pushed the door open, we all followed him into the sitting-room. Oh, "'I told you so, sir,' said Miller, softly shutting the door. "'He hasn't come back yet.' Apparently he was right. At any rate there was no one in the flat and we proceeded unopposed on our tour of inspection. It was a miserable spectacle, and as we wandered from one squalid room to another, a feeling of pity for the starving wretch into whose lair we were intruding stole over me, and began almost to mitigate the hideousness of his crime. On all sides poverty, utter, grinding poverty, stared us in the face. It looked at us hollow-eyed in the wretched sitting-room, with its bare floor, its solitary chair, and tiny deal table, its unfurnished walls and windows destitute of blind or curtain. A piece of Dutch cheese rind on the table, scraped to the thinness of paper, whispered of starvation, and famine lurked in the gaping cupboard, in the empty bread tin, in the tea caddy with its pinch of dust at the bottom, in the jam jar, white clean, as a few crumbs testified with a crust of bread. There was not enough food in the place to furnish a meal for a healthy mouse. The bedroom told the same tale, but with a curious variation. A miserable truckle bed with a straw mattress and a cheap jute rug for bedclothes, an orange case stood on end for a dressing table, and another bearing a tin washing bowl formed the wretched furniture. But the suit that hung from a couple of nails was well cut and even fashionable, though shabby, and another suit lay on the floor, neatly folded and covered with a newspaper, and most incongruous of all, a silver cigarette case reposed on the dressing table. Why on earth does this fellow starve? I exclaimed, when he has a silver case to pawn. Wouldn't do, said Miller. A man doesn't pawn the implements of his trade. Mrs. Chater, who had been staring about her with the mute amazement of a wealthy woman confronted, for the first time, with abject poverty, turned suddenly to the superintendent. This can't be the man, she exclaimed. You have made some mistake. This poor creature could never have made his way into a house like Willowdale. Thorndyke lifted the newspaper. Beneath it was a dress suit, with a shirt collar and tie, all carefully smoothed out and folded. Thorndyke unfolded the shirt and pointed to the curiously crumpled front. Suddenly he brought it close to his eye, and then from the sham diamond stud he drew a single hair. A woman's hair. That is rather significant, said he, holding it up between his finger and thumb, and Mrs. Chater evidently thought so too for the pity and compunction suddenly faded from her face and once more her eyes flashed with vindictive fire i wish he would come she exclaimed viciously prison won't be much hardship to him after this but i want to see him in the dark all the same no the detective agreed it won't hurt him much to swap this for portland listen a key was being inserted into the outer door and as we all stood like statues a man entered and closed the door after him he passed the door of the bedroom without seeing us, and with the dragging steps of a weary, dispirited man. Almost immediately we heard him go to the kitchen and draw water into some vessel, and then he went back to the sitting-room. "'Come along,' said Miller, stepping silently towards the door. We followed closely, and as he threw the door open we looked in over his shoulder. The man had seated himself at the table, on which now lay a hunk of household bread resting on the paper in which he had brought it and a tumbler of water. He half rose as the door opened, and, as if petrified, remained staring at Miller with a dreadful expression of terror upon his livid face. At this moment I felt a hand on my arm, and Mrs. Chater briskly pushed past me into the room. But at the threshold she stopped short, and a singular change crept over the man's ghastly face, a change so remarkable that I looked involuntarily from him to our client. She had turned in a moment, 
deadly pale, and her face had frozen into an expression of incredulous horror. The dramatic silence was broken by the matter-of-fact voice of the detective. "'I am a police officer,' said he, "'and I arrest you for a peal of hysterical laughter from Mrs. Chater interrupted him, and he looked at her in astonishment. "'Stop! Stop!' she cried in a shaky voice. "'I guess we've made a ridiculous mistake. This isn't the man. This gentleman is Captain Rowland, an old friend of mine.' "'I'm sorry he's a friend of yours,' said Miller, "'cause I shall have to ask you to appear against him. "'You can ask what you please,' replied Mrs. Chater. "'I tell you, he's not the man.' The superintendent rubbed his nose and looked hungrily at his quarry. "'Do I understand, madam?' he asked stiffly. "'That you refuse to prosecute?' "'Prosecute!' she exclaimed. "'Prosecute my friends for offences that I know they have not committed. Certainly I refuse.' The superintendent looked at Thorndyke, but my colleague's countenance had congealed into a state of absolute immobility, and was as devoid of expression as the face of a duck clock. "'Very well,' said Miller, looking sourly at his watch. "'Then we have had our trouble for nothing. "'I wish you good afternoon, madam.' "'I'm sorry I troubled you now,' said Mrs. Chater. "'I am sorry you did,' was the curt reply, "'and the superintendent, flinging the key on the table, "'stalked out of the room. "'As the outer door slammed, "'the man sat down with an air of bewilderment, "'and then, suddenly flinging his arms on the table, "'he dropped his head on them and burst into a passion of sobbing. "'It was very embarrassing. With one accord, Thorndyke and I turned to go, but Mrs. Chater motioned us to stay. Stepping over to the man, she touched him lightly on the arm. "'Why did you do it?' she asked in a tone of gentle reproach. The man sat up and flung out one arm in an eloquent gesture that comprehended the miserable room and the yawning cupboard. "'It was the temptation of a moment,' he said. "'I was penniless, and those accursed diamonds were thrust in my face.' They were mine for the taking. I was mad, I suppose. But why didn't you take them? she said. Why didn't you? I don't know. The madness passed, and then when I saw you lying there. Oh, God, why don't you give me up to the police? He laid his head down and sobbed afresh. Mrs. Chater bent over him, with tears standing in her pretty grey eyes. But tell me, she said, why didn't you take the diamonds? You could if you liked, I suppose. What good were they to me? he demanded passionately. What did any of it matter to me? I thought you were dead. Well, I'm not, you see, she said with a rather tearful smile. I'm just as well as an old woman like me can expect to be, and I want your address so that I can write and give you some good advice. The man sat up and produced a shabby card case from his pocket, and as he took out a number of cards and spread them out like the hand of a whist player, I caught the twinkle in Thorndyke's eye. "'My name is Augustus Bailey,' said the man. He selected the appropriate card, and having scribbled his address on it with a stump of lead pencil, relapsed into his former position. "'Thank you,' said Mrs. Chater, lingering for a moment by the table. "'Now we'll go. Good-bye, Mr. Bailey. I shall write to-morrow, and you must attend seriously to the advice of an old friend.' I held open the door for her to pass out, and she looked back before I turned to follow. Bailey still sat sobbing quietly, with his hand resting on his arms, and a little pile of gold stood on the corner of the table. "'I expect, doctor,' said Mrs. Chater, as Thorndyke handed her into the car, "'you've written me down a sentimental fool.' Thorndyke looked at her with an unwanted softening of his rather severe face, and answered quietly, "'It is written, Blessed are the merciful.'" End of section 8section nine of the singing bone of the adventures of dr thorndyke by r austin freeman this librivox recording is in the public domain the old lag part one the changed immutable among the minor and purely physical pleasures of life i am disposed to rank very highly that feeling of bodily comfort that one experiences on passing from the outer darkness of a wet winter's night to a cheerful interior made glad by mellow lamplight and blazing hearth and so I thought when on a dreary November night I let myself into our chambers in the temple and found my friend smoking his pipe in slippered ease by a roaring fire and facing an empty armchair evidently placed in readiness for me. As I shared my damp overcoat, I glanced inquisitively at my colleague 
for he held in his hand an open letter, and I seemed to perceive in his aspect something meditative and self-communing, something, in short, suggestive of a new case. "'I was just considering,' he said, in answer to my inquiring look, "'whether I am about to become an accessory after the fact. Read that, and give me your opinion.' He handed me the letter, which I read aloud. "'Dear sir, I am in great danger and distress. A warrant has been issued for my arrest, on a charge of which I am entirely innocent. Can I come and see you, and will you let me leave in safety? The bearer will wait for a reply.' "'I said yes, of course. There was nothing else to do,' said Thorndyke. "'But if I let him go, as I have promised to do, I shall be virtually conniving at his escape.' "'Yes, you are taking a risk,' I answered. "'When is he coming?' "'He was due five minutes ago, and I rather think—oh, yes, here he is.' A stealthy tread on the landing was followed by a soft tapping on the outer door. Thorndyke rose, and, flinging open the inner door, unfastened the massive oak. "'Dr. Thorndyke,' inquired a breathless, quavering voice. "'Yes, come in. You will send me a letter by hand.' "'I did, sir,' was the reply, and the speaker entered. But at the sight of me he stopped short. "'This is my colleague, Dr. Jervis,' Thorndyke explained. "'You need have no—oh, I remember him.' our visitor interrupted in a tone of relief i have seen you both before you know and you have seen me too though i don't suppose you recognize me he added with a sickly smile frank belfield asked thorndyke smiling also our visitor's jaw fell and he gazed at my colleague in sudden dismay and i may remark pursued thorndyke that for a man in your perilous position you are running most unnecessary risks that wig that false beard and those spectacles, through which you obviously cannot see, are enough to bring the entire police force at your heels. It is not wise for a man who is wanted by the police to make up as though he had just escaped from a comic opera. Mr. Belfield seated himself with a groan, and taking off his spectacles, stared stupidly from one of us to the other. "'And now tell us about your little affair,' said Thorndyke. "'You say that you are innocent.' "'I swear it, doctor,' replied Belfield, adding with great earnestness. "'And you may take it from me, sir, that if I was not, I shouldn't be here. "'It was you that convicted me last time, when I thought myself quite safe, "'so I know your ways too well to try to gammon you.' "'If you are innocent,' rejoined Thorndyke, "'I will do what I can for you, and if you are not, well, you would have been wiser to stay away.' "'I know that well enough,' said Belfield, "'and I am only afraid that you won't believe what I am going to tell you.' "'I shall keep an open mind, at any rate,' replied Thorndyke. "'If you only will,' groaned Belfield. I shall have a look in, in spite of them all. You know, sir, that I have been on the crook, but I paid in full. That job when you tripped me up was the last of it. It was, sir, so help me. It was a woman that changed me. The best and truest woman, God's earth. She said she would marry me when I came out if I promised her to go straight and live an honest life. And she kept her promise, and I have kept mine. She found me work as a clerk in a warehouse, and I have stuck to it ever since, earning fair wages and building up a good character as an honest, industrious man. I thought all was going well, and that I was settled in life, when only this very morning the whole thing comes tumbling down about my ears like a house of cards. "'What happened this morning, then?' asked Thorndyke. "'Why, I was on my way to work when, as I passed the police station, I noticed a bill with a heading Wanted, and a photograph. I stopped for a moment to look at it, and you may imagine my feelings when I recognised my own portrait, taken at Holloway, and read my own name and description. I did not stop to read the bill through, but ran back home and told my wife, as she went down to the station and read the bill carefully. Good God, sir, what do you think I'm wanted for? He paused for a moment, and then replied in breathless tones to his own question. The Camberwell murder! Thorndyke gave a low whistle. My wife knows I didn't do it, continued Belfield, because I was at home all the evening and night, and what use is a man's wife to prove an alibi? Not much, I fear. Thorndyke admitted. But you have no other witness. Not a soul. We were alone all evening. However, said Thorndyke, if you are innocent, as I am assuming the evidence against you must be entirely circumstantial, and your alibi may be quite sufficient, have you any idea of the grounds of suspicion against you? Not the faintest. The papers said that the police had an excellent clue, but they did not say what it was. Probably someone has given false information, for the, a sharp rapping at the outer door cut short to the explanation, and our visitor rose, trembling and aghast, with beads of sweat standing upon his livid face. "'You had better go into the office, Belfield, while we see who it is,' said Thorndyke. "'The key is on the inside.' 
the fugitive wanted no second bidding but hurried into the empty apartment and as the door closed we heard the key turn in the lock as thorndyke threw open the outer door he cast a meaning glance at me over his shoulder which he understood when the newcomer entered the room but it was none other than superintendent miller of scotland yard i have just dropped in said the superintendent in his brisk cheerful way to ask you to do me a favour good evening dr jervis i hear you are reading from the bar learned counsel soon sir eh medico legal expert dr thorndyke's mantle going to fall on you sir i hope dr thorndyke's mantle will continue to drape his own majestic form for many a long year yet i answered though he is good enough to spare me a corner but what on earth have you got there for during this dialogue the superintendent had been deftly unfastening a brown paper parcel from which he now drew a linen shirt once white but now of an unsavoury grey i want to know what this is said miller exhibiting a brownish red stain on one sleeve just look at that sir and tell me if it is blood and if so is it human blood really miller said thorndyke with a smile you flatter me but i am not like the wise woman of baghdad who could tell you how many stairs the patient had tumbled down by merely looking at his tongue i must examine this very thoroughly when do you want to know i should like to know to-night replied the detective can i cut a piece out to put under the microscope i would rather you did not was the reply very well you shall have the information in about an hour very good of you doctor said the detective and he was taking up his hat preparatory to departing when thorndyke said suddenly by the way there is a little matter that i was going to speak to you about it refers to this camberwell murder case i understand you have a clue to the identity of the murderer clue exclaimed the superintendent contemptuously we have spotted our man all right but we could only lay hands on him but he's given us the slip for the moment who is the man asked thorndyke the detective looked doubtfully at thorndyke for some seconds and then said with evident reluctance i suppose there is no harm in telling you especially as you probably know already this with a sly grin it's an old crook named belfield and what is the evidence against him again the superintendent looked doubtful and again relented why the case is as clear as as cold scotch he said here thorndyke in illustration of this figure of speech produced a decanter a siphon and a tumbler which he pushed towards the officer you see sir the silly fool went and stuck his sweaty hand on the window and there we found the marks four fingers and a thumb as beautiful prints as you could wish to see of course we cut out the piece of glass and took it up to the fingerprint department they turned up their files and out came mr belfield's record with his fingerprints and photograph all complete and the fingerprints on the window pane were identical with those on the prison form identical hmm thorndyke reflected for a while and the superintendent watched him foxily over the edge of his tumbler i oh, guess you are retained to defend belfield the latter observed presently mm, to look into the case generally replied thorndyke oh, and i expect you know where the beggar is hiding continued the detective belfield's address has not yet been communicated to me said thorndyke i am merely to investigate the case and there is no reason miller why you and i should be at cross purposes we are both working at the case you want to get a conviction and you want to convict the right man that's so and belfield's the right man but what do you want of us doctor i should like to see the piece of glass with the fingerprints on it and the prison form and take a photograph of each and i should like to examine the room in which the murder took place you have it locked up i suppose yes we have the keys well it's all rather irregular let me see the things still you've always played the game fairly with us so we might stretch a point yes i will i'll come back in an hour for your report and bring the glass and the form i can't let them go out of my custody you know i'll be off now no thank you not another drop the superintendent caught up his hat and strode away the personification of mental alertness and bodily vigour no sooner had the door closed behind him than thorndyke's stolid calm changed instantaneously into feverish energy darting to the electric bell that rang into the laboratories above he pressed the button while he gave me my directions have a look at that bloodstain, Jervis, while I am finishing with Belfield. Don't wet it. Scrape it into a drop of warm, normal saline solution. I hastened to reach down the microscope and set out on the table the necessary apparatus and reagents. And as I was thus occupied, a latch key turned in the outer door, and our invaluable helpmate, Polton, entered the room in his habitual, silent, unobtrusive fashion. Let me have the fingerprint apparatus, please, Polton, and have the copying camera ready by nine o'clock. I am expecting Mr. Miller with some documents. As his laboratory assistant departed, Thorndyke rapped at the office door. It's all clear, Belfield, he called. You can come out. The key turned and the prisoner emerged, looking ludicrously woe-begone in his ridiculous wig and beard. I am going to take your fingerprints to compare with some that the police found on the window. 
fingerprints exclaimed belfield in a tone of dismay they don't say they're my fingerprints do they sir they do indeed replied thorndyke eyeing the man narrowly they have compared them with those taken when you were at holloway and they say that they are identical good god murmured belfield collapsing to a chair faint and trembling they must have made some awful mistake but a mistake's possible with fingerprints now look here belfield said thorndyke were you in that house that night or were you not it is of no use for you to tell me any lies i was not there sir i swear to god i was not then they cannot be your fingerprints that is obvious here he stepped to the door to intercept polton from whom he received a substantial box which he brought in and placed on the table tell me all you know about this case he continued as he set out the contents of the box on the table i know nothing about it whatever replied belfield nothing at least except except what demanded thorndyke looking up sharply as he squeezed a drop from a tube of fingerprint ink onto a smooth copper plate except that the murdered man caldwell was a retired fence a fence was he said thorndyke in a tone of interest yes and i suspect he was a narc too he knew more than was wholesome for a good many did he know anything about you yes but nothing that the police don't know with a small roller thorndyke spread the ink onto the plate into a thin film then he laid on the edge of the table a smooth white card and taking belfield's right hand pressed the forefinger firmly but quickly first on the inked plate and then on the card leaving on the latter a clear print of the fingertip this process he repeated with the other fingers and thumb and then took several additional prints of each that was a nasty injury to your forefinger belfield said thorndyke holding the finger to the light and examining the tip carefully how did you do it stuck a tin opener into it a dirty one too it was bad for weeks in fact dr sampson thought at one time that he would have to amputate the finger how long ago was that oh nearly a year ago sir thorndyke wrote the date of the injury by the side of the fingerprint and then having rolled up the inking plate afresh laid on the table several larger cards i am now going to take the prints of the four fingers and the thumb all at once he said they only took the four fingers at once at the prison said belford they took the thumb separately i know replied thorndyke but i am going to take the impression just as it would appear on the window glass he took several impressions thus and then having looked at his watch he began to repack the apparatus in its box while doing this he glanced from time to time in meditative fashion at the suspected man who sat the living picture of misery and terror wiping the greasy ink from his trembling fingers with his handkerchief belfield he said at length you have sworn to me that you are an innocent man and are trying to live an honest life i believe you but in a few moments i shall know for certain thank god for that sir exclaimed belford brightening up wonderfully and now said thorndyke you had better go back into the office for i am expecting superintendent miller and he may be here at any moment belford hastily slunk back into the office locking the door after him and thorndyke having returned the box to the laboratory and deposited the cards bearing the fingerprints in a drawer came round to inspect my work I had managed to detach a tiny fragment of dried clot from the blood-stained garment, and this, in a drop of normal saline solution, I now had under the microscope. "'What do you make out, Jervis?' my colleague asked. "'Oval corpuscles with distinct nuclei,' I answered. "'Ah,' said Thorndyke, "'that will be good hearing for some poor devil. Have you measured them?' "'Yes, a long diameter, one to two thousand one hundred of an inch, short diameter about one to three thousand four hundred thorndyke reached down an indexed notebook from a shelf of reference volumes and consulted a table of histological measurements that would seem to be the blood of a pheasant then or it might more probably be that of a common fowl he applied his eye to the microscope and fitting the eyepiece micrometer verified my measurements he was thus employed when a sharp tap was heard on the outer door and rising to open it he admitted the superintendent i see you are at work on my little problem doctor said the latter glancing at the microscope what do you make of that stain it is the blood of a bird probably a pheasant or perhaps a common fowl the superintendent slapped his thigh well i'm hanged he exclaimed you're a regular wizard doctor that's what you are a fellow said he got that stain through handling a wounded pheasant and here you are able to tell us yes or no without a inter from us to help you well you've done my little job for me sir and i'm much obliged to you now i carry out my part of the bargain he opened a handbag and drew forth a wooden frame and a blue foolscap envelope and laid them with extreme care on the table there you are sir said he pointing to the frame you will find mr belfield's trademark very neatly executed and in the envelope is the fingerprint sheet for comparison thorndyke looked up the frame and examined it it enclosed two sheets of glass 
one being the portion of the window pane and the other a cover glass to protect the fingerprints laying a sheet of white paper on the table where the light was strongest thorndyke held the frame over it and gazed at the glass in silence but with that faint lighting up of his impassive face which i knew so well and which meant so much to me i walked round and looking over his shoulder saw upon the glass the beautifully distinct imprints of four fingers and a thumb the fingertip in fact of an open hand after regarding the frame attentively for some time thorndyke produced from his pocket a little wash leather bag from which he extracted a powerful doublet lens and with the aid of this he again explored the fingerprints dwelling especially upon the print of the forefinger i don't think you'll find much amiss with those fingerprints doctor said the superintendent they are as clear as if you made them on purpose they are indeed replied thorndyke with an inscrutable smile exactly as if he had made them on purpose and how beautifully clean the glass is as if he had polished it before making the impression the superintendent glanced at thorndyke with quick suspicion but the smile had faded and given place to a wooden immobility from which nothing could be gleaned when he examined the glass exhaustively thorndyke drew the fingerprint form from its envelope and scanned it quickly glancing repeatedly from the paper to the glass and from the glass to the paper at length he laid them both on the table and turning to the detective looked him steadily in the face i think miller said he that i can give you a hint indeed sir and what might that be it is this you are after the wrong man the superintendent snorted not a loud snort for that would be rude and no officer could be more polite than superintendent miller but it conveyed a protest which he speedily followed up in words you don't mean to say that the prints on the glass are not the fingerprints of frank belfield i say that those prints were not made by frank belfield thorndyke replied firmly do you admit sir that the fingerprints on the official form were made by him i have no doubt that they were well sir mr singleton of the fingerprint department has compared the prints on the glass with those on the form and he says they are identical and i have examined them and i say they are identical exactly said thorndyke and i have examined them and i say they are identical and that therefore those on the glass cannot have been made by belfield the superintendent snorted again somewhat louder this time and gazed at thorndyke with wrinkled brows You're not pulling my leg i suppose sir he asked a little sourly i should as soon think of tickling a porcupine thorndyke answered with a suave smile well rejoined the bewildered detective if i didn't know you sir i should say you were talking confounded nonsense perhaps you wouldn't mind explaining what you mean supposing said thorndyke i make it clear to you that those prints on the window-pane were not made by belfield would you still execute the warrant what do you think exclaimed miller do you suppose we should go into court to have you come and knock the bottom out of our case like you did in that ormby affair by the way that was a fingerprint case too now I come to think of it and the superintendent suddenly became thoughtful you have often complained pursued thorndyke that i have withheld information from you and sprung unexpected evidence on you at the trial now i am going to take you into my confidence when i have proved to you that this clue of yours is a false one i shall expect you to let this poor devil belfield go his way in peace the superintendent grunted a form of utterance that committed him to nothing these prints continued thorndyke taking up the frame once more present several features of interest one of which at least ought not to have escaped you and mr singleton as it seems to have done just look at that thumb the superintendent did so and then poured over the official paper well he said i don't see anything the matter with it it's exactly like the print on the paper of course it is rejoined thorndyke and that is just the point it ought not to be the print of the thumb on the paper was taken separately from the fingers and why because it was impossible to take it at the same time the thumb is in a different plane on the fingers when the hand is laid flat on any surface at this window pane for instance the palmer surface of the fingers touch it whereas it is the side of the thumb which comes in contact and not the palmer surface but in this he tapped the framed glass with his finger the prints show the palmer surface of all the five digits in contact at once which is an impossibility just try to put your own thumb in that position and you'll see that it is so the detective spread out his hand on the table and immediately perceived the truth of my colleague's statement what does that prove he asked it proves that the thumbprint of the window pane was not made at the same time as the fingerprints that it was added separately and that fact seems to prove that the prints were not made accidentally but as you ingeniously suggested just now were put there for a purpose i don't quite see the drift of all this said the superintendent rubbing the back of his head perplexedly 
and you said a while back that the prints on the glass can't be Belfield's, because they are identical with the prints on the form. Now that seems to me sheer nonsense, if you'll excuse my saying so. And yet, replied Thorndyke, it is the actual fact. Listen, these prints, here he took up the official sheet, were taken at Holloway six years ago. These, pointing to the framed glass, were made within the present week. The one is, as regards the ridge pattern, a perfect duplicate of the other. Is that not so? That is so, doctor, agreed the superintendent. Very well. Now suppose I were to tell you that within the last twelve months something had happened to Belfield that made an appreciable change in the ridge pattern on one of his fingers. But well, is such a thing possible? It is not only possible, but it has happened. I will show you. He brought forth from the drawer the cards on which Belfield had made his fingerprints, and laid them before the detective. Observe the prints of the forefinger, he said, indicating them. There are a dozen in all, and you will notice in each a white line crossing the ridges and dividing them. That line is caused by a scar which has destroyed a portion of the ridges, and is now an integral part of Belfield's fingerprint. And since no such blank line is to be seen in this print on the glass, in which the ridge appears perfect, as they were before the injury, it follows that the print should not have been made by Belfield's finger. There's no doubt about the injury, I suppose. None whatever. There is a scar to prove it, and I can produce the surgeon who attended Belfield at the time. The officer rubbed his head harder than before and regarded Thorndyke with puckered brows. This is a teaser, he growled. It is indeed. What you say, sir, sounds perfectly sound, and yet there are those fingerprints on the window glass. No, you can't get fingerprints without fingers, can you? Undoubtedly you can, said Thorndyke. I should want to see that done before I could believe even you, sir, said Miller. You shall see it done now, was the calm rejoinder. You have evidently forgotten the Hornby case, the case of the red thumb mark, as the newspapers called it. I only heard part of it, replied Miller. I didn't really follow the evidence in that. Well, I will show you a relic of that case, said Thorndyke. He unlocked a cabinet and took from one of the shelves a small box labelled Hornby, which, being opened, was seen to contain a folded paper, a little red-covered oblong book, and what looked like a large boxwood pawn. This little book, Thorndyke continued, is a thumograph, a sort of fingerprint album. I dare say you know the kind of thing. The superintendent nodded contemptuously at the little volume. Now, while Dr. Jervis is finding us the print we want, I will run up to the laboratory for an inked slab. He handed me the little book, and as he left the room I began to turn over the leaves, not without emotion, for it was this very thumograph that first introduced me to my wife, as is related elsewhere. Glancing at the various prints above, the familiar names, and marvelling afresh at the endless variations of pattern that they displayed, at length I came upon two thumbprints, of which one, the left, was marked by a longitudinal white line, evidently the trace of a scar, and underneath them was written the signature Reuben Hornby. At this moment Thorndyke re-entered the room, carrying the inked slab which he laid on the table, and, seating himself between the superintendent and me, addressed the former. Now, Miller, here are two thumbprints made by a gentleman named Reuben Hornby. Just go on to the left one. It is a highly characteristic print. Yes, agreed Miller. One could swear to that from memory, I should think. Then look at this. Thorndyke took the paper from the box, and unfolding it, handed it to the detective. It bore a pencilled inscription, and on it were two blood smears, and a very distinct thumbprint in blood. What do you say to that thumbprint? Why, answered Miller, it's this one, of course, Reuben Ormby's left thumb. Wrong, my friend, said Thorndyke. It was made by an ingenious gentleman named Walter Hornby, whom you followed from the old bailey and lost on Ludgate Hill, but not with his thumb. Now then, demanded the superintendent incredulously. In this way, Thorndyke took the boxwood pawn from its receptacle and pressed its flat base onto the inked slab, then lifted it and pressed it onto the back of a visiting card, and again raised it, and now the card was marked by a very distinct thumbprint. My God! exclaimed the detective, picking up the card and viewing it with a stare of dismay. This is the very devil, sir. This fairly knocks the bottom out of fingerprint identification. My I ask, sir, how you made that stamp? Well, I suppose you did make it. Yes, you made it here, and the process we used was practically that used by photo-engravers in making line blocks. That is to say, we photographed one of Mr. Hornby's thumbprints, printed it on a plate of chrome gelatin, developed the plate with hot water, and this, here he touched the embossed surface of the stamp, is what remained. But we could have done it in various other ways, for instance with common transfer paper and lithographic stone. Indeed, I assure you, Miller, that there is nothing easier to forge than a fingerprint it can be done with such perfection 
but the forger himself cannot tell his own forgery from a genuine original even when they are placed side by side well i'm hanged grunted the superintendent you fairly knocked me this time doctor he rose gloomily and prepared to depart i suppose he added your interest in this case has lapsed and now belfield's out of it professionally yes but i am disposed to finish the case for my own satisfaction i am quite curious as to who our too ingenious friend may be miller's face brightened we shall give you every facility you know and that reminds me that singleton gave me these two photographs for you one of the official paper and one of the prints on the glass is there anything more that we can do for you i should like to have a look at the room in which the murder took place you'll show doctor to-morrow if you like i'll meet you there in the morning at ten if that will do it would do excellently thorndyke assured him and with this the superintendent took his departure in renewed spirits we had only just closed the door when there came a hurried and urgent tapping upon it whereupon i once more threw it open and a quietly dressed woman in a thick veil who was standing on the threshold stepped quickly past me into the room where is my husband she demanded as i closed the door and then catching sight of thorndyke she strode up to him with a threatening air and a terrified but angry face what have you done with my husband sir he repeated have you betrayed him after giving your word i met a man who looked like a police officer on the stairs your husband mrs belfield is here and quite safe replied thorndyke he has locked himself in that room indicating the office mrs belfield darted across and rapped smartly at the door are you there frank she called in immediate response the key turned the door opened and belfield emerged looking very pale and worn you have kept me a long time in there sir he said it took me a long time to prove to superintendent miller that he was after the wrong man but i succeeded and now belfield you are free the charge against you is withdrawn belfield stood for a while as one stupefied while his wife after a moment of silent amazement flung her arms around his neck and burst into tears but how did you know i was innocent sir demanded the bewildered belfield ah how did i every man to his trade you know well i congratulate you and now go home and have a square meal and get a good night's rest he shook hands with his clients vainly endeavouring to prevent mrs belfield from kissing his hand and stood at the open door listening until the sound of their retreating footsteps died away a noble little woman jervis said he as he closed the door in another moment she would have scratched my face and i mean to find out the scoundrel who tried to wreck her happiness End of section nine section ten of the singing bone or the adventures of dr thorndyke by r austin freeman this librivox recording is in the public domain the old lag part two the ship of the desert the case which i am now about to describe has always appeared to me a singularly instructive one as illustrating the value and importance of that fundamental rule in the carrying out of investigations which thorndyke had laid down so emphatically the rule that all facts in any way relating to a case should be collected impartially and without reference to any theory and each fact no matter how trivial or apparently irrelevant carefully studied but i must not anticipate the remarks of my learned and talented friend on this subject which i have to chronicle anon rather let me proceed to the case itself i had slept at our chambers in king's bench walk as i commonly did two or three nights a week and on coming down to the sitting-room found thorndyke's man polton putting the last touches to the breakfast-table while thorndyke himself was poring over two photographs of fingerprints of which he seemed to be taking elaborate measurements with a pair of hair dividers he greeted me with his quiet genial smile and laying down the dividers took his seat at the breakfast-table you are coming with me this morning i suppose said he the camberwell murder case you know of course i am if you'll have me but i know practically nothing of the case could you give me an outline of the facts that are known thorndyke looked at me solemnly but with a mischievous twinkle this he said is the old story of the fox and the crow you bid me discourse and while i enchant thine ear you claw to windward with the broiled ham a deep-laid plot my learned brother and such i exclaimed is the result of contact with the criminal classes i am sorry that you regard yourself in that light he retorted with a malicious smile however with regard to this case the facts are briefly these the murdered man caldwell who seems to have been formerly a receiver of stolen goods and probably a police spy as well lived a solitary life in a small house with only an elderly woman to attend him a week ago this woman went to visit a married daughter and stayed the night with her leaving caldwell alone in the house when she returned on the following morning she found her master lying dead on the floor of his office or study in a small pool of blood 
The police surgeon found that he had been dead about twelve hours. He had been killed by a single blow, struck from behind with some heavy implement, and a jemmy which lay on the floor beside him fitted the wound exactly. The deceased wore a dressing-gown and no collar, and a bedroom candlestick lay upside down on the floor, though gas was laid on in the room. And as the window of the office appears to have been forced with the jemmy that was found, and there were distinct footprints on the flower-bed outside the window, the police think that the deceased was undressing to go to bed, when he was disturbed by the noise of the opening window, that he went down to the office, and as he entered was struck down by the burglar, who was lurking behind the door. On the window-glass the police found the greasy impression of an open right hand, and, as you know, the fingerprints were identified by the experts as those of an old convict named Belfield. As you also know, I proved that those fingerprints were, in reality, forgeries, executed with rubber or gelatine stamps. That is an outline of the case. The close of this recital brought our meal to an end, and we prepared for our visit to the scene of the crime. Thorndyke slipped into his pocket his queer outfit, somewhat like that of a field geologist, locked up the photographs, and we set forth by way of the embankment. The police have no clue, I suppose, to the identity of the murderer, now that the fingerprints have failed, I asked as we strode along together. I expect not, he replied, though they might have, if they examined their material. I made out a rather interesting point this morning, which is this. The man who made those sham fingerprints used two stamps, one for the thumb and the other for the four fingers, and the original from which those stamps were made was the official fingerprint form. How did you discover that? I inquired. It was very simple. Remember that Mr. Singleton of the fingerprint department sent me, by Superintendent Miller, two photographs, one of the prints on the window, and one of the official form with Belfield's fingerprints on it. Well, I have compared them and made the most minute measurements of each, and they are obviously duplicates. Not only are all the little imperfections on the form, due to defective inking, reproduced faithfully on the window pane, but the relative positions of the four fingers on both cases agree to the hundredth of an inch. Of course, the thumb stamp was made by taking an oval out of the rolled impression on the form. Then do you suggest that this murder was committed by someone connected to the fingerprint department at Scotland Yard? hardly but someone has had access to the forms there has been leakage somewhere when we arrived at the little detached house in which the murdered man had lived the door was opened by an elderly woman and our friend superintendent miller greeted us in the hall we're all ready for you doctor said he of course the things have all been gone over since but we're turning them out more thoroughly now he led the way into the small barely furnished office in which the tragedy had occurred a dark stain on the carpet and a square hole in one of the window panes furnished memorials of the crime which was supplemented by an odd assortment of objects laid out on the newspaper-covered table. These included silver teaspoons, watches, various articles of jewellery from which the stones had been removed, none of them of any considerable value, and a roughly made jemmy. "'I don't see why Colwell should have kept all these odds and ends,' said the detective superintendent. "'There is stuff here that I can identify from six different burglaries, and not a conviction among the six. Thorndyke looked over the collection with languid interest was evidently disappointed at finding the room so completely turned out. "'Have you any idea what has been taken?' he asked. "'Not the least. You don't even know if the safe was opened. The keys were on the writing table, so I suppose he went for everything now. I don't see why he left these things if he did. We found them all in the safe. Have you powdered the jemmy?' The superintendent turned very red. "'Yes,' he growled. "'But some half-dozen blithering idiots had handled the thing before I saw it. I'd been trying it on the window, the blighters. So, of course, I showed nothing.' but the marks of their beastly paws. "'The window had not really been forced, I suppose,' said Thorndyke. "'No,' nah, replied Miller, with a glance of surprise at my colleague. "'That was a plant. So are the footprints. He must have put on a pair of Coldwell's boots and gone out and made them, unless Coldwell made them himself, which isn't likely. "'You found any letter or telegram? A letter making an appointment for nine o'clock on the night of the murder, no signature or address, and the handwriting evidently disguised. "'Is there anything that furnishes any sort of clue?' "'Yes, sir, there is. There's this, which we found in the safe.' He produced a small parcel, which he proceeded to unfasten, looking somewhat queerly at Thorndyke the while. It contained various odds and ends of jewellery, and a smaller parcel formed of a pocket handkerchief tied with tape. This the detective also unfastened, revealing half a dozen silver teaspoons, all engraved with the same crest, two salt cellars, and a gold locket bearing a monogram. There was also a half-sheet of note-paper, on which was written, in a manifestly disguised hand, there are the goods I told you about, F. B. But what riveted Thorndyke's attention and mine was the handkerchief itself, which was not a very clean one, and was sullied by one or two small blood stains. It was marked in one corner with the name F. Belfield, legibly printed in marking ink 
with a rubber stamp. Thorndyke and the superintendent looked at one another and both smiled. I know what you're thinking, sir, said the latter. I'm sure you do, was the reply, and it is useless to pretend that you don't agree with me. Well, sir, said Miller doggedly, if that handkerchief has been put there as a plant, it's Belfield's business to prove it. You see, doctor, he added persuasively, it isn't a job only that's affected. Those spoons, those salt cellars, and that locket are part of the proceeds of the Winchmore Real burglary, and we want the gentleman who did that crack. We want him very badly. No doubt you do, replied Thorndyke, but this handkerchief won't help you. A sharp counsel, Mr. Anstey, for instance, would demolish it in five minutes. I assure you, Miller, that handkerchief has no evidential value whatever, whereas it might prove an invaluable instrument of research. The best thing you can do is to hand it over to me and let me see what I can learn from it. The superintendent was obviously dissatisfied, but he eventually agreed with manifest reluctance to Thorndyke's suggestion. Very well, doctor, he said. You shall have it for a day or two. You want the spoons and things as well? No, only the handkerchief and the paper that was in it. The two articles were accordingly handed to him, and deposited in a tin box, which he usually carried in his pocket, and after a few more words with a disconsolate detective, we took our departure. A very disappointing morning, was Thorndyke's comment as we walked away. Of course, the room ought to have been examined by an expert before anything was moved. Have you picked up anything in the way of information? I asked. Very little, except confirmation by original theory. You see, this man Caldwell was a receiver, and evidently a police spy. He gave useful information to the police, and they in return refrained from inconvenient inquiries. But a spy, or a narc, is nearly always a blackmailer, too, and the probabilities in this case are that some crook, on whom Caldwell was putting the screw rather too tightly, made an appointment for a meeting when the house was empty, and just knocked Caldwell on the head. The crime was evidently planned beforehand, and the murderer came prepared to kill several birds with one stone. Thus he brought with him the stamps to make the sham fingerprints on the window, and I have no doubt that he also brought the handkerchief, and the various oddments of plate and jewellery from those burglaries that Miller is so keen about, and planted them in the safe. You noticed, I suppose, that none of the things were of any value, but all were capable of easy identification. Yes, I noticed that. His object, evidently, was to put those burglaries, as well as the murder, on to poor Belfield. Exactly. And you see what Miller's attitude is. Belfield is the bird in the hand, whereas the other man— if there is another, is still in the bush. So Belfield is to be followed up, and a conviction obtained, if possible. If he is innocent, that is his affair, and it is for him to prove it. And what shall you do next? I asked. I shall telegraph to Belfield to come and see us this evening. He may be able to tell us something about this handkerchief that, with the clue we already have, may put us on the right track. What time is your consultation? Twelve-thirty, and here comes my bus. I shall be in to lunch. I sprang into the footboard, and as I took my seat on the roof, and looked back at my friend striding along with an easy swing i knew that he was deep in thought though automatically attentive to all that was happening my consultation it was a lunacy case of some importance was over in time to allow of my return to our chambers punctually at the luncheon hour and as i entered i was at once struck by something new in thorndyke's manner a certain elation and gaiety which i had learned to associate with a point scored successfully in some intricate and puzzling case he made no confidences however and seemed, in fact, inclined to put away for a time all his professional cares and business. "'Shall we have an afternoon off, Jervis?' he said gaily. "'It is a fine day, and work is slack just now. What say you to the zoo? They have a splendid chimpanzee and several specimens of that remarkable fish, Periof Thalmos Kulruteri. Shall we go?' "'By all means,' I replied, "'and we will mount the elephant, if you like, "'and throw buns to the grizzly bear, "'and generally renew our youth like the eagle.' "'And when an hour later we found ourselves in the gardens, "'I began to suspect my friend of some ulterior purpose "'in this holiday jaunt, "'for it was not the chimpanzee "'or even the wonderful fish that had attracted his attention. "'On the contrary, he hung about the vicinity "'of the llamas and camels in a way that could not fail to notice, "'and even there it appeared to be the sheds and houses "'rather than the animals themselves.' that interested him. "'Behold, Jervis,' he said presently, as a saddled camel of seedy aspect was led towards its house, "'behold the ship of the desert, with raised saloon-deck amidships, fitted internally with water-tight compartments, and displaying the effects of rheumatoid arthritis in his starboard hip-joint. Let us go and examine him before he hauls into a dock.' We took a cross-path to intercept the camel on its way to its residence, and Thorndyke moralised as we went. It is interesting, he remarked, to note the way in which these specialized animals, such as the horse, the reindeer, and the camel, have been appropriated by man. 
and their special character made to subserve human needs think for instance of the part the camel has played in history in ancient commerce and modern too for that matter and in the diffusion of culture and of the role he has enacted in war and conquest from the egyptian campaign of cambyses down to that of kitchener yes the camel is a very remarkable animal though it must be admitted that this particular specimen is a scary-looking beast the camel seemed to be sensible of these disparaging remarks for as it approached it saluted thorndyke with a supercilious grin and then turned away its head your child is not as young as he used to be thorndyke observed to the man who was leading the animal nah so he isn't he's getting old and that's a fact he shows it too i suppose said thorndyke strolling towards the house by the man's side these beasts require a deal of attention yeah right sir and nasty tempered brutes they are so i have heard but they are interesting creatures the camels and llamas do you happen to know if complete sets of photographs of them are to be had here you can get a good many at the lodge sir the man replied but not all i think if you want a complete set there's one of our men in the camel house that could let you have em he takes the photos himself and very clever he is at it too but he isn't here just now perhaps you could give me his name so that i could write to him said thorndyke yes sir his name is woodthorpe joseph woodthorpe he'll do anything for you to order thank you sir good afternoon sir and pocketing an unexpected tip the man led his charge towards its lair thorndyke's absorbing interest in the camelidae seemed now suddenly to become extinct and he suffered me to lead him to any part of the gardens that attracted me showing an imperial interest in all the inmates from the insects to the elephants and enjoying his holiday if it was one with the gaiety and high spirits of a schoolboy yet he never let slip a chance of picking up a stray hair or feather but gathered up each with care wrapped it in its separate paper on which was written its description and deposited it in his tin collecting box you never knew he remarked as we turned away from the ostrich enclosure when a specimen for comparison may be of vital importance here for instance is a small feather of a cassowary and here the hair of a wapiti deer now the recognition of either of those might in certain circumstances lead to the detection of a crime or save the life of an innocent man the thing has happened repeatedly and it may happen again to-morrow you must have an enormous collection of hairs in your cabinet i remarked as we walked home i have he replied probably the largest in the world and as to other microscopical objects of medico-legal interest such as dust and mud from different localities and from special industries and manufactures fibres food products and drugs my collection is certainly unique and you have found your collection useful in your work i asked constantly over and over again i have obtained by reference to my specimens the most unexpected evidence and the longer i practice the more i become convinced that the microscope is the sheet anchor of the medical jury by the way i said you spoke of sending out a telegram to belfield did you send it yes i asked him to come to see me to-night at half-past eight and if possible bring his wife with him i want to get to the bottom of that handkerchief mystery but you think he will tell you the truth about it that is impossible to judge it would be a fool if he does not but i think he will he has a godly fear of me and my methods as soon as our dinner was finished and cleared away thorndyke produced the collecting box from his pocket and began to sort out the day's catch giving explicit directions to porton for the disposal of each specimen the hairs and small feathers were to be mounted as microscopic objects while the larger feathers were to be placed each in its separate labelled envelope in its appropriate box while these directions were being given i stood by the window absently gazing out as i listened gathering many a useful hint in the technique of preparation and preservation and filled with admiration and like at my colleague's exhaustive knowledge of practical detail and the perfect manner in which he had trained his assistant suddenly i started for a well-known figure was crossing from crown office row and evidently bearing down on our chambers my word thorndyke i exclaimed here's a pretty mess what is the matter he asked looking up anxiously superintendent miller heading straight for our doorway and it is now twenty minutes past eight thorndyke laughed it will be a quaint position he remarked and somewhat of a shock for belfield but it really doesn't matter in fact i think on the whole i am rather pleased that he should have come the superintendent's brisk knock was heard a few moments later when he was admitted by polton he entered and looked around the room a little sheepishly i'm ashamed to have come worrying for you like this sir he began apologetically not at all replied thorndyke serenely slipping the cassowary's feather into an envelope and writing the name date and locality on the outside 
I am your servant in this case, you know. Cotton, whiskey and soda for the superintendent. You see, sir, continued Miller, our people are beginning to fuss about this case, and they don't approve of my having handed that handkerchief and the paper over to you, as they will have to be put into evidence. I thought they might object, remarked Thorndyke. So did I, sir, and they do, and in short they say that I have got to get them back at once. I hope it won't put you out, sir. Not in the least, said Thorndyke. I have asked Belfield to come here to-night. I expect him in a few minutes, and when I have heard what he has to say, I shall have no further use for the handkerchief. You're not going to show it to him, exclaimed the detective aghast. Certainly I am. You mustn't do that, sir. I can't sanction it. I can't indeed. Now look you here, Miller, said Thorndyke, shaking his forefinger at the officer. I am working for you in this case, as I have told you. Leave the matter in my hands. Don't raise silly objections. And when you leave here to-night, you will take with you not only the handkerchief and the paper, but probably also the name and address of the man who committed this murder, and those various burglaries that you are so keen about. Is that really so, sir? exclaimed the astonished detective. Well, you haven't let the grass grow under your feet. Ah, oh, as a gentle rap at the door was heard, it is Belfield, I suppose. It was Belfield, accompanied by his wife and mightily disturbed they were when their eyes lighted on our visitor. "'You needn't be afraid of me, Belfield,' said Miller, with ferocious geniality. "'I am not here after you,' which was not literally true, though it served to reassure the affrighted ex-convict. "'The superintendent dropped in by chance,' said Thorndyke. "'But it is just as well that he should hear what passes. I want you to look at this handkerchief and tell me if it is yours. Don't be afraid, but just tell us the simple truth.' He took the handkerchief out of a drawer and spread it on the table and I now observed that a small square had been cut out of one of the bloodstains. Belfield took the handkerchief in his trembling hands, and as his eyes fell on the stamped name in the corner, he turned deadly pale. "'It looks like mine,' he said huskily. "'What you say, Liz?' he added, passing it to his wife. Mrs. Belfield examined first the name and then the hem. "'It's yours right enough, Frank,' said she. "'It's the one that got changed in the wash. You see, sir,' she continued, addressing Thorndyke, I bought him half a dozen new ones about six months ago, and got a rubber stamp made and marked them all. Well, one day when I was looking over his things, I noticed that one of his handkerchiefs had got no mark on it. I spoke to the laundress about it, but she couldn't explain it, so as the right one never came back, I marked the one that we got in exchange. How long ago was that? asked Thorndyke. About two months ago I noticed it, and you know nothing more about it. Nothing whatever, sir. Nor you, Frank, do you. Her husband shook his head gloomily, and Thorndyke replaced the handkerchief in the drawer. "'And now,' said he, "'I'm going to ask you a question on another subject. When you were at Holloway, there was a warder, or assistant warder there, named Woodthorpe. Do you remember him?' "'Yes, sir, very well indeed. In fact, it was him that I knew,' interrupted Thorndyke. "'Have you seen him since you left Holloway?' "'Yes, sir, once. It was last Easter Monday. I met him at the zoo. He is a keeper there now in the camel house. Here a sudden light dawned upon me, and I chuckled aloud, to Belfield's great astonishment. He gave my little boy a ride on one of the camels, and made himself very pleasant. Do you remember anything else happening? Thorndyke inquired. Yes, sir. The camel had a little accident. He kicked out. He was an ill-tempered beast, and his leg had post. There happened to be a nail sticking out from that post, and it tore up a little flap of skin. Then Woodthorpe got out his handkerchief to tie up the wound. As that it was none of the cleanest, I said to him, Don't use that Woodthorpe have mine, which was quite a clean one. They took it and bound up the camel's leg, and he said to me, I'll have it washed and send it to you if you give me your address. But I told them there was no need for that. I should be passing the camel house on my way out, and I, w I would look in for the handkerchief. And, and I did. I looked in about an hour later, and Woodthorpe gave me my handkerchief, folded up, but not washed. Did you examine it to see if it was yours? asked Thorndyke. No, sir. I just stepped it into my pocket, as it was. And what became of it afterwards? When I got home, I dropped it into the dirty linen basket. Is it all you know about it? Yes, sir, that is all I know. Very well, Belfield, that will do. Now you have no reason to be uneasy. You'll soon know all about the Camberwell murder, that is, if you read the papers. The ex-convict and his wife were obviously relieved by this assurance, and departed in quite good spirits. When they were gone, Thorndyke produced the handkerchief and the half-sheet of paper, and handed them to the superintendent, remarking, This is highly satisfactory, Miller. The whole case seems to join up very neatly indeed. Two months ago the wife first noticed the substituted handkerchief, and last Easter Monday, a little over two months ago, this very significant incident took place in the zoological gardens. It's all very well, sir, objected the superintendent, but we've only their word for it, you know. Not so, replied Thorndyke. We have excellent corroborative evidence. 
You noticed that I cut a small piece out of the bloodstained portion of the handkerchief. Yes, I saw you had done it. Our people weren't like that. But here it is, and we will ask Dr. Jervis to give us his opinion of it. From the drawer in which the handkerchief had been hidden, he brought forth a microscope slide, and setting the microscope on the table, laid the slide on the stage. Now, Jervis, he said, tell us what you see there. I examined the edge of the little square of fabric, which had been mounted in a fluid reagent with a high-power objective, and was for a time a little puzzled by the appearance of the blood that adhered to it. It looks like bird's blood, I said presently with some hesitation, but yet I can make out no nuclei. I looked again, and then suddenly, by Jove, I exclaimed, I have it, of course, it's the blood of a camel. Is that so, doctor? demanded the detective, leaning forward in his excitement. That is so, replied Thorndyke. I discovered it after I came home this morning. You see, he explained, it's quite unmistakable. The rule is that the blood corpuscules of mammals are circular. The one exception is the camel family in which the corpuscules are elliptical. Why, exclaimed Miller, that seems to Kenneth Woodthorpe with this camber oil job. It connects him with it very conclusively, said Thorndyke. You are forgetting the fingerprints. The detective looked puzzled. What about them, he said. They were made with stamps, two stamps, as a matter of fact, and those stamps are made by photographic process from the official fingerprint form. I can prove that beyond all doubt. Well, suppose they were. What then? Thorndyke opened a drawer and took out a photograph which he handed to Miller. Here, he said, is the photograph of the official fingerprint form, which you were kind enough to bring me. What does it say at the bottom, then? And he pointed with his finger. The superintendent read aloud. Impressions taken by Joseph Whitthorpe, Rank, Walder, Prison, Holloway. He stared at the photograph for a moment, and then exclaimed, "'Well, I'm hanged. You have worked out this neatly, doctor, and so quick, too. We'll have Mr. Woodthorpe under lock and key the first thing tomorrow morning. But how did he do it, do you think? He might have taken duplicate fingerprints and kept one form. The prisoners would not know there was anything wrong. But he did not, in this case. He must have contrived to take a photograph of the form before sending it in. It would take a skilful photographer only a minute or two, with a suitable hand camera placed on the table at the proper distance from the wall, and I have ascertained that he is a skilful photographer. You will probably find the apparatus and the stamps, too, when you search his rooms. Well, well, you do give us some surprises, Doctor, but I must be off now to see about this warrant. Good night, sir, and many thanks for your help. When the superintendent had gone, we sat for a while looking at one another in silence. At length, Thorndyke spoke. Here is a case, Jervis, he said, which, simple as it is, teaches a most invaluable lesson, a lesson which you should take very well to heart. It is this. The evidential value of any fact is an unknown quantity until the fact has been examined. That seems a self-evident truth, but like many other self-evident truths, it is constantly overlooked in practice. Take this present case. When I left Caldwell's house this morning, the facts in my possession were these. 1. The man who murdered Caldwell was directly or indirectly connected with the fingerprint department. 2. He was almost certainly a skilled photographer. 3. He probably committed the Winchmore Hill and the other burglaries. 4. He was known to Caldwell, had had professional dealings with him, and was probably being blackmailed. This was all a very vague clue, as you see. There was the handkerchief planted, as I had no doubt, but could not prove. The name stamped on it was Belfield's, but anyone can get a rubber stamp made. Then it was stained with blood. As handkerchiefs often are, that blood might or might not be human blood. It did not seem to matter a straw whether it was or not. Nevertheless, I said to myself, if it is human, or at least mammalian blood, that is a fact, and if it is not human blood, that is also a fact. I will have that fact, and then I shall know what its value is. I examined the stain when I reached home, and behold, it was Camel's blood and immediately this insignificant fact swelled up into evidence of primary importance. The rest was obvious. I had seen Woodthorpe's name on the form, and I knew several other officials. My business was to visit all places in London where there were camels, to get the names of all persons connected with them, and to ascertain if any among them was a photographer. Naturally, I went first to the zoo, and at the very first cast hooked Joseph Woodthorpe. Wherefore, I say again, never call any fact irrelevant until you have examined it. The remarkable evidence given above was not heard at the trial, nor did Thorndyke's name appear among the witnesses, for when the police searched Woodthorpe's rooms, so many incriminating articles were found, including a pair of fingerprint stamps which exactly answered the Thorndyke's description of them, and a number of photographs of fingerprint forms, that his guilt was put beyond all doubt, and society was shortly after relieved of a very undesirable member. End of section 10. End of The Singing Bone or The Adventures of Dr. Thorndyke by R. Austin Freeman. Read by Edmund Boxham in Cambridge, UK.
to explore more, please visit edmundbloxham.com.